Welcome to the biggest WordPress all-in-one tutorial that I have ever recorded. This is pure Flexbox container Elementor with the Hello theme. I'm going to give you a home page which is a little bit different than what I've done before. You're going to get other pages as well, the about, the contact. We're going to start looking at blogs and the single post template. And what about WooCommerce, all of the settings, adding in items, the shop, the single product template as well. And we're not gonna stop there. We're gonna take the website a step further, like what if you wanna sell LMS courses or restrict content as well as to what people can access. I'm also putting in time to make sure this is as good as web accessibility goes, thinking about contrast layout. Now don't worry, we are gonna cover off a lot of things in here and you're gonna get that from the get go. We're even gonna look at page speed performance. So before you build anything, what can you do to get your website up there? And I really hope that you like what you see, you smash the like button, you subscribe, you share and let everybody else know about this video. Use the timestamps if you need to skip at any point, but let's get ready. Elementor, WordPress, Flexbox containers, let's go. There are two things you really should consider before you build a website, even before you start designing it on paper. Think about your domain and your hosting. I'm not gonna talk to you about where you can purchase these from because there are many options if you go and do a Google search. But my recommendation is that for your domain, the identity of your website, almost in a way what you're gonna be forming your brand around, it's best if you buy that yourself to protect yourself. Because if you let someone else buy that, they could either hold you to ransom, delete the domain or do anything they want if you fall out of favor with them. Now, if you are sold the domain through a resettling package, maybe someone is offering you hosting as well, that's for you to consider. And I have nothing against good businesses that offer this as a service. But my recommendation, if you're a little bit unsure, is to get your domain and your hosting yourself, especially your domain, okay? And when it comes to hosting, start thinking about, does it give you SSL certificate? Does it allow you to make backups? Does it have a staging facility? Does it come with an inbuilt email facility as well? Now, many people will say, well, you can get your email as part of your domain or another add-on service. But if you're starting off and you wanna keep things simple, having it as part of your hosting is a good step. I quite like SiteGround, 20i are really good as well, but there's loads and loads of different options out there. The key thing about both of them is make sure you have some form of control. Because remember, your website will sit on the hosting, which will be connected to the domain. And if you don't have sight of them or the billing or how you can get access or control over it, you will regret it. Now, if you have no intention of ever working on the website and you're gonna let someone else administrate and completely manage it, again, make sure you have a contract drawn up whereby if you do need to get access because you do need to get hold of that website, you can do so. Once you've sorted out your hosting and connected your domain, go and get WordPress installed. Either you're doing it or it's part of the hosting package where it's already done for you or you get a developer to do it. When you then get into the WordPress website, whether it's you or the developer, this is probably what you're gonna see. Very quickly, we're gonna go over some of the WordPress settings that I think you should definitely consider before you do anything else on the website. I hate all of the screen options that you get on WordPress, so I very much like to just untick everything on here like that. I like to have a clear dashboard that is litter free. If you've installed this via SiteGround, you will probably have SiteGround Optimizer and SiteGround Security. I'm gonna deactivate both of them and then I'm gonna delete them. Now, if you're not using SiteGround, you probably wouldn't have had that, but if you are using another hosting provider, it's not a bad idea to sometimes get rid of the plugins they install for you because you don't need them. And we are gonna go over the plugins I recommend. I'm gonna go over to posts, click all posts, and I'm gonna get rid of the hello world dummy post. I'm gonna go to pages. And again, I'm gonna get rid of the pages here, trash that one and trash that. Again, depending on how this has been installed, there might be more pages on there. It's always good to start with a blank canvas. Then I'm gonna to go to media and go to the library. And if there is any media image in here, again, I'm gonna clear that out. The next thing I'm gonna do is go down to appearance and where we have themes. Now this will probably come with the themes that you have here at the moment. Because we're building with Elemental and we will add that plugin shortly, 
I would install the Hello theme because it is super light and it's built by the Elemental team. So I'm gonna click Add New, go over here, and I mean, if it didn't show up, which it has already with Hello Elementor, just go and type in Hello and you'll see it. Please bear in mind though that there will be other themes that pop up with the word hello. You don't want those, okay? You just want the standard hello theme. Click install, and once it's installed, then activate it. Now, delete all the other themes. Now, if anyone is saying, well, isn't that a risk? Well, not really. And you must also consider that if you have lots of themes sat in your WordPress that you're not using, and you have no intention of ever using or converting to, they're taking up space in your WordPress database or inodes as well. And if you care about how much space you have on your server for your host, definitely, definitely keep it light, lean, and mean. Now there is an option to customize the theme, but we're not gonna do that just yet until after we've added in some images. So we will come back to revisit this later on. Let's now just go back over to plugins where I've already removed some of them. Let's now go down to settings and go to the first one, which is general. Now even though this website is secure, it's got an SSL certificate as part of the hosting, and it has got HTTPS in the address, it's missing the S over here. So my tip for you, to you is to go and stick that in there and then go and hit the save changes. But while you're here at this point in time, you might as well decide on what is the site title or the tagline for your website. I've changed it to be our hike and the tagline is adventure with your backpack. If you wanna change the time zone, go ahead, then go over to the reading setting. Now this is where you will set the page for your home page and maybe your blog page. However, we're gonna do things a little different. We can't set a page for the home page yet because we haven't built it. So we will return to this later on. If we go to the discussion tab, this is where you can have a think about if you're gonna have a blog, are you going to allow people to leave comments or not? The options here are very self-explanatory. So go through them once you've started building out your blog post. However, there is one thing I do wanna point out. If you do have a blog or posts and you notice you're getting a lot of spam comments and they're coming from a particular IP address, you can pop the IP address in here. Now, you can't completely stop all spam and we will talk to you about methods as we get to that stage, but sticking in IPs is not a bad option. Let's now go to media and this is one of my favorite settings. A lot of people leave this as it is. You don't actually need to have all of these sizes, even when you have a WooCommerce store. I'm gonna set all of these to be zero. I'm also gonna untick that box zero, 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 zero. And again, I'm gonna untick the box here about organizing in a month and year based folder. Honestly, I'm not overly fussed by that. Let's then hit save changes. Now let's go to permalinks. Now, nine times out of 10, your permalink will be set to post a name. This is the one I strongly recommend you go for. If you wanna go for a custom structure, you can, but don't go for the four that are over here. I don't even know why WordPress still allow these to exist, but make sure you go for post name. And they were the WordPress settings. Now let's go into the plugins you want to use. Now I've already mentioned that I like to keep things quite lean and mean, and we are building this with an Elementor website. So let's go and install the Elementor plugin. Let's hit add new, type in Elementor and install it. Now you will notice lots of third party add-ons. If you are building your website with Elementor free, you may end up relying upon a lot of these. The danger though is that if you have too many add-ons, you can experience some incompatibility or conflict as all of these plugins start to update over time. I strongly recommend you go for Elementor Pro, which you will do and go and purchase. And there is a link below in the description, but I'm not here to force you to do anything, which is a much more safer option than using third party. Now the other plugins that I'm gonna add are mainly for performance or just doing a little bit extra with your website. So I'm gonna go install the FastPress plugin, WP Meteor plugin, and the Code Snippets plugin. These are all free plugins. Now later on, we will install WooCommerce and Rank Math for SEO, but we'll do that later on. Something I do mention quite a lot, is if you're building a WooCommerce website, get all your plugins in now so that you know what works and doesn't work. Now, I'm gonna take a bit of a risk and do the WooCommerce later on because I know they work, so it's not really much of a risk. But my advice to you is that if you are building a WooCommerce website, 
and you can have maybe three or four extra plugins on there, it's a really good idea to start getting them all in, activate them, and then as you build your website, you'll notice if there's any problems or issues. What you don't wanna do is build a 20 page website, add in a plugin, and then everything kind of stops working or glitches, and you're now scratching your head, or you feel like you've gotta undo 20 pages worth of effort. You really don't wanna be in that scenario. And let me just go through the settings really quickly. But WP Meteor is a very basic setting. I'm gonna set this to be all the way, so delay until first interaction. If you find you have any issues with carousels or sliders, then drop this down until it works. But let me just put it on all the way. Then I'm gonna do the fast press settings. This is a really simple plugin to use. I'm gonna make sure that this one stays off and I'm also gonna deactivate the bottom one as well. I'm gonna deactivate all of the images because I'm gonna use different methods to optimize them. And when I get down here to the HTML, CSS, and JS, I'm gonna leave everything on except load scripts asynchronously. <laughs> Try saying that really fast. That's how simple it is. Now we're gonna go over to code snippets. And what I recommend you do is delete a lot of the items that you have here. And then we're gonna hit add new and add in a load of snippets for performance. There is a link in the video description which will take you to a page where you can get all of these codes. By the way, some of the codes are not always just elemental specific. You can use them on any WordPress website and you'll notice them, they'll be a slightly different color. You can still install it even if you're not using elemental. First one is remove Google fonts. And I'm gonna paste in this code here. And then I'm gonna hit save changes and activate. What this does is stop Google fonts from being fetched. If you are using Google Fonts, and you gotta watch out for this, because even when you're using Elementor, the fonts will be there, and you'll think, oh, well, that's okay, I'm not actually fetching. You are still fetching from Google, and you don't want that, because it can add on a bit of a delay. Okay, we've done that, now let's add in our second one. We are gonna custom load fonts in rather than fetching. Now, this bit of snippet ensures that they are definitely being loaded. Now, technically, this shouldn't be needed, but I find that when you're using Elementor or even many WordPress websites, you just need to force it through a little bit. Again, save changes and activate. WordPress automatically lazy loads images. Now, Elementor do give you the power and authority to stop that. However, I think adding in this snippet is just an extra bit of oomph to make it work. Now, if you're familiar with PageSpeed Performance or PageSpeed Insights, removing unused JavaScript is a big headache. All you gotta do is dump in this bit of code, save changes and activate, and this is gonna help you out a lot. Another common problem is where you're told that the widths and heights don't have an explicit sizing set for them. You'll be familiar with this. Again, drop in this bit of code. Now you may need to remove this code if you are using a image carousel, because sometimes it doesn't work very well, but install it, activate, and then you get to test later on. And the final one is purging your website, basically clearing the cache out. Go and insert the code and save changes and activate. And you'll notice at the top now, an option appears called purge cache. If I click that, it says, are you sure you wanna purge? You hit yes, and that is now done. Nine times out of 10, we will install another plugin to do this. Well, you don't have to do that. The snippet here does it for you. Now, if we go back to snippets, you can see everything that we've added. If at any point in time you did need to deactivate, just hit the toggle and it is now off. Let's just pop that back in. Now let's go and add in Elemental Pro. You will have to go and sign up and purchase it, uh, get a subscription for it, and there's many options that you can go for, and there is a link in the video description. Once you've got it, click Upload Plugin and install it from wherever you've saved it. Once you've got Elemental Pro in there, let's just visit the Elemental settings now. Go over to Elemental on the left-hand side, go and click Settings. My tip is to leave both of these box unchecked, right? So you don't want to inherit the colors from your theme or the font, because we're gonna have full-on control over what we had. I'm not overly fussed about being a data sharer either. When it comes to integrations, if you wanna add in any API keys, you can do, but nine times out of 10, you won't really worry about this. In the Advanced tab, for the Google Fonts, I'm gonna set this to be disabled. And in the Final tab, which is Features, I'm gonna set my inline font icons to be active, my Flexbox container to be active, my nested elements to be active, and Lazy Load Background Images, I'm gonna make be inactive because this is meant to not lazy load your very first image. However, 
I'm going to test it out without the inactive and I might come back and revisit this later on. So just go with what I'm doing. I'm going to make the optimized DOM output be active, improved CSS loading active and everything else I'm going to leave as default. Now there is an option down here for form submissions. If people are just contacting you with like a message, you could set this to be active. If however, you're getting people to submit PDFs or images to you, Every time they submit, it's going to take up space in your database, okay? And you can easily start to see your storage getting maxed out. So think very carefully about, are you going to enable form submissions? Now comes the bit where we have to do a little bit more administration, mainly on the global colors, the global font, and obviously the custom loading of the fonts. Now, some of what I'm going to show you there are many ways to do this, but I'm going to show you my methods and it's not all now just in WordPress. We're going to be using other solutions like Canva, bulkresizephotos.com, Font Squirrel. There's lots of tools out there, by the way, okay? But if you follow these steps, you're making your life so much easier as you come to build, especially for page speed performance. I've created a logo on Canva and I've downloaded it as a PNG, but I haven't just done it as this landscape design that you see here. I've also done it as a square, a 500 by 500 pixel image so that I can use it later on as a favicon or a social media sharing icon as well. I've also collected loads of images again on Canva around hiking. Again, I've downloaded these as PNG and I've picked one of my stock images that I've downloaded and I've got Canva to basically give me the color scheme. Here's what I really like. If I was to click on the background here, and go and click the color palette, it picks up the colors from this image and starts to identify them for me. So now at any point I can go in and go, okay, I now need the hex code for that color. Now I wanna just focus on one little aspect of this about web accessibility and throughout the video, we will be addressing this. What's very common is that you or your client will come up with a color scheme but you haven't really considered how accessible they are, especially with color contrast. I'm gonna pick up the hex code for that kind of bluey, purpley, navyish color we've got there. And I'm gonna to go to this website and the link will be in the video description. I'm gonna pop in the background color to be that hex code and hit return. And I'm gonna say that my font color will be black like this. That's ridiculous, number one, because when you now look at it down here, we are failing web accessibility scenarios and you really don't want that. If I go and change my font to be white, we will now pass everything. But what if you stick in a color here and you're not exactly passing? So let's pick this color here, get the hex code. Now we are passing to a point, but we're still failing. What you could do is now start to use this and, and drag it until you get a pass mark, which is here. Now you have to go and speak to your client or have a think about, well, what is our color scheme gonna be? You could still use the original color, but maybe for your buttons, if you are gonna have white text as the font for the button, you might wanna go with this color instead. If you care about web accessibility, please do consider this. This is all great that I went and got my stock from Canva. We've got my three logos. So I've got a logo which is 500 by 500 one that is 200 by 80 and another one that's 100 by 40. It's not a bad idea when you have images like this, especially logos where you put the size in the description as well. So you recognize what they are. But if we now look at my images, I've got two. I've got one which is a collection of bags because we're going to use it for WooCommerce later, 2.3 megabytes. And then we got this one here, 62 megabytes for images that are PNG, where some of them are two and a half, nearly three megabytes in size is ridiculous. What you really want to make sure you do is stick them into a tool called bulkresizephotos.com. Now there are plugins out there that you could use on your WordPress website, but what you really got to consider is, do you really want to add in another plugin, some extra bloat to do things online? Because they don't always optimize really, really well. This is an amazing plugin. Watch this. I'm going to hit choose images. I'm going to go to my folder that contains all those images. I'm going to highlight all of them all in one go. Hit open so I don't have to do 20 at any one time. I'm going to maintain the size. I'm going to say give me 85% quality. 85% is really, really good. Okay. Don't think it's going to drop it. 
set it to be a WebP format. This is what you must do, okay? I know some people say that, well, don't certain phones or laptops or machines, they can't handle it. Yeah, if it's a really old machine, but internet browsers now are fine. And any that have an issue, right, I'm really sorry, but you've got to move with the times, everyone. Let's then hit start. And what this is now going to do is take all of those images, which was about 62 something megabytes, and it's doing it real time as I'm talking and it's compressing them. It's already sent it to my downloads folder without me having to hit the word download. And we've gone from 62 megabytes to five megabytes. We are now less than 10% of what the original size was. You can see here now the zipped files for all the stock images for the bags and also for the logos as well. I'm gonna unzip all of them and now add them to my media library and drop in the logos, bags and the images. Now, because they're in WebP format and they're already compressed, they will load really, really quickly. Now, one thing I do want to point out, if I go back to my stock images is, can you notice they all have a title? So they all have, they're not exactly the same because you want to make sure they're a little bit different. Having titles isn't a bad idea rather than just saying image one or what's really worse is when someone gives you an image from a camera and it's got tons of random characters in there. These are not going to be the titles that we'll be using in the alt title, which we will address later on for SEO. But it's a good idea to have decent titles in there. And this gives you an idea of the range I had. But what's really awesome is how that is a total of 5.5 megabytes in totality. Some of you have an image which is five megabytes just on its own. So have a think about bulkresizephotos.com. Now, if we go over to Elemental, there is the option down here for custom fonts. And here's where we're gonna add the fonts that we're gonna use on the website. Now, I've already decided that I'm gonna use the railway font and you could go to Google Fonts and download that. It's really simple, you just hit download family. However, when you try and convert a lot of Google fonts that you've downloaded from here into a WAF2 format, which is the compressed format that you should be using, sometimes it won't do it for you and it fails. So here's where you should go instead. Font Squirrel and the link is in the video description. It's a free website. Find your font and then download the TTF. Now I've just said to you, we need to use the WAF2 format. Why am I going for the TTF? Pretty simple. Once you've downloaded it, go to Web Font Generator and the link is right there on the same page. And what you now wanna do is upload the fonts that you want to convert. So if I go to upload fonts and I go to railway here, here's the ones I wanted to upload. Railway light, regular, medium, bold, etc. Look at the size of each of them. 180, you know, 175 kilobytes per font. What you'll do is, You'll upload them and you will then leave it as optional and then it will download them and it basically converts them into WAF and WAF2. Now I only care about the WAF2 format, so I'm now going to show you what this looks like after I've converted it. They are now 25 kilobytes. We've gone from 180 to 25, okay? And that's the reason why WAF2 is your friend. Back over into WordPress, we go to custom fonts and we are gonna hit add new. I'm gonna call this railway, and then I'm gonna add in a font variation. These are basically all the different sizes. So I'm gonna go and pick one for normal, and we're gonna pick a WAF2 file, click upload, select files. In fact, I might as well take all of these over in one go first. Ding, 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 ding. And then I'm gonna pick regular and select that. That is now added. Now I'm gonna add in another font variation. This time I'm going to go for one which is a 300 and this will be my lighter one. Once you've done all of that, hit publish and just click update as well just to be sure. And what you can now see is all the different sizes. We have the regular and then we have the 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. I get a bit of a range there. I haven't added in any italic ones because I wasn't bothered by that. My recommendation is that you don't completely replicate what I did. If you only ever intend to use normal 300 and maybe 600, don't load in the 7.8, or 4. Now, once I've built out the website, if I realize, well, I, had, I did not use 800, I'll come back into here and I will completely delete it. Believe me, you're probably thinking, well, if I'm not using it and it's sat there, what's the harm? 
You want to keep your website, the front end and the back end and the databases as lean and mean and unbloated as possible. Now let's go and customize our global colors and our global fonts. I'm going to go over to pages and I'm going to add new and I'm going to create home page. So we're going to go and type home and then I'm going to hit edit with Elementor. If you start designing your page here, you're in the WordPress block editor, and this isn't really what you want to be doing unless you're building a blog post and we'll come back onto that later on. For now, we're just going to hit edit with Elemental. And this is our Elemental page. I'm going to fly through the interface so you understand everything. We have a few settings here. We have the settings tab whereby we can say hide the title, which makes total sense as to why would you want to have the title visible there. We have navigator, so as we add items onto the page, we can start to see the layout and we can rejig it. And you'll see me doing that as we build the website. We have a history tab. So if you've gone and done about 50 things and you want to roll back, you can do. We also have the option to view via desktop, tablet or mobile and we will be looking at that as we're building the website. We also have preview changes so what does the page look by removing all of our interface and of course we have the publish option. Now as we build out the page I will be, go I will be going over some of the settings again and what you need to click or think about as you're building but for now we're just going to hit the hamburger in the top left and we are going to click site settings and then we are going to go to global colors and global fonts. Now I've done many videos on this before. So if you want some more detailed explanation over what you should and should not do, please go and watch them and I'll put a video link in the description. But you don't want to spend a lot of time on the typography and this is the mistake a lot of people make. You define your font family and your colors here. In the typography, if I'm really honest, you keep that empty. Let's go to global colors. The first thing we're going to do is start setting our colors and if you remember I've already defined some of them using Canva. So I'm going to grab the hex code, go over here and I'm going to change them to be what I want. It's always good to have a color palette before you start so you're not second guessing especially if you can agree that with your client beforehand and this is where showing them an example image of how the colors work on the page can be super super helpful. Once you've done that go and hit update and then go back. Now I've just said don't touch anything in typography. I kind of lied a little bit. What you do want to make be aware of though is your link. Now we will come back on to that later on but if you need to define your links or how will your hyperlinks appear this is where you go and cut the set the color. Now let's go back and go to global font. This is really really simple. You don't start setting your weighting for your font in terms of 300, 400, 500. You can do but I recommend you don't do that. All you want to do over here is set the family. And you can see here that Railway is identified as a custom font rather than one of the other Google fonts that you would have had below. Remember, I have unchecked it. I've said disable. We don't want Google fonts to be loaded. So it's given a system ones. But I am going to use the Railway one here. I'm going to use it over here for the secondary font. I'm also going to use it for the text font and also for the accent as well. I know, I know, that's quite a lot, isn't it? We haven't even started building out the website, but I'm just getting you to understand some of the core things you should do before you build any website. Now, you could use other bits of kit where you create like a blueprint, so next time you build a website, you just install from a new all of these settings already built out for you, and I have done that in the past, but sometimes, I like to do it just stage by stage so I know exactly what I'm doing and I can root out any issues as I'm going along. Let's now test out the website, especially with all of those performance snippets that we added. Back on the page, I'm going to hit the settings in the bottom left and I'm going to say set this to be an elemental canvas. What that does is remove a lot of the wording that you saw at the top and bottom because we haven't defined or built our header or our footer. So I want to test this out now with a complete blank page. I'm just going to drop into here a heading. That heading is the railway font because we've set it as a global font. I'm just going to go into my style. I'm going to pick one of my colors here. Let's just go for the text one. And for simplicity, I'm going to give this a size of about 20. And I'm going to set the weight to be normal like that. I'm then going to go and click the mobile responsive button. And if that's not there, 
Don't forget you have the option down here to see the responsive mode. Go and click it and I'm going to check that the font looks okay there as well. And now I'm going to hit publish. Before we do that, let's ensure that the website knows that's the page that you're going to land on because we haven't defined it. Do you remember I mentioned this before? If you go back into WordPress and your dashboard and you go down to settings and reading, we haven't defined a home page. In fact, this is what the home page looks like right now. That isn't what we set. So over here, we're going to set this to be a static page and the home page will be home. And that is there because we've now built it. Now hit save changes. I will recommend every time you change pages or you now want to assess it on the live, go to Elemental on your left hand side, go down to tools and hit regenerate files and data. And if you have got a caching snippet or another plugin, go and purge as well. And now when we view the page, we've got the header. But what does this mean for PageSpeed Insights? Let's go and test it out. So here's the score for the desktop. Ignore the 91 SEO because we haven't done any SEO yet. And here's what it is for the mobile. I'm going to show you what the score is now. If I deactivate all the snippets and the fast press and the WP Meteor plugin as well. Still have the header, but the desktop is now 91 and the mobile has gone down to 81. That's 19% drop. So follow the steps I've instructed. Once you've reactivated and you can see the timestamp, so I'm not lying, everything goes back to 100%. Depending on the complexity of your website, you might not hit 100 and the score might drop to 90, 80, 70. And sometimes you have to accept that depending on what your website is doing. What did your client want? What were you trying to achieve for your target audience or your market? But before you build every anything, you need to be hitting 100 or 99%. So as you build the website, the moment your score drops or goes down or there's a bit of an issue anywhere, you're going to spot the score drop and then you have to have a think about, do you still want that feature? Do you want to compromise? Do you want to try a different solution? Page speed is not everything, but it is a big thing and you really should consider it. If you're still watching at this point, I'd love to know your comments and what you now feel about your images in terms of web peeing them, custom loading your fonts, thinking about your color scheme and getting your page speed performance right before you do anything else. And if you want more tips and tricks about how to help yourself out, please go and have a look at our super course or our mastery modules on our website. Now, before we start building out the website, let's just go and set our fabric on because we've got all of our images into our library. Inside of WordPress, go to appearance and you can either hit customize over here when you're on your theme or just go straight to the customize button. Then go to site identity. Very little you need to use here. Now, if you are using other themes like Astra or something else, there may be more settings. The reason I like to use hello is because I like to keep it really simple. Because we already set our site title and our tagline in WordPress general settings, it's already populated it here. But all we're going to do now is add in our logos. The most important one is the one down here. This is what you will see next door to your URL or sorry, in the tab right at the top on your browser. And it's a bit of an identity for your website. So let's just go and set the logos. And that's basically it. And this is why it's always a good idea to have a square version of your logo. Now, I know a lot of you are going to say, but my logo doesn't really work. Well, have a look at a lot of websites that you visit. They might have a really big, bold and brash logo, but the Favicon might be a simplified version. That is totally OK. And it can work for you really well whenever you're doing like social media or you're doing a video or something. You can now use the simplified logo instead. A tip I want to give you now is regularly purge your website whenever you are building or making any changes. So I'm going to hit the purge button here and just OK that mainly because it just kind of clears things out a little bit. And also when if you are checking your website on a private or an incognito window, you want to make sure you're looking at it as it is now rather than what it looked like 10 minutes ago. We've already covered off your images, your branding, your palette and your fonts. But before you start designing a website, you and the client need to have a conversation about the look. What are you kind of going for? Now, I'm not going to tell you in this video about looking at competitor websites because I've covered that in other videos. However, it's a good idea to look at the area or the niche that this website is going to be covering. Maybe it's dentistry, landscaping or just selling jewellery. What are other websites doing? Go and look at the competition and assess what you like and what you dislike. 
grab a bit of paper and then start scribbling down some rough ideas. You might formulate screenshots as well and go, well, we like the header there, we like the hero banner here, and we really like the style of the buttons or the contact form or how the products are displayed. This is really important. It's all about inspiration. There's no such thing really as copying because everything is inspired by something else, but get a good idea of what you or the client really likes. Don't go building a website, spending a day or two on it on the homepage, try and get sign off and the client goes, well, I really don't like that look. Try and get it nailed down at the start. I like to scribble down on paper and have a rough idea of the layout. And I might put down more scribbles for other pages as well. Nothing is pixel perfect. I'm not kind of laying down the exact color scheme that we're going to go for, but we already know what the branding is. So that kind of helps. Then I'll go and tighten it up a little bit. And I might now say, well, here's where certain items are going to go. First thing we're going to cover off is the header template. It's very easy to build a website where you actually build the header and the footer as part of the page. And then if you've got a 10 page website, you just keep duplicating the header you had in another page. But then what if you decide you want to change the layout of the menu? Now you've got to do it on every single page. The beauty about the template is you do it once and you can then set the display condition. So you might say that every page display this header or you might say display this header on pages five to seven, but from pages one to four display a different header. And I'm going to show you that because we are going to have two different headers um, fu in functioning on this website. So templates are your friend, but do not overuse them. I have come across many websites whereby people have like 50, 60, there was one that had over 100 templates, not just for the header and footer, but for every bit of the website. So for a hero banner, for an about section, for all over the place. And this is where you are overusing templates. Now, let me explain why they might have done that in the first place. You got a website, you build an about section with your team members, maybe. Are you going to replicate that anywhere else on the website? Probably not. So did you really need a template? Because no matter how you modify it, you're going to have to go in with edit with Elementor. So don't do that. Number two, though, some people, they kind of have like a suite of templates. So for every website they ever build in their life, they've got a repository somewhere. So, oh, I'm going to build an about section. I'll use this template. They might have four or five different team member templates and they pick one and they use it and it just speeds things up. That is absolutely fine. That is a really efficient way to do things. However, you should only bring over what you need. What you don't do is import over 50, 60 templates if you're not using them. Again, though, I could even argue, did you really even need to use the template? You could have brought it over and then copy and pasted the information over. That would have saved using a template. I like to consider the fact that what if you and the client are no longer working together? Keep it simple for the client, especially with handover, but also keep your templates as slim as possible. If I go into a website, I really shouldn't see more than maybe five or four. If it's a shop, there might be six or seven. If there's a blog, it might go up to nine or 10, but I really wanna keep it as slim as possible. If you got a website and you got over 50 templates, we need to have a conversation. Let's go and build our header template over in WordPress, go over to templates, which will sit underneath Elementor. Now you do have quite a lot of options in here. You have kit library where you can import one into here. Maybe you found that someone has shared with you. I'm gonna go into saved template and I'm just gonna click the word all. The reason why I like to click the word all is because sometimes there may be other templates already within there and what I, don't like is how if you go straight in on save templates, it kind of shows nothing, but there is actually one there and it's called the default kit. Never ever delete the default kit. Even if you are building out your own and you're using your own colors and your own fonts and your, own, your entire layout, leave that intact. Now let's create our header one. I'm going to click the word add new and we are going to select from this uh, pop-up we have here, the header template. Now, if you do look at the list there, you do have quite a range. And there are some on here we are not going to be using just yet until later on. The Aero 404, we will cover that off, okay? I'm not overly fussed about the landing page because my home page is the landing page. But for now, let's just go with the header. Give it a title and I'm going to call this header home because I am going to have two different headers. 
one for the home page and one for every other page on the website. Elementor will give you a range of templates that you can start using. And this isn't a bad idea if you're new to using Elementor, web design, or even Flexbox containers that we are using. You can hit one of these, it will install it onto your page and then you can start reverse engineering. I like to build from scratch because every client is unique. So we're back on our page. Now you will notice it says the word content area and it says header home. If you go down here to settings in the bottom left, you don't have the option to remove the title. We are building a template. It doesn't really matter. A lot of these wordings will not be visible on the actual live website. So don't worry about it. Now, the first thing you have are two options. You have a gray folder and you have the plus sign. If I click the gray folder, again, you can go back and insert a template. So don't sit there going, oh, I went and I really wish I'd used that instead. You can go and do it. And you can also go and visit my templates if you have gone and imported something in. Or you could actually install an entire page, which makes no sense because we are working with headers at the moment. So let's go and hit the plus sign instead. And this is where we are now going to go for a Flexbox container layout. Now, the design I'm going for is going to be a very simple um, uh, header whereby we only have a logo in the top left and a menu in the top right. I'm not going to put any social sharing icons or a contact me number or anything like that mainly because I don't want to create a distraction on the website. It's very easy for people to put too much stuff in the header and you really want them to kind of move on and look at the content of your website. Don't put them off. I'm going to go for a single container where the direction is set as a row. That means everything I add in will sit side by side. If you go for the column, they sit one below one another. In fact, what we'll do is let's just go for the column. OK, I and mean, then I'll show you what happens if I switch it to a row and you can do it on the fly. So we have our primary or parent container in here. I'm going to set this to be a full width. So that means the contents will stretch all the way across now. And I will discuss boxed width when we get to the next section after this. I'm also going to set my margin and padding to be zeroed out because I like to have a form of control over how things look. And I know some people say you don't have to always do that. I do it out of force of habit and I like to do it. I'm also going to set the background color of this to be all white. So click on the style tab, go to background type, which we're leaving as a classic single color. We could add in a gradient if we want as well. I could add in a video. Video, not a good idea or I could add in a slideshow again not a good idea or I could add in a background image again for the header I not always necessary okay especially if you're keeping it really light so let's just go and hit default and I'm going to pick from my global colors and I'm going to pick the white color there I know you're going to say but isn't it white already it's not a bad idea even though it was a transparent color scheme just to set what the color is because sometimes you can get anomalies appearing on different devices. Let's now go and add in our items. I'm going to click on the grid and then I'm going to go and select image. Now you do have the option of bringing over the site logo. I have found that this is not always the best way to do things. Okay I prefer to bring in the image because I have a better form of control and I have found that sometimes the site logo doesn't always display properly so I'm going to go over and bring over an image like that. The minute you do that you get this huge humongous image and I know you're probably thinking well that is just absolutely horrendous. Seriously don't worry about it. Let's just click over here and select our image. I have three versions of our logo. I have the square that we use for the favicon and I have a logo here which is 200 by 80 pixel and I have another one, which is 100 by 40. I'm going to go with the 100 and then I'm going to explain exactly what we're doing here. OK, uh, later on. OK, so just stay with me on. So I'm going to go for the smaller logo here. So there we go. That is now a 100 by 80. This is where setting your logos to the size you want is not a bad idea. I could have converted this into an SVG as well and then I could modify the size but I felt like this was absolutely fine because it is a very small logo and look if I just show you here it's only two kilobytes at the moment so we're not hammering the website with hefty load. I'm going to position it to be on the left like that and then I'm going to go to the style tab just because the logo has come through as 100 by 8, uh, 40 you should still set the size so I'm going to set this to be a pixel size you have percentage pixel and other uh, um, options as well, like a vertical uh, viewpoint width, REM and EM. I nearly said vertical width, if viewport width. I always like to go for pixel. Percentage is not always a good idea because if you say make this be 20% of your page, what if you're looking at it on an ultra wide screen? 
all of a sudden the font's like that, the logo's like that. And if you if it was a hundred pixel width from inside your media library, and it's now like that, it's going to look very distorted and blurred. So I'm going to set this to be 100, and I'm also going to set the maximum width it can ever grow to is 100 as well. Very small logo, but this is this is actually going to be the one that's not visible on the home page. And you're probably going, yeah, but this is the header home. Stay with me on this; it will make sense, right? So that's all we're doing. Just setting the size. I don't. I mean, I could, if I want, go over to the CSS filter and increase the contrast to be 105. Sometimes increasing the contrast to 110, don't go higher than that, up to that point can actually sharpen the image. So if you find your image is not looking ultra sharp, go up to 105 or 110 and it will make a bit of a difference. Let's now click the grid again. And now I'm going to type in menu. And what you want is the WordPress menu, okay? Let's now drag that in. At the moment, the menu is not going to give me anything. OK, and here's the reason I'm doing it, because we haven't actually built a menu. So let's now go back and create that. So the first thing I'm going to do is hit publish. But as soon as I do that, you're going to get this message and it says, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to display it? Where do you want to display it? And we're not ready to address that just yet. So I'm just going to hit the save and close. Now, in another tab, I've just opened up the WordPress admin again. Don't worry, the header is still there. It is still saved. Let's now go down to appearances and go down to menus because we haven't created any. We, we've only got one page. Let's go and create our menu. You can call it anything you want and you can have as many menus as you want as well. Just make sure you pick the right one. Go and hit create menu. Now we go and add in our pages. Well, we only have one at the moment. So let's just add that. That is our start of our menu now created. That's how easy and simple it is. When I refresh the page, the menu now appears. And if I click on it, you'll now see it says main menu. Now, before I start to style the menu, do you notice how it sits below the logo? Well, that's because we picked the container that was set with the arrow pointing down, the column, the vertical. Watch what happens when I convert it to be row but now side by side. Let me put it back into column. What if I put click the arrow, which is going the other way? They now swap over. What if I go back to the row and hit the other arrow? Again, they swap over. Well, they've actually shot over to the other side of the screen. Let's just put it as row for now. And this is where now you can start to understand better some of the Flexbox container options. Here at the moment, it is justified to be at the start. If I put it in the center, to the end, well, you can kind of see what it's doing. I could even go for space between, space around, which brings it inward or space more evenly. I'm going to go for space between. Now, remember, my entire container or the parent container is set to be a zero, zero for the margin and padding. Now I'm actually going to start to add in a little bit of spacing. Well, no, sorry. Let me go back to the layout. Let's first align these items to be in the center like that. Notice the logo move down there. Let me untick that. It's right up against the top. You hit that and it's now moved down. Now we're going to go to the advanced tab and I'm now going to unlink and I'm now going to start to decide on exactly what kind of spacing we're going to go for. So I'm going to go for a five on the top and bottom and a 10 on the left and right. Let's now go and modify the style of the main menu or the navigation menu. Let's just click on it. And by the way, all of the items have a pencil, which is kind of going right, go and edit. Let's hit the pencil over here. We've got the right menu. I'm going to go for a horizontal layout. You could go with a vertical. You could even go for a drop down as well. So normally the toggle option is available on the mobile menu or even on the tablet. You could set it to be like that from default. I don't think that's always a good idea. I think horizontal works absolutely fine on the uh, when you're on a desktop. When you hover over it, you get an underline effect. I really don't like the underline effect. And I'm not even a fan of framed or background even now. I find like just keep it simple. I'm going to suggest that the toggle activates when you hit the uh, tablet. You may decide that the toggle with the drop down only activates on the mobile. Again, go and do that. Or you might say there is no toggle option. I only have two or three items in the menu. It looks absolutely fine on a small mobile screen. So I don't want to go for it. So you get to make that option. Now, I'm not going to toggle the full width on because I'm going to show you what it looks like if you don't. And then we will activate it. I always say go activate it, but I want to show you what it looks like. And we'll adjust some of these items when we eventually get onto the mobile. Let's now go to the style tab and just make sure the fonts are what we want. Let's hit typography. It's already defaulted to the custom railway because we've set that in. The weight is set at 600. 
do we want to go with that? Or maybe you want to go with something a little simple. And I think the 400 normal works really, really well for us. Now we need to make a decision over the font. I have done videos on this and I strongly recommend you go away and look at this. I like to use font clamp when I'm doing my fonts, but to keep this tutorial simple, we are just going to use REM. REM, what? Well, sorry, for web accessibility, it's recommended that you go with a font that is no smaller than 12. I think 12 is too small. And what's quite common is for people to go for 16, which I think is a reasonable size to go for. But rather than using pixel, you really should consider using REM. And REM 1 is the equivalent of 16, okay? So if you were now gonna use a pixel size and you wanted to convert it into REM, divide by 16. I'm gonna leave it as one REM. We could, if we want, change the style of it to make turn it into uppercase, or we could just leave it as default. We could even do lowercase as well. We could adjust the letter spacing so I could now make it wider or smaller. I'm gonna set this to be a one. That is my header pure and simple, but don't just stop here, okay? And this is the mistake a lot of people make. They start building out the rest of the website. Hit the responsive mode button down here and now go and check, well, how does it look in the tablet? And this is where the styling of what you're doing really will kick in. I I mean, what you everything you do here, you would obviously do for the mobile as well, but I prefer to work with the mobile view because that kind of helps to influence what you're gonna do on the tablet. So staying in the mobile view, mu, the mobile view, you can see what layout we have. Let's just go and hit the container again. Let's go back to layout. Everything you did right now with where we set the layout, just double check if it still looks okay, because maybe you wanna change the layout. So let me just show you. If I was to now go and hit start, the toggle has now moved over to be more towards the center because everything is near the start. But if I go back to the desktop, it is still spaced out with space between. So you can have various options as to what you wanna do. We're still gonna leave it as space between like that, but you will notice we have a much more of a bigger gap going on here. Scroll down until we get to the mobile drop down, and now I'm gonna position it to be on the right. That's how simple it was. You don't need to start messing around with margin and paddings. Just hit the right button there. But I don't like the background color of that. We've got a bit of a gray going on. Really easy and simple to do. Just go to style, go down to where you now have the toggle button option and decide on your background color. And this is where setting your background color, which is what we did with the entire header is a good idea. So I'm gonna set it to be a white background color and I might as well design or set what the standard color is as well. So I'm gonna use our primary color for the toggle or the bars. So let me hit the chevron and now show you what this is gonna look like. Because remember I mentioned about the full width, that's your menu. Can you see how everything moved down, even the logo, uh, the contents as well? There was no overlap going on there. Let me show it to you again. Watch this, look, everything kind of shifts down. It pushes the content down. So let me now go over to our nav menu, go to the content, and I'm now gonna say, set it to be a full width. I'm also gonna say that my items are set to be to the aside. Basically, well, let me show you what it looks like. If I click this now, can you see now it's dropped down? If I go and set this to be on the center, the wording has now dropped to the center. So I prefer it to have on side, but if you wanna go with center, you can do that. If you do wanna change the symbol for your toggle bar as well, you could do that. So you could either upload an SVG or go and pick one from the library here. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna type in bar. I type in line. You might decide you wanna go for something else or you might just wanna import uh, an alternate SVG. Now, if we go to style, what if you want your wording to be a little bit bigger? By the way, we also have a bit of a highlight effect going on there. You might wanna keep that, you might not. Again, we're gonna go down to the drop down option over here now. So we've done the toggle button, now we're looking at the drop down. I'm gonna set the typography of this to be an REM of 1.5, and I'm also gonna make this be a 400 in weight as well. And if we remember our letter spacing, we set that to be a one, so I'm gonna bring that over. Now you might go, well, I did it already for the desktop, why do I need to do it again? This is just one of the nuances of why it's a good idea to just build things out properly as you're going along. Don't just jump from the desktop, well, don't do every page on the website and then worry about your mobile, okay? Try and work on it as you're working along. And I'm also gonna give this a little bit of vertical padding as well of about 10. Now let's view that. So when I click now, it is now overlapping. Can you see that? Before it was pushing down, it created extra space where the logo was, so we got almost more padding. 
and it was all the way on the right hand side. Well, now it drops down and it overlaps the content. We still have that highlight color on, so let's sort that out. Let's go over to the hover option, and this is where we can now set a different color scheme. So I'm gonna go with background color, and I'm gonna give it a lighter color like that. And look, we now get this nice hover color there, which is gonna fit our branding. Now I'm gonna hit update, and now we are gonna add in a condition. Now at the moment, this header isn't going to be visible on the home page. We're going to have a different header, but for simplicity, for the rest of the home page, I'm going to maintain this header. When we come on to do the other pages, then this header will become a different header. Basically, it will become the not home page header. But for now, because we only have one page, let's just set it to entire site, okay? And just hit save close. I do want to show you though that if this was going to be only for the home page, which it isn't, but let's say it was, you could click the arrow down here. Go and click singular, then click the option here, and then go, okay, this is only on the front page or maybe go over to pages and then down here, type the actual page name. I mean, I haven't even spelt it right, but you get the idea. But let's just go with the entire site for now and now hit save and close. That is now gonna be activated for the entire homepage. If you're liking what we've done so far, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe and please share amongst your friends or your peers as well. And don't forget to check out our super course on how to start a web design business. Remember, we are gonna revisit the header template later on once we've built out more pages in terms of where is it activated or displayed. We're gonna look at the rest of the home page now. It's a good idea to have a wireframe or a layout of some kind that you have discussed with the client, otherwise you might spend a lot of time and then you're gonna go back and rehash it all later on. Have a site map. That doesn't mean you map out every little bit, but have a good idea of what kind of pages are we gonna need and what is the justification for that page? So we're gonna have a home page. What are we gonna show on there? We're gonna have an about page. Do we even need that? Or can we put that onto the home page? So have a really good hard think about that. And we are gonna do things a little bit differently than what you may have been experiencing in some of our tutorials and what you are taught as well. Now the norm with building websites tends to be with a headline, a subheader, there might be some text and call to action buttons. And you're gonna see this on a lot of websites that you build and a lot of tutorials that you experience as well. There's nothing actually wrong with that. I just wanna do something a little bit differently with this tutorial and I'm sure you're gonna like it. Let's go over to pages. Now I could jump straight into add new. Instead, I'm gonna to go to all pages and just see what I have. Do you remember I already actually do have a home page because that was what was built when we were testing out the page speed score. When you hover over, it. You have the options like edit, quick edit, trash, you could even view it or go with edit with Elementor. If you're building with Elementor or any other page builder, you want to be clicking that to go and edit it. Because if you hit the edit button here, you're now going into standard or classic WordPress block editor. If that's what you want to go for, go for it. There is nothing wrong with that. You can mix and match, but then it defeats the object or the purpose of why you've got Elemental in the first place. You can also quick edit. So maybe you don't want to show the word home and you want to change that. You could do that now. I will come back onto this though later, later on when we hit the SEO section and a little trick that you really should consider with your URL matching your main keyword. But for now, leave it as home and the slug we're going to leave as home as well. Let's go and click edit with Elemental. And when we go in, normally you should see the header right at the top, but it's not there. And you're probably going to be thinking, but you set it to be on the entire site. So where's the header? Why is it missing? Let me go to the cog down here. If you've been watching this video properly, you will have noticed that when I did the page speed check, I went and set this to be an Elemental canvas. By doing that, I got rid of any text that was above or below. Let me now set this back to be default, okay? And let me now just hit update and what you will now see is the header has appeared. Now, one thing I don't often like is until you build a footer, you will now have this appear, which has got your wording and your, well, it's got your site logo, all rights reserved, adventure with our backpack. I don't like that. So because I wanna see the header on the page as I'm building it, I'm actually gonna get rid of that. And here's what you do. And again, this is a really, really simple and we will come back to revisit this when we build the footer. Go to templates, go to save templates, always click all so you know what you've got. Then I'm gonna click add new and I'm going to select footer. 
Now, this will be the same footer across every page, so I don't need to give call it footer home or anything like that. We click create template. I am not going to use anything they give me here as a template. I'm going to X that. And all I'm going to do down here is hit the plus sign, and I'm just going to drop in a container. That container is going to have no items in whatsoever. In fact, I'm going to set the height of it to just be 10 pixel. And I'm now just going to hit publish. That's literally it. Add condition, entire site, uh, yep, yeah, save and close. That's all I'm doing. Because now if I go back to my actual website page or the home page and I refresh that, that bit of text at the bottom is now gone. So if you're building and that's a little bit distracting, because I find it distracting, you do that and we now have a blank uh, footer in there. Now, before we build a home page, how about we quickly check what is the page speed with the current content? Because we've got an image, we've got a navigation menu, and we have this little bit of text that we dumped in for page speed reasons. My big, big tips before you do this is go over to Elementor, go down to Tools, go and hit Regenerate the CSS for your website, and also hit Purge as well, just to clear out any old copies that might be lurking. If your website is on SiteGround or other host providers, don't be surprised if you gotta go in and kind of clear or purge the cache as well on your server. Um, this can happen depending on your provider, but I'm just letting you know that if you ever go onto your website, and no matter, you've cleared, you've purged, you've regenerated, but it still shows you the page as it was 10 minutes ago and not with your changes, go to your server and purge. It's 100 on the desktop and it is 100 on the mobile. If you ever find that your speed does drop down to like 99, it could be just the speed of your host provider or your server. So test it again five minutes later. But this is what I would have expected because it's a very light header, very simple as well. And yes, I know we don't have any content on there, but we are going to start building on that. Now, when you are building on Elemental, you will notice that you have your page, but when you hover over the header, it says edit header. It allows you to modify the header, which is super cool. So you don't have to keep jumping back into your header template. In fact, if I scroll down here, eventually at the bottom of the page, I'm going to get to my edit footer as well. Once you're happy with the header template, just go and hit edit page and it brings you back into the page. So rather than having multiple tabs open on your browser or your screen, you can jump about between them. So let's now go into the very first container, which is where we went and added in our dummy text. I am going to get rid of that text for a moment. So we're almost back into a standard container. Now we used a full width for the header, for the page and all of the contents we build from going forwards from now. I'm going to set this to be a boxed width of 1100. There's many different schools of thought here. Sometimes I've used 1140. I used to use 1200, but I'm now really starting to love the 1100 look. I have seen websites where they set that to be 1400. Again, if that's if that works for you, go for it. But I find that if you're looking at the website on a desktop, 1400 might look great. But depending on the size of the screen, or even if they're looking at it on, say, a MacBook Air or something like that, things can look a little bit cramped. And I, for, the, for the look I'm going for with this website, where I'm going for a very clean look, especially with a blogging website, even showcasing products, 1100 works really well for me. Now, if you are going to have a full width image, then the, the width kind of goes out of the question because you want your image to stretch across. So just bear that in mind, play around with it. But 1100 for me on the desktop is my sweet spot. I'm not going to set the minimum height at this moment because I'm going to just put my content in and then decide on that. The way I like to build is get all your stuff in, okay? Don't overly worry too much about the margins or the padding. Just get your stuff in, get the contents to look how you want, and then adjust the margin, the padding, the minimum height of this. Like, how tall is it going to be? Is it going to be really tall or really small? Are you going to set it to maybe be um, always, always 50% of the screen? No matter where you are, it's always 50%. So let's drop our content in. The first thing I'm going to do is drop in a image like that. And remember, you're going to get a huge image appear. Don't worry about it. Let's now pick the image. And this is where I'm going to go for my slightly bigger logo. This is the 200 by 81. And I'm going to select that. That is not massively massive. OK, you could argue and go, well, you could go with a bigger logo. No, the reason I'm going with that is because it's it's readable. 
I can digest it. I don't have to squint my eyes. Well, that is fine for me. And if you remember what we did, go and set your size. Now, always set your image size. And I, I didn't mention this in the header bit. Always set it to be full resolution. Sometimes people look at this and go, oh, but my image is like a thousand pixel. I don't want that. This is actually referring to the resolution of the image, okay? So make sure you do that. Is this going to link to anywhere? So is it going to go back to, is this going to allow you to open up? So if I pick media file and I now click it, do I want it to do that? No, I don't. So we'll make sure that, let me just click on the image again. I don't want to have a media file. And does it have to have a custom URL? Well, this page is going to be visible on the home page, only ever there. So do I want you to click that and go back to the home page? Well, no, because you're already on the home page. So I'll leave it as it is. So I'm not going to set any links for that. Let's go to the size and I'm going to set the pixel size for this to be 200, which it already is because we've controlled the height because that's how I built it and saved it and brought it in. Now let's go and drop in a heading. I'm going to pop that down here. I'm also going to change the HTML tag to be a H1. When it comes to SEO, you want to make sure your keywords for your website are in H1 and H2 tags. Your H1 is probably the most important one per section or container that you're working on. It's where you get to reinforce your keyword and also from an accessibility point of view, identify what is the purpose of the section as well. Don't make the mistake where sometimes go people make the header be a H3. Now, don't worry about the size because we haven't set those, so don't worry about the sizing of it. You can modify that in the style, that's irrelevant. It's more about the semantic tag that you are setting. So make sure you've set that as a H1. I'm also just gonna centralize that. Now, as far as the text goes, I've gone and collated some items using ChatGPT. Yes, you heard me right. ChatGPT is a great way to formulate some content, especially for tutorials, but obviously get your client to write it. But if you felt the wording was weak or not punchy enough or witty or didn't really like summarize, you know, they might have given you a whole list of text and you go, yeah, but I just wanted two lines for the headline. You could use chat GPT to help you out. So I've said, give me a punchy headline because my keyword is actually going to be hiking equipment. Then we modified it a little bit. And then I said to it, now give me some paragraphs as well. You can see on screen what I've got here, because I'm going to use some of this as the content. There's our main headline. I quite like that. It is a little bit wordy, but we're not. And here's where we're doing something a little bit different. We're not actually going to have any background image here. I could, if I want, go over to my container for the hero banner, go over to style, and I might say, ah, oh, you know what, we're going to add in a different color. Or I might say, let's go for a gradient color like that, and we can modify with it. I know it looks really ugly right now, right? Or we might go and add in a uh, background image. So let's just go in and pick something like this. And I might then say, let's go and make the size bigger like that. Go back to my style tab. I'll say the position is going to be like a center center or maybe center left. You know, you can decide how you want to do that. It's going to be a, I'm going to leave it as a default. There'll be no repeats. There's no tiling effect. And I could either go for a cover or I could go for a contain if it's a really big image. But depending on the size of the image, you might get a bit of bleed on the left and right over there. So cover is always a good option. I could do something like that. But I'm not, and I'm going to undo all of that. Remember, we have the history option down here. So let's just go all the way back to heading title edited. Let's now go and change the style of this. Let's click our content. Remember, I know it's not looking very nicely spaced out. Get your content in, stylize it, then sort out your margin and padding. There's going to be no link for this text, by the way. The size, I'm going to leave it as default, and it's a H1 tag, and it is aligned to the center. In the style tab, I'm going to change the color. By the way, you don't have to just use your global colors. So if I decide, oh, I want to go for this color instead, you can go for it. But for consistency, global colors is your friend. And if you realize the colors are not quite right, just hit the hamburger, hit site settings, go over to global colors and now modify the colors or remove the colors or add a new color. I'm now going to do my typography. It's already got railway because it's a custom loaded font. I'm going to go with a weight of 500. We've done 400 for the menu, but for the headline here, I'm going to go a little bit deeper. I'm going to set the letter spacing to be a one just so it spaces out a little bit more. This is now where I could think about wording as well, but I think the wording spacing is fine there. Let me just show you the differences. One, two, three, 
four. And if I'd gone with 10, remember one REM is 16 pixel. That is 160 pixel. But I think three works quite well for us. Now I'm not liking how spaced out the wording is there. I want it to be more centralized and I have two options. Option one is, well, op three options in fact. Option one is that I go over to the container and I shrink the layout width like that. That is only gonna affect the hero banner. Or let me pop that back to be uh, 1100. I go to the container and I go to the advanced tab and I now kind of start to put in some padding, 250 on the left and 250 on the right. So I could do something like that as well. Or the third option is I click on the header, I go over to the advanced tab and I go, okay, we'll do the 250 here on the margin instead or the padding, whatever you wanna go for, whatever works for you. The one I would advise on is that you just go to the container go to the layout and just change the box width. 590 works for me quite well. Now with the wrapping of the text, this is where I don't like how close they are. So we're gonna click on the header, go down to where we have, not go down, go to, go to the style tab, go to the typography, and this is where I'm now gonna adjust the line height. First thing I'm gonna do is actually set this to be an REM like that. For letter spacing, I, I don't mind leaving it as a pixel, but for line height, I like to work in REM. Because if I was to hit a one, this is now starts to work in 16 pixels. So I'm just gonna increase this to be three. Now you might not realize, but that is exactly the same as what it was when it was blank. Because our size is a three for our typography over here, now if I go with 3.5, that's added in a little bit more spacing. And don't get yourself messed up with trying to understand why and what these numbers mean, okay? But this just puts it into context. So if you've gone and put a REM of five and you go to the line height, to be at the point of what it was originally, you've got to put it as five. If you go below five, it scrunches up. If you go beyond five, it adds in more space. And you know what? I've had a change in mind. I'm going to change this to be a 300 light because I actually feel like when against the logo, that looks so much more cleaner, easier to read as well. Now, if we hit the chevron just to view it, do I need to add any more margin or padding? Do I want to make this light shrink or move away from the header? So let's go and add in a little bit more padding. We're gonna to go to our parent container, go to the advanced tab, and from the top, I'm gonna to add in 60, and from the bottom, I'm gonna give it a 60 as well like that. To be honest though, when we do get to the bottom, there will be more spacing, and we'll adjust that once we know what items we're gonna have below, because when you visually see it, all of a sudden, the amount of space you have suddenly feels too much or too less. Always double check what this looks like on the tablet and the mobile. For simplicity, we're only gonna really worry about the mobile. Um, we would do the tablet if this was a proper commission job as well, but you're just almost replicating the steps that we're going through for the mobile. You will see options in the top right where you can actually modify the width and the height of this. I like to set it to be 378 as my minimum. 360, a lot of people do work to that, but I find 378 is more realistic as to what I'm gonna see on an iPhone screen. Let's now click our parent container. Just make sure everything is zeroed out and now I rework it. So I will now say 40 from the top, it'd be 40 on the bottom, but on the left and right go with 20. That means I know there's always 20 pixels on the left and right, no matter what mobile screen you have. Now what we do need to do is have a think about though our sizing. I'm quite lucky in that my logo is only 200 pixels uh, in width and that works absolutely fine for the mobile. It might be that you need to modify that if your logo was a little bit big. Over here, you can now change the size. So if you set it to be 200 in the desktop, you could go for 100 or 150 for the mobile. For the text though, I think we definitely need to shrink this down. So let's go to the typography tab. It is currently set at three. I'm gonna change this to be a two. And this is where you now start to now have a bit of a think about, does this work for you? And I think that's actually okay. Often I find that when I'm going from desktop to mobile, you drop the REM by one, except where it's body text. So if the body text was 16 on the desktop, you usually leave it as 16, or you might go to 15 pixel, or if it, we're talking about REM, it'll be one REM on the desktop and maybe 0 0.9 or even just one REM on the mobile. But when it's with headers, if you had a five, you might drop down to a four, even a three, because it starts to look ridiculously too big. And unless that's the impact look you're going for, I would definitely say change that. So we're gonna go with a two. 
Remember our line height? So if I was to pop this now to be a two, that is now the standard, but I'm gonna increase it to be 2.5. Can you see the logic here with working with numbers like this when with REM? That is our hero banner, and it is a very different kind of hero banner. The first thing you may spot is that there is no call to action. And that's because I actually want you to scroll down the page first, because this is where we're gonna give you a bit more info we're gonna show you some products, we're gonna have our blog posts as well, and I'm also gonna tell you about courses. We could, if we want, have a button on here that says takes you to the contact, but are you really gonna contact someone straight away? I mean, you might have given me an amazing image, but maybe you wanna feed me a little bit more. So from a hero banner point of view, and you're probably gonna go, well, that wasn't really, that was a little bit pointless, it's not. I'm trying to do things a little different. So let's go and hit update and let's now check the page speed score. Da, 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 da. Yeah, we're still 100 on the desktop and the mobile, but I'm not, that's not unexpected. And I tell you what, the score dropped down to 95 or 96. I would probably wait five minutes and run it again because it might be the server speed which goes up and down. Don't forget to smash the like button if you're liking the way we're doing things and subscribe as well, because we're not just building out a website. I'm going through some of the logic and page speed insights or performance as well because there's no point building out an amazing website but the score of it is like 60 percent let's keep it high let's now start building out the rest of the home page now some areas can't be fully populated yet because we are just going to put placeholders in because we don't have the products or the blogs built yet but don't worry about that. It might not look absolutely perfect, but I'm sure you'll get the idea for what we're doing. Let's go and create in a new section. I'm gonna click the plus sign. Now, I know that this is actually gonna contain two items. It's gonna contain an image on the left-hand side, and it's also going to contain a bit of text on the right. So the option a lot of people would go for would be actually this one here. You go for the container with two child containers because you have image in container one and the text in container two. Because this is really, really simple in terms of layout, I don't actually have to do that. I could just use a standard container with a row direction and then just get my items to sit inside of there. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna go and insert my new container. I'm gonna go over and go to the advanced tab and zero, zero everything out. So there is zero margin padding. I'm gonna to go to my layout and I'm gonna set this to be a 1,100 boxed width. Remember for consistency as we go down the website. When I double check it is set to be direction as the row, I'm also gonna ensure that it starts and the alignment of the items, I am gonna go for center. You don't need to hit this one here, by the way, because it is automatically there. So even though I clicked it, you don't need to worry about it. Now I do wanna mention though, that I haven't touched on the fact with the row wrapping feature. At some point in the video, we will come on to where I am gonna to start to use that. But what that means is that if you had five or six items sat in a row, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, but you want items four, five, and six to wrap onto row number two, you could do that. Now, even though I said I'm not doing that, I might come back and do it with this particular container just to keep things really slick and slim. But stay with me on this, okay? And we will revisit this. So the first thing we're gonna do is drop in a image. You know the drill, you're gonna get a huge image. Don't worry about it. Let's go and set the image size to be a full resolution. I'm also just gonna say hit the alignment to the left. That doesn't matter so much because I'm gonna show you how we're gonna get this to sit and fit how we want. I'm not actually gonna have any caption and it's not gonna link off to anywhere and you can't click it and expand on the screen. Let's go to the size now then. Here's the really clever bit. I've already said to you that working with percentages isn't always a great idea. But what if you do wanna do that? What if I now wanna say that my boxed width is 1,100? I want this image to always be two thirds, 66.6%. Because .6%. even though you have a huge ultra wide screen, my boxed width is always is never gonna be more than 1,100 in width. I've set the width of that. So in this scenario, I could, if I want, go over here and say 66.6 .6 like that. And this is the mistake some people make. And then when they go and add in an extra item, they then realize that they're struggling to get their item to sit side by side. Because what you've done now is made that be 66.6% .6 within the image widget. This is the entire image widget, everything here. 
It's not just that. So here's where I would say leave this as it is and just set it to be 100. So we're going to adjust it with a custom width, but for now, leave it as 100%. Then I'm going to go over to the advanced tab. I'm going to go to where it says width and I'm going to go here and hit custom. And it is here where I will do 66.6. .6. And can you now see the difference? The pencil is now still on the image. So some people go and add it over here. And then they add something else to sit side by side and they've got this massive gap in between. And it's because, because you set your image to be that. I want the image estate to be 66.6 .6 custom width, but the image inside of the 66.6 .6 must be a hundred in width. And I'm going to go for this one here. Now you will notice that this already has a title, but it doesn't have an alt text. And what I strongly recommend you think about for web accessibility is having an alt title. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up my title that I have here and I'm also going to drop it in here. But this is the point where you need to now start thinking about your keywords. Now you can either do this afterwards or you could do it now. I know that my main keyword is hiking equipment and I used it in my H1 title. So I'm just going to go and type here hiking equipment. My alt text is quite descriptive and this is a really good thing for web accessibility. Let's now just insert that image. There we go. The trouble is though, the image is quite tall at the moment and I will come back to address that once I've gone and popped in my text. So let's hit the grid and we are now going to go and grab a text editor. As soon as I've done that, it's gone and made the image smaller. That's because we haven't set the text custom width yet and we will do that. Now, I do want to mention that there were two options here. I went and dragged in the text editor. You could have dragged in the heading instead and we could have made another bit of text over here, well, be a heading as a H2. Because for your keywords, you really want to have a H1, which is what we've got here and it's got our keyword, hiking equipment. You also want to have a H2, a header two semantic tag that contains your keyword as well. Sometimes the amount of text you're going to add means that you don't really want to be using a heading. Maybe you want your heading to be on top of the image. Well. If you were to now change the layout of this, you could get the heading to overlap the image, but that's going to be a lot of messing around with margins and paddings. The simpler way to do it is using a call to action widget. And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So literally right now, you're looking at me and going, why are you going back on yourself? I just want to demonstrate that if you're putting an image and you pop in your text, if you now want the text to overlap on the image, you're going to have to start doing stuff like this. You're either going to have to put in a negative number and get it to overlap like that for your margin, or you're going to go to position setting, set it to be absolute, and then you're going to start to rearrange the text wherever you want. This can get really, really messy when you're working with tablet and mobile layouts. Okay, you can still do it. I've done it. It works perfectly fine. But if you have this in too many places, it can be a bit of a headache with getting things to look consistent. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to first delete our image. And I know you're going, what? Seriously, stay with me on this. And I'm going to go and get the call to action widget. Only enough though, this isn't really going to have a button and it's not going to link anywhere, but there's a reason I like this feature. If I go and drop it in over here, do you notice that we now we get text and the image? I'm going to change the skin of this to be a cover the text is now over the image. I'm going to go and pick my image. I'm going to set this to be a full resolution. I'm going to go to my content tab. I'm actually going to get rid of the description here, but leave the title. I'm also going to change the title HTML tag to be a H2. It is already a H2, so we can leave that as it is. I'm actually going to get rid of the button. There is no button there and there is no ribbon. So we don't have to worry about that. And I've gone for some wording, which feels a little bit more impactful. Step up your hiking game. It feels like a, a call to action button, but it's not. It's not leading anywhere. Then I go to my style and this is where I now modify how it looks. So the alignment is to the left. It's going to sit at the bottom. If I want to add in any more padding to push it up or more to the right or the left, I can do that. I will come back to adjust the height of this later on once I've sorted out my text on the right. At the moment, when you hover over this, you get a bit of a hover effect. I don't actually want any hover effect. In fact, I will have it on the image, but that's about it. So the hover animation for the content, there is none. So the content stays as it is. So for the normal, I'm going to leave it as it is. 
But for the hover one, I'm actually going to just get rid of the color completely. So I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to drop this all the way down. So when you now hover, there is actually no color change there. Now you could be quite creative with this. I could go to my normal, go to my CSS filter, drop this down to be completely saturated like that. And when you now hover over it, you get the color come through. We then go to the advanced tab and I'm just gonna zero out the margin and padding. Again, you don't have to do that. You could leave it as it is. I'm gonna go to the width, set it to be custom. And this is now where I'm gonna set it to be 66.6. We are now back to where we were with the image. The difference is by using the call to action widget, it's not linking anywhere, okay? So don't worry about it. It's not gonna do anything if you click it. But what you now get is a little bit of interaction. Let me just show you how that looks on if I hit the chevron there. It's not bleeding out of the estate that we've given it. And the text there does not move, but we get this nice little bit of an effect going on. Now, looking at this is very close to the hero banner that we have, and we are going to create more spacing, but not yet. Let's just get our, our contents in. Even though this is 66.6, it's it's kind of, it's less than 50%. Let's now just zero out all the margin and padding again. I'm going to go to my whip. I'm going to go to custom, and I'm going to set this to be 33.3. And now you can clearly see the 60.6 there clicking in. You might think that's too big or not big enough. It's up to you. And can you see the wording now? Step up your hiking game. It, it, it feels more forceful. In fact, we forgot to do something. Let's just go back to call to action. Let's go to our content, go to our title. It is already railway. I'm going to go with a 500. I'm going to go with a 1.4. Uh, by the way, don't forget your letter spacing. You know, you don't have to do that, but for consistency, it can look a lot better on the eye. Let's now go over to our text editor a 1.2 and we'll leave it as a 400 normal. Now I think that text is too close to the image or the call to action. So I want to add in a little bit of padding. The problem we've got is that this all sits within one container. And if I add any padding to the container, it's going to apply it to everything all the way around. Well, again, it's not a problem. I can just click on the text editor. Go to my advanced tab and now decide on what I want. Give me 50 and on the left as well. And now we have a bit more. Let's just double check how this looks on the mobile. I cannot stress enough that if you check the mobile before you move on and you then get that right, and then you duplicate this container or you use the components again, you're not having to replicate effort. Because what if you now use this call to action four or five times throughout your website? You got it spot on here the perfect call to action, the perfect text editor or whatever. It's going to help you out and make your building so much more efficient. Because when you're really successful and you're building loads of websites, do you really want to be spending time overdoing and duplicating things over and over again? No, you don't. You want to be quick and to the point. We're in the mobile layout. I've set it to be 378. It looks really weird now because the 66.6% .6 is still there. I've clicked on the container, check the layout is fine. I don't need to adjust anything. I'm now gonna go over to my call to action, go to the advanced tab, and I'm now gonna change this to be 100%. So now it goes all the way across. Now here's where the size of it does matter. It looked okay on the desktop, but here we can't really see the person too much. So I'm gonna click on the call to action, Go to my content or the style tab, and this is where I'm going to set the height. Notice the symbol here. This is only going to touch it for the mobile. So let's go and make that a little bit smaller. I think 220 is pretty okay. Let's go down to our text editor. I'm going to zero out the padding that we applied before. I'm going to change the width of this to be a percentage and set this to also be 100. I'm going to change the padding to be 20 now. So it's in line with what we did before with the hero banner. So we always have that lovely 20 pixel. What about the size of the text? Now for this scenario, for what we're building here, I'm actually okay with the 1.2. If I change this to be a one REM, Every time we duplicate or reuse that, it will take forwards the one REM for the mobile, but maintain the 1.2 that we had on the desktop. What I am going to do, though, is add in a bit of padding of 20 and 20. Now, I've done it individually. I could have just clicked the link icon here, and when you change the items, it would change it for all of them. But sometimes I like to unlink so that I can do them on the fly rather than modifying one by one by one later on if you get it wrong. Now let's address just how big this actually looks because this is all too close to the 
images and the text we have below. I feel like we've got to add in more padding. So I'm going to go back to my hero banner and I'm actually going to increase this now. So what you get is something like this. Now, I know people are going to say, yeah, but you can see a bit of the text below and it'd be better if you saw it all in one go. I completely agree with you, but it all depends on the look you're going for. And this kind of now makes you want to go down a little bit. I'm showing you a bit of the image and then you scroll down to see the rest of it. And if we go to the mobile, when it comes to um, uh, performance, if you can only see part of a container or a section, it can affect your page speed score. So do I now move all of this to be below the fold? Do I decrease and modify my sizing to bring this text above as well? Well, why don't we go and test the score and just see how much of an impact we get? And here's what I wanted to point out. The score has now dropped by 2%. On the desktop, just by 1%. And the issue really is the largest content for paint. Now, you won't really get much recommendations coming on at this point, but why is that causing a drop? Because it's just an image. Well, believe it or not, it's because of the size of that image. This image, if I was to show you, is 1920 by 1080. Does it need to be that big? Because on the desktop, it's actually only 720 pixels roughly in width. And on the mobile, depending on your mobile size, it could go from 378 or to about 450 or 500. So we've got to think about the sizing of this. If you know you're going to use an image as a full width, go and get them in at that size. However, if that image was never ever going to be bigger than what we've just said, how about you resize it somewhere and load it in at that size? Or you could drag in a copy of the image into here and then put in an alternate size. For simplicity, I'm just going to resize what we actually have. So let me go over to my image and we will have an option down here for edit image. At the minute, this is 1920. I'm going to drop it down to 720. Let's go and hit edit image. And here I'm now going to scale it, not crop it, scale it. Let's put it to 720 and then hit scale. You don't have a save option anywhere, but just don't hit cancel because if you hit cancel, it won't do it. If I now come out and I click in, that is now 720 by 405. Whenever you do changes like that, make sure you refresh your page. Otherwise, it might still be holding on to the 1920 version. And our desktop is now 100 and our <laughs> mobile is also 100. Can you see how by doing little improvements and checks like this can massively affect your score? But that's the mistake you don't want to be making, just a little bit of effort. Because that image is not full width, right? I'm not going to use it anywhere on the website as a full width either. I know that as a fact. Therefore, why are you doing this? If you were going to reuse the image, then drag in another copy, resize that and use the resize copy. But look, even though the mobile was only like 378 or 400 in width, that 720 is far better than 1920. It makes a big impact. And let me show you what happens if I was to go and duplicate this text editor, because we've already set the whips on it. So if I was to go over here and duplicate, it basically now puts it into the same line, even though I've gone and set the whips and it starts to mess up the look of it. That's because this container is set up as a row. But what we haven't done is apply the wrap. So if I was to hit wrap now, all the items move over. Now you're going to go, well, why is the text editor gone? That's meant to stay on row one. I know this one's going to move because you're wrapping, but why is that moved? It's because the containers automatically apply a gap of 20 pixel. So if I zero that out, now you can see what's going on. It's wrapped it over. You would apply some padding or adjustment over here. And if I was to now go in like, I mean, look, let me just make a point. If I keep duplicating this, it goes on to the next line because you can't have 66 plus 66 equals 100. It's more than 100, right? And what we're now going to do is just duplicate that entire container. Now, this container is actually going to be a little bit different to what we've got here, but we're still going to reuse a lot of the features that we have. We have a call to action and we have a text. I actually want to have a third item in here. 
This first call to action is now going to showcase a product and we're going to have a bit of a title, but we're also going to have a button that takes you off to that product because we hopefully want you to convert and buy that. Go to my advanced tab and I'm going to change this to be 33.3 like that. Change my image. I'm going to go down to my content. I'm going to give it a title. I'm going to change it to be more details. And rather than having it as a title, I'm going to copy that. And where we have the button, I'm actually going to pop it there. And then I'm going to pop in a little bit of an arrow, almost implying, look, if you want to go further, now click it. So now we have our button at the bottom. Going to get rid of the border width. Let's go and add in a background color. And remember that we did check this on our contrast checker. Look, if I just go and pick up this code, which is part of our global color, if I go and use this uh, little tool over here and drop this in, and just hit return, you can see it's passing all of the tests there for web accessibility. Contrast ch checking is really important, and I strongly say that you really should bring this into your portfolio whenever you're building, all right? Don't ignore it. Right, back over here. So now we have our button over there, but it's a really good idea to make sure you have a hover color as well. So I'm actually gonna flip it the other way. So I'm gonna say when you hover over it, the font goes to the dark bluey, navery, purpley color there, and the background color goes to a white. And you could also, if you want, go to your background color and just drop it a little bit. If we go for a CC, I'm just gonna do the same over here with the white as well. That and I just adds in a little bit of a transparent effect there. I've put the border back in. So from a web accessibility point of view, it's clear there's a button there. There's a contrast checker done on the colors and we got our hover effect change as well. Now, one thing we do have though is we do have the hover effect still on the call to action. I think having it above was okay. Don't overdo it. Don't make every item on your page have a hover effect. It's too much. So let's just set that to be a non as well. And there we go. Now we're gonna reuse this call to action on the right hand side. But before you do that, what do you think I'm gonna tell you to do next? Exactly, check on the mobile. Because once you know you've got that perfect, when you duplicate it, it will also be perfect. Call to action looks okay. The text over there, I'm just gonna add in a little bit of padding to the top there. I'm going with a 40 there, and I'm gonna go with a 30 below, mainly because text editors always have a little bit of extra spacing. You can add in some CSS to sort that out, but I'm keeping this simple as much as I can. So what we have is your hero banner, you got a, a bit of an image there, you got a bit of text, we got this, and then we got a bit more text. That's kind of okay. That, that's fine now for us to continue. Uh, I am just going, in, in fact, before we continue, let me change the text here. And now I'm just going to duplicate this call to action, go over to my navigator and move it after the text editor so it flips to the other side. And then I'm going to go in and I'm just going to modify the image to be this one. What's the impression you're getting when you look at that? Doesn't It looks weird, but it's also really, really clean in the layout. It still works really well. And you can almost see the trickery in that the first two proper call to actions on this page are go and see more about these products or go and buy. You could have a buy now button as well. Now the next container after this is just going to be a copy of the very first one we've got here but we're just gonna flip the item. So let me now copy that in its entirety and just hit paste. And it now sits exactly below because there was no margin. If this container had any margin applied in it, let's say a 50, you'd get a gap, which is might be the look you're going for. I mean, with a gap, it still looks nice as well. But I really think that whole up against one another look is super, super cool. Let's now go over to our navigator, just expand that child container and I'm now gonna pick the text editor up, swap it over. I'm gonna remove the hover effect and I'm gonna remove the title as well. Now, as soon as you do that on a call to action, it will disappear. But all you gotta do is just hit a space like that and it's okay. Yep, that's looking absolutely fine. Then we're again gonna copy the first container we had there after the hero banner and we're gonna paste it in because I'm now gonna reuse that exact layout for another section. But this one is gonna be quite a bit different. This is now going to showcase courses, but for now I'm just going to stick in a placeholder. So when I delete the call to action, we now just have the text editor. I am going to need to use a container, which we drop in. I'm now going to make sure that this container is set as a row. I'm going to ensure that there is a zero gap. And then I'm going to go to the child container, 
I'm going to set this to be a 0, 0 margin padding. Go to the layout, make sure it is full width, but I'm going to set it to be 66.6 .6, and you can see what it's doing there. Then inside of the navigator, I'm going to swap them over. I'm then going to drop in a text editor into there, but rather than dropping in a brand new one, I'm just going to copy what I've got over there and paste that in. Bear in mind both that already had some custom width bins, so just click on that particular text editor and just set the width to be default, so it now goes all the way across. And then underneath that, I'm actually gonna add in a button. Remember, this is all sat within a child container, so I can do this. So one for the sizing, and we'll go for a one with the spacing. It's gonna go in and add in that arrow there. I mean, you can add in a symbol here as well, but sometimes just using the <laughs> arrows that you get on your keyboard are absolutely fine or the symbols and change the hover effect so the border will still stay white now for the child container to be almost similar to what we had above i'm going to go to my advanced tab and i'm going to say give me a 20 from the bottom and a 20 from the left there just so that when you are looking at it the the items there they're kind of in line with the items above change the left to be 20 so that now I mean, to be honest, it does look better in line, right? So let's leave it at that. I'm going to go to this container uh, and I'm just going to add in a bit of padding. So I'm going to say, give me about 60 from the top and 60 from the bottom. You may need to experiment a little bit. So I'm using a tool on my MacBook where I can draw around and get an idea for what the height is. So this is currently a height of about 280. If I go over here, that's about 280 as well. So if I had added in some padding, to that container to be 50-50, I would have had to make it higher, so 60-60 works quite well. The reason I've done that is because I wanna maintain this kind of almost like a grid-like approach. It's not grid, by the way, this isn't CSS grid, but you get that kind of look. Let's go to our container and let's go and pick a background image. This container at the minute has padding. So intentionally, I've done a few things wrong here, okay? And you gotta bear with me on this. The solution is actually really simple. And once you see it, you'll go, all oh, right, okay. Zero everything out, go to the other text editor, which is here. And I'm gonna add in my 60 and my 60, right? That gives me my 280 height. And I'm just gonna double check it again, right? That gives me my 280, I'm okay. We still have the problem. Watch this, I'm gonna go to my container and where it says stretch, I click it. It now stretches everything to fill the gap. I then go to my container that is sat here, uh, go to my layout, and I'm gonna say, bring everything to the bottom, okay? So now we get our 20 and our 20. There are many ways you can do this. Go with the one that works best for you. I'm gonna click on my container. It's cutting off a part of the head, which ain't a good idea. So we're gonna go over here, and I'm gonna go with top center, so now I can see the person. The lettering, though, is not very clear. Even though we've gone and brought over our same color over here. So on our background image now, I'm going to add in a overlay. We scroll down until we get to background overlay. And this is where I'm going to apply it. I could either add in like a gradient. So it goes from dark to white or blue to red. Or I could just add in a standard color. I'm going to go with a pastel -y color like that. If I was to make it go like that, it's gonna be the full color. If you go all the way to zero, it's completely one, but I'm just gonna do something like this. Just like that, I've changed it. Let me show you what I did. I went and changed my background image to be something slightly different. Uh, well, a snowy picture. I've changed the overlay color to be white, and I've currently at the moment set it to be about 0 0.8, like that, that's okay. Um, I've also increased the size of the text, but only for this container from a 1.2 to a 1.4. The idea is, is that is this is going to be a call to action link that allows you to go and buy courses, which we'll cover later on in this tutorial as well. What if when I get to the mobile, I don't want to have this image showing now because I feel like I've got too many images on. If I was to go here and click on the call to action, the image, you could even do it on text as well. You go to the advanced tab, you'll have a feature there or a setting for responsive and I can say hide on mobile. So on the mobile, that is not visible, but it will still be there for the desktop. Now below here, we are actually gonna show off three products. 
I haven't built the products fully in the WooCommerce bit because we haven't added that in. So rather than duplicating what we've done here, where we just said, hey, look, here's the backpacks, go and look at them. This will actually be a loop grid product uh, feature, but we're not gonna show that yet until we have to build it and we'll return back to this page. But what we will do is add in a promo or a little bit of a, like a prompt or, or like a bit of like a quote. So rather than starting again, I'm just gonna go in and pick up this container at the top. I'm gonna scroll down and paste it over here and get rid of the logo. We'll leave the text in for now, click the style, go and add in an image. We'll set it to be a center center image. In fact, no, we'll go with center top because I wanna make sure we don't, we can see the head there perfectly fine. This container, because it was duplicated, did have some padding in there. So let's just zero all of that out. We'll go to the layout tab and I will now give this a height of about something like about 400. We'll click on the container, make sure that everything is justified into the center. To be honest though, the style I've gone for here, it probably does not work very well now, but we are gonna modify this. We're gonna go to style for the typography, change this to be a white, I'm gonna make the typography be a, we'll leave it as a three, but I'm gonna make it be a lot more bolder in its style there. I think 800 is too much. We'll go with a 700. You go to the style for your container, you go to background overlay, and you could either have two colors blended or just go for one color like this. And then you could darken it or brighten it up, but then you find that it kind of starts to mask a lot of the image. So that's not a great look. Go to the advanced tab. I'm gonna give this a bit of padding all the way around of about 30, something like that. I'm then gonna go down to background for the heading. And now I'm gonna add in my color and we'll go for a, a dark color. But we'll also now just, you know, shrink it down a little bit, something like that. So yes, I know it's masking the person, but it's not completely in your face. Modify the sizing of the font to be 1.5 because it doesn't have to be so big. I've also just dropped the weighting because I still had 700. I've put it down to 500. That works for me okay. The desktop is coming out as 100. You can see the layout there. The mobile is fine as well. We're hitting 100%. So we have on here a lot more than what we had before. Now, as we continue the build, I might swap out some of the images. I'm now not sure about this bottom one here and maybe this one, but don't forget, we are gonna have free products coming and we still need to add in the footer. I hope you like what we're doing so far with that whole layout because it is very different and we're still achieving high page speed scores. Now, look, we haven't done the SEO yet and there's more to do and we are gonna cover that. Don't forget to smash the like button and check out our super course. We're gonna start looking at the other pages now and I'm only gonna do an about page, a contact page, and I'm probably gonna do a socials page as well, which will make sense when we get to it. But before we do that, I have made a few changes onto the bottom part of the website because I felt like the images weren't working very well for me. What you'll now see is there's been a change of image and I've removed the background overlay color and I've changed the font from dark to white. And I felt like this image worked better than the snowy one. It felt too faded out. And also down here, I've changed the image and I've changed the text ever so slightly. And again, I've got rid of any background overlay. So. This is just where when I looked at the page, like on a full page screenshot, it really felt like it looks good at the top half, bottom half, not a little bit weak. So I've gone and modify that. Remember, we are going to have um, blog. I keep saying products in the other video, but I meant to say uh, we're going to have uh, three blog posts that will be sat between this container and this container. Now for the about and contact page, I'm obviously going to use a similar layout to what I've used on the home page because the idea is, is that is you want to get your home page signed off and you, before you proceed with other pages. If you don't do that, then your client might come back to you after you've done 20 pages and now you've got to redo the entire style. Make sure you get the home page signed off. That's really important. But when it comes to doing other pages, you could duplicate the home page and then modify bits of it because you've got the perfect section and containers. A great plugin is Duplicate Page by uh, MNDP Sync. Um, this is a great one. I use this quite a lot. It's really lightweight. It literally just duplicates the entire page and then you can add or remove bits or you could do it manually, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go over to pages in WordPress and I'm now going to click add new. 
and I'm going to call this one about, and then I'm going to hit edit with Elemental. Remember, that's what you do. If you hit edit and you start editing it in the WordPress, Gutenberg, or the block press, block press, the block editor, you might regret it when you then want to start working with Elemental because then things get a little bit messy. The first thing I'm going to do is go down to the settings cog in the bottom left and I'm going to say hide the title. Now you will notice that the page already brings over the header and just remember we had like a, a very empty footer which is visible but you can't really see it there because it's invisible but we got our header coming in. If you ever want to build a page whereby you've said the header is active on every page, the entire site, but you don't want it visible on this particular page, you could go and add a display condition or go to page layout and set it to be Elemental Canvas. When you do that, no header or footer will be visible on your page. So please bear that in mind. I'm just gonna pop it back in because we do wanna have it over here. I'm just gonna put it as default and it reappears. Now let's start building our page. The layout is gonna be very, very simpler, simpler, sim similar, <laughs> and it's going to be a block of text with an image, and then another image and a block of text. It's an about page. You don't wanna go overly crazy on it. I'm just gonna copy this entire section that we have, and I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna paste it. So what happens is it maintains the padding that we had at the top. I'm then gonna get rid of the logo. And then I'm gonna change this to say about, it's pretty simple at this point, right? Put it on the left. I'm then gonna go over to my container, set this to be a 1100, because remember that's the size I'm working with. Make sure there's no marginal padding on it, because obviously I've duplicated it from before. Here's the beauty about duplication, okay? It brings over the size. Now we are not gonna have that size, but I just wanna show you how it brings everything over. Before I modify any, in fact, no, let's modify this first. I'm now gonna go to the typography. We're gonna leave the color as it is, and I'm gonna set this to be a two. That looks okay to me. Let's now, while we're here, just jump straight into the mobile and go, do we still wanna leave it as a two? Or do we wanna go smaller? So I'm now gonna drop this to be a 1.5. The 1.5, I think, looks actually pretty decent there. So have a think about what is the sizes you're gonna have before you start to proceed any further. Uh, we'll just go back to the desktop, go back to the container. We will leave the 60 at the top, but I am going to get rid of the bottom margin, okay? So that is now our new headline. Please do remember, though, that when you are on your page, you might want to go over and just double check it is a H1 semantic tag. That being said, the word about is probably the weakest keyword you can go, and I'm going to be using the word hiking throughout the website when we get onto the SEO. So maybe I wanna change it to be about hiking, about me and hiking. Um, so can I do anything there? But then again, at the same time, how often do you want the about page to be really highly ranked? Really you want your home page and your product pages and maybe your blog pages. So the about page is an extra thing, but I'm just letting you know, it, it can be quite weak in terms of SEO, but deal with it. Then I'm gonna scroll down and I'm actually gonna pinch this section over here. So I'm just gonna copy that, go to my about and I'm gonna hit paste like that. I'm gonna go to my image, or in this case, it was a call to action widget, which I don't mind leaving. It's okay, it's fine. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna change this to be 33.3. Um, whoops, let me put the 0.3 in there. I and mean, then I'm gonna go over to my text, which is currently set at 33.3 as well and change that to be 66.6% like that. So what we now get is the image and we get a bigger load of text. Now, if I click on the container, you will notice that this is aligned to the center. What I actually want is the text to start from the top and then work its way down. So let's align it to be like that. Now we can see that it's way too close to the header spacing. So I go back to the previous container, go to advanced, and I have a choice here. I could either use a bit of margin, so I could kind of say, well, just give me a bit of spacing from below there, or I could apply some padding. Let me show you. I could do 40 and it pushes it down or I could do a 40 like that as well. I'm just gonna go for the margin one and we're gonna go with about 40. Now you will notice that these are not in line and just to be sure, I'm gonna hit the chevron, there's definitely a gap going on there. Remember, I've just duplicated a container from another page. So let's go in and double check. Let's click the container, it's a 1000 by 100. There's zero on the margin and padding. We then click into the text and you can see here now we have 20 on the left. Let's completely get rid of that, but we will maintain the 50 on the right. And if you're wondering why I had 20 on the left, remember over here, I was getting things to be in line with the buttons. So that's why we had it. 
But over here, I'm not overly worried about that. Now let me go and add in some text. Again, I just used chat GPT and said, hey, give me an about section about a female hiker who likes to do hiking with her family and it's really good for her life. That's pretty quick and easy, right? Now, before we proceed on to the next bit, which is almost gonna be a duplicate and then we're gonna swap the text and image or the call to action around, go and check how this looks in the mobile. So here we have our container and we've currently got 40 in that uh, at the bottom as well. I'm gonna get rid of that just to bring it closer. And the spacing looks okay. We've got the 2020 on the left and right. The size of the text is okay. I'm just gonna double check that. It's a 1.2 at the moment. I'm gonna change that to be a one on the mobile. So I don't mind on the desktop that it is a little bit bigger, but the one on the mobile is a bit more quicker and easier to fly through. And remember one is equal to 16 pixels, which is perfectly fine for web accessibility. Now we're gonna duplicate this entire section like that. So we have a new container at the bottom. I'm gonna open up my navigator, click on the container just so I can see the content. And I'm just gonna pick the text editor up and pop it after the call to action. There's just a few changes I have to do here now. I don't need to worry about the width because it's already been set. I am gonna go to the text editor though inside here, go to the advanced tab where we had 50 on the right. I'm gonna change that to be a zero and then put 50 on the left. So we get that kind of equal nice spacing here. Now this is where the text is now too close and this is where you now have to have a think about your layouts. So let me just pop the text in here and then I'll have a change. I'm gonna to go to my first container and I'm now gonna pop the layout back to be in the center. Because of the amount of text we got, it actually looks okay. Uh, for it to be centralized, whereas before with just a one liner, it looked really spaced out. Go to the second container and I'm also gonna do that as well. So if we now view that, that is looking okay. Now, if you feel like the wording wasn't uh, needs to be lengthened out, you could do that or you could shorten it. If you feel like the images are too big, again, you could go and modify that as well. But that is a very simple about page layout. Let's double check how that looks in the mobile. We have two images now hitting one another because uh, this was item number two in container one, and this is item number one in container two. This is actually a really simple thing to do to sort out. I now wanna swap it over. So I'm gonna click on the container. Once you change the direction, the image now goes below which looks absolutely fine, but when you go back to the desktop, we've still maintained the style. That literally is the about page done. And this is where, when you spend time on your home page and you get that signed off, you can kind of start rattling through the other pages at a much quicker rate. So now we can move on to the contact page, but hold up. I'm now gonna tell you that what we've done is actually not the best way to do it semantically, especially if you wanna kind of keep things all connected to one another. Have you noticed what I've skipped and not done right? And there's a reason I did it the way I did it because this is what we tend to cover off in tutorials or what we tend to see other people building and we all fall into this trap. I mentioned earlier about how you wanna think about your H1 tag and all of that. And we've got one here for this container. Where's the H1 tag or not the H1, any tag. We have got, we've got no heading tag for this set container here or this container. In fact, what about this image? Have we en entered an alt tag? Let me go and click the image. Let's go over to it. Look over here. We have the, uh, we have the image. Now you can't see it because my face is hiding it, but the alt text is completely blank. The first thing I'm gonna do is give my images alternate title. So I'm gonna call this Sarah who runs the Our Hike website. And then we're gonna go down to this image. And again, we don't have any alt text here either. So I'm gonna give it one as well. I'm just gonna say kids looking up at a tree. That's really quick and easy, right? I've now gone and popped in my alternative text. Please make sure you do that for a web accessibility point of view. Now, what about getting all of these into one container? Let's just look at the navigator again. We got container with the header. We got another container with text image and then another container with text image as well. Can we get all of these to actually be within one container? Yes, you can. Now, if you decide you try dragging this in, it does not work really well at all with dragging a container like that. But what you can do is copy the components over. Let's go and drop in a container underneath the about. So now we have a container within the parent container. So we have a new child container. Now I'm gonna to go to the second one that we had built with Sarah's photo. By the way, this person's not called Sarah, it's just someone I'm using for the website, uh, stock imagery. 
I'm going to copy that entire container. Just right click and hit copy. Go over to the new container and now I'm going to paste. We have a new child container, but now all of the contents I've pasted and have now gone into another grandchild container, which I don't want. Seriously, don't worry about that. Just pick it up and put it now underneath the heading. If you try and drag um, from the get go, it doesn't work, which is why I'm using a blank container to get things in. I'm now going to do the same with this other container. Let me just get rid of this one here. I'm going to copy this container, go over to my new container, which now sits down here. And again, I'm going to paste. But what I get is another grandchild. So let's just pick it up and pop it in over there. Now we have the layout in the right order. So now let me get rid of the uh, container I'd originally added, which was just there for placement reasons, and we get rid of that. So if we now look at our layout, this is what we have. It is not that dissimilar from what we had before from memory. We now have everything in one container. Yes, you have two children container containing items, but that's okay because now the entire container has got a heading. This is really important from, for web accessibility. And when we go to the mobile view, it's all looking okay. So I wanted to show you how we can fall into the trap of going, well, we'll have a container for the heading, then we'll have another container for here and another container for there. If they're all kind of related to one another or they're connected, just stick it all in one go. Let's hit update and now let's go and create our contact page. And before we do that, I'm going to copy this entire container because this now is contains everything. And now I'm going to manipulate it for the contact page. So let's go over here, click add new. We will call this one uh, contact, edit with Elementor. That will now open up. I'll go to the bottom cog. The first thing I'm going to do is hide the title. I will then paste everything we've done before. I'm probably going to get rid of this container because I only intend to have a form and some social sharing icons and maybe an email or something on the right hand side. So I'm just going to keep this really simple. I'm going to change this to be get in touch. By the way, it is OK to have alternate titles if you want. OK, um, so if you want to call it contact me or whatever you can do, but get in touch is simple as well. I'm going to get rid of the text editor and I'm going to get rid of the image. This contains everything we had done before. OK, so just a reminder, if we go back to the about page, you look at that. Everything is nice in line Our text styling. What we did for the desktop and the mobile, everything is what I call perfect. So now when I drop things in here, I don't need to worry about redoing the container size and all of that. It should all work pretty well. OK, let's go and drop in a form like that. And before we stylize the form, let's go and get in our social sharing icons. Um, let me just drop that in. Remember, the child container is a set as a row, so everything will be added one after another. Now, I am going to highlight to you, though, however, how we may need to drop in another container here, and you're going to see why in a moment. Because if I was to now go in and say, actually, I'm going to use the icon list as well, it might sit, you can rearrange it. Don't worry about the sit or how tight it is against one another. We are going to have a little bit of a problem with getting that to wrap below the social sharing icon. So I want to highlight how having things sat side by side can work for you until you get to the point where you want them to be sat by the side, but then below one another. Because if you start to wrap this or start to adjust the custom width, what will happen is this will go underneath here. But I want it to be underneath the social sharing icons. So let's go and drop in another container like that. Now, what you do have to make sure, though, is where does that container sit? So if you look here carefully, we have a container and then we have another container that is currently empty, but it's now sat within this container. Look at the arrows. OK, can you see the slanted angle? So I'm just going to pick up this container and make sure it's actually sat in the right place. Let me just close that down. I mean, I'm going to move it again to sit there. Be very careful of your placement, because otherwise, when you come to do your layout, it starts to play havoc and it can mess your head up. So into this new container, I'm going to go and drop in the social sharing icons and I'm going to drop in the icon list as well. Now I'm going to go to my main container and I'm going to ensure that this is set to be a row. So I want everything to be after one another. I'm then going to hit the wrap button so that everything now wraps and you kind of go, well, now we're back to where we were before. 
I'm going to go to my get in touch line and say, make sure that is definitely full width. See the, the pink line went all the way across. That means that this container can never be in the same line because this was set to full width. We then go to container number one. I'm going to set this to be full width, but it is going to be 50%. And then I'm going to go to container number two, also be 50%. But again, you're going to go, but they're still underneath one another. Look, remember I mentioned this earlier. If you go to the container, we have a gap of 20 pixel. Okay, so if I was to remove that to zero, everything shrinks down and now they are side by side. I'm going to leave that as 20 and all I'm going to do is adjust my whip. So I'm going to pop this to be 45 and I'm going to do the same over here as well like that. So what we now have is both items side by side. I did that in a very convoluted way, but I wanted to highlight how we still have a parent container with a heading for semantic and web accessibility. We now have two child containers. Child container one contains a form. Child container two contains the social sharing icons and icon lists. Now, does the form need to be in a container? To be absolutely honest, no, it doesn't. So I could quite easily do this as well. I just completely remove it, get rid of that container, and look at that, we are still side by side. I could go in now to my form, go to advanced, set that to be a custom width, and again, just put it back to the 45% that we had before. So there's many ways you can do your layout. Containers are great if you're trying to wrap items together in a certain area but you don't always need to rely on them. And this layout here kind of works for us because we still have our H1 or we'll H2 tag or whatever we convert it to. Let's go to the child container first, click on it, and I'm gonna align everything to be in the center and we're gonna say it starts on that side. We're also going to go to the advanced type. I'm gonna zero everything out, but I am gonna say, give me about 50 from the left there as a margin. You could use padding as well. You will go for what you prefer to work with. We'll then go to the social sharing icons. Now, the way this works is really, really simple. You go in, you can change the icon if you want, or you can import one in. We'll leave it as it is. You can decide if you're gonna use an official color or if you're gonna stylize your own custom color. And then over here is where you would paste your link. Now, one important thing I will stress, though, is that you can also decide if this is going to open in a new window. I would always say leave that ticked because what you don't want is for them to click it and then they go off somewhere else. You want your, your window to still be open on the browser somewhere because you can lose a conversion very quickly like that. And you can also go and click add and add in another item as well. I'm just gonna leave this as these three as it is at the moment. We're gonna set these to be a square because our styling throughout the website is very square-like. I'm gonna set this to be three columns. I have found that if you set this to be auto, on the desktop, sometimes it doesn't look so great. So I'm gonna set this to be three columns. It is left aligned. We're gonna to go to style. I'm gonna apply a custom color. If you apply a custom color here, you'll have to do it for each one in turn. Whereas if you know you're gonna apply a standard color across all of them, go over to style and do it here with custom. The secondary color is the color in the center and we're gonna leave that as a white. And the primary color is the background. And for that, I'm just gonna go with this shade over here. And then I'm gonna modify the size to be 20 pixels. And I'm gonna add in about 10 pixels spacing like that. Pretty, pretty simple. Now we're gonna go over to the icon list and it's the same kind of logic applies here. I'm gonna get rid of these items. You can duplicate once ever you've built one. And here's where I'm now just gonna add in a dummy email address and a phone number. Seriously, do not email that address. You're not gonna get anywhere. And then for the link, I'm gonna type in mail to with a colon and I'm gonna paste that. So now when they click that, it will open up an email for them to send. Okay, that's a bit of a tip there for your hyperlinks there. I'm gonna change the icon over here. I'm gonna go for envelope and I'm just going to go for a really simple one like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just duplicate this, go over to it, change it to now be a phone. And down here, I'm going to type in tell colon and pop the number in there. I'm going to leave it as a default layout rather than having it as inline. Go over to my style and modify the size of it now. I'm going to give a space between of about 10. 
I'm going to make sure it's left aligned, which it always is. Even though it is already left aligned, I sometimes like to click it just to make sure that anyone viewing it can see the settings that were applied. I'm going to go over to my icon and now decide on the size of that to be 20 as well. I'm going to go to my text, go to my typography. It's already using railway. I'm going to set this to be an REM and I'm going to pop it to be a one. I'm going to leave the weight as a 400 and I'm going to make my letter spacing be a one as well, just slightly spaced out there. I'm then going to go to my about section. I'm going to copy over some text uh, from the about page. I'm going to dump it into this container. I'm going to move it to be above the social sharing icons. Remember though that this text editor had a width of 66.6. .6. I'm going to get rid of that and then I'm going to modify the text adding in a little bit of text. And it's mainly just to pad out the area because sometimes you've got to think about how does it look on the page. And if it starts to look really, really empty, and this is the problem with contact pages, they just have a contact form. And that is can be <laughs> super, super boring, okay? So try and do something a little bit more to like make them feel like you're caring. Let's just go over to the contact form now. Um, you got name, email, if you wanna add in another field and you wanted to go for like phone number or maybe you want like a, a check box or a select box whereby that you kind of go, what are you interested in? You know, do you want me to give you a quote or a proposal? Do you wanna know more about mountain climbing and things like that you could do? I'm just gonna keep it really simple with name, email, and message. I'm actually going to get rid of the label there. I'm going to go to the message box and I'm going to increase it to be six just so it kind of spaces out nicely on the page. I'm going to go to my button. I'm going to put it on the left. I don't like the big massive button look all the time. We're going to click on email and this is where you need to add in the email address but where you want the forms to go. I've changed the subject to be our hike contact page because it will put some random stuff in there. And whenever you get emails, it's not user friendly for yourself. So make sure you know, because if you've got like four or five forms on your website, you might want to know which page they came from. Then we're going to go over to the style tab. And again, you're just going to fly through this now. I'm going to go to the field area, go to the typography where we have railway. Again, REM, and I'm just going to pop in 1.2 like that. You can see it's kind of extended it a little bit there. That, this is the great thing about designing. You sometimes change your mind. I'm going to go here and put the rows to be a five. That's better. Let's go back to style. And the last thing we're going to do is just double check the button. So this is the color it's bringing through, which is the accent color, which I'm totally fine with, but we don't have anything happening on hover. So I'm gonna change that and we'll go for a background color. In fact, we'll just go for a black like that. We'll leave it as white. So when you hover over it, you get a little bit of a color change there. Go and check how does it look on the mobile. So let's just go over here. And this is where the sizing now does play havoc with you a little bit. Let's just double check the container. Make sure there's nothing going on here. Well, we have 20 on the left and right, which we're fine with. We then go over to the form, check what's going on there. This is currently set to be a 45 uh, pixel width. That's because of we dragged it in to sit underneath the header because we got rid of the child container, remember? So I'm going to go here and I'm going to set this to just be a full width like that. Don't worry, it is still fine on the desktop. Okay, you've not lost anything there. Then we have our button. Down here, we have the child container. We have a 50 there, let's get rid of that. Now, what if you want the child container component to actually be here? So you want the header, child container, and then your form. Well, if you were to go over to your container now and you start to mess around with the direction over here in the layout, this actually isn't really gonna help you out because what it will instead do is start to put things in the complete wrong order. So let's leave it as the row here for now. What you need to do is go over to each of your items, go to the advanced tab and go to order and then click custom. And what you're now gonna do is decide on the order of the items. So for the mobile, I want the header to be number one. Now at the minute it jumps all the way down because we haven't defined the others. So anything you don't define will sit above. So the header will be number one. The form will go to order custom is going to be number three like that. And then when we go to this container that contain the text and the social sharing icons, you hit custom and I'm going to set this to be an order of two. Can you see what we've got now? We got one, two, three. So now we have all these details da, 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 and then we've got the form. I'm okay with that. Let's go back to desktop. It is still in the order that it was before. 
So on the mobile, I can determine the exact order of my items. And we have one parent container, we've got our form, and then we've got a child container containing some further items. I hope this is all helping you out with understanding how to build a little bit better. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned that we were going to have two different headers. The home page was going to have something that was very different to the others. Now that we've built the pages, let's go and modify that. I'm going to go over to templates, go to save templates, and I'm going to click all. Remember, it's always a good idea to hit that so you can see everything. We have default kit, leave that as it is, a header home and a footer template. I am going to go and hit edit with Elementor for the header home. So it's now open for us. Now, then I'm gonna go and create a new template, add new. I'm gonna call this one the header and I'm gonna call it header of a pages, just so it's very simple and easy to identify. Go and click create template. I don't care about any of the templates here, so let's hit X. Now I'm gonna go over to my original header and very simply, I'm just gonna copy this and paste it into the new one. Really simple and easy, right? And then for the other pages, I'm just gonna leave it as it is. Because this is actually the header I will be using on the other pages. There's no need to change anything. Remember, we're on the other pages template. You then click publish, and it will now say, what is your condition? I'm gonna hit um, entire site. I had to pause there for a moment because I was waiting for this. You are, you're always gonna get an error because we already have a header template, which is on every page. So what we're gonna do is just hit X for a moment. Now I'm gonna jump back into my header home, okay? It's always a good idea to do this and change the display condition so you know exactly what everything is doing. I'm now gonna delete that logo, and you'll notice now my menu has gone all the way over to the left. That's because we were using space between. So let's now change that to be end. All right, remember that we had logo, menu, space between. You Now you only have one item, so now there is no space between. So just change the, uh, the, the, uh, the justification of the content. Now I'm gonna hit update. That is now the header that will be visible on every page because currently it is on every, it's the entire website. So hit the arrow down here, which is now where you go and change the display condition. We don't want it on the entire website anymore. So I'm gonna change it to be singular, and I'm now gonna say only show that on the front page. I could, if I want, go here and click page and then type in the page name, but I only want it on the front page. Let's hit save and close. That will now be on the front page. Let me now just close that. Now we're back in the header of a pages template. We're leaving everything intact, okay, because we created it and we want the logo there. Now I hit publish and it says, well, what do you wanna do? I'm gonna hit um, add condition and go for the entire site. But you wanna be careful here because I've said go for the entire site, but then I'll also wanna add in another condition and I'm gonna change this to be exclude, change it to be singular, and then I'm gonna say front page. So just to be sure, I'm saying the entire website, but exclude the front page. Now, some people have said, because you already set a header to do that, you might get away with not doing the exclusion. I would rather be safe than sorry. And this is so quick and easy to do, why not just do it? So let's now hit save and close. Let's now go back into our menu, go over to appearance, go to menus, and we now have two more new pages. So let's go and add them in. And I'm just gonna rearrange the order. If you wanted the contact to be a subset of the about, just move it to the right. And this is now where you get the drop down in the menu which is completely pointless for what we're doing here. And I'm now just gonna hit save menu. Now let's go and view our website and see what the logos are like. So let's just hit view site. Here is our page. Notice the logo is missing, okay? Because this is the header I want on the front page. I now go to the about page, the logo is there. I go to the contact page, the logo is there. I go to the home page, the logo is not there. It made no sense to me to have the logo here if I've got the logo here as well. It just doesn't really work well in, for what I'm building. Whereas when you go over here, now it makes total sense. 
I hope you're okay with that. Now, as far as templates go, you could also create a search page results as well. So if you were to use the widget whereby you have a magnifying glass, whereby people can search for products or posts on your page, you would go and create a search results page. And we have got a video for that. And rather than covering it here, I'm gonna put a link in the video that you can go and watch. But one thing you definitely wanna do is a 404 page. So if someone clicks an old link from an old post or an old page that is still stuck in Google somewhere, and that page does not no longer exist, what you don't want is for them to get that dreaded 404 page that says, error, we can't find your page, because that can put people off. So let's go and create that. Let's go to templates, go to save templates. Again, click all just so you know what you've got. Go and click add new. Now over here, we're gonna click error 404. And I'm gonna call this the 404 page. Well, just call it 404, you know, or error page, whatever you want. You should know what 404 is now. I'm sure you've seen it on the internet many, many times. We go and click create template. Elementor does do a great job of giving you lots of examples here, um, but I'm gonna go with something really, really super simple. I'm just gonna X that. I'm gonna hit the plus sign. We're gonna go for a container. I'm gonna set this to be a minimum height of 100 VH. 100 VH means it's the full height of the screen, okay? And that's kind of what I wanna go for here. Uh, I'm gonna go with a width of about 800. I'm not worried about the 1,100 here. I'm gonna now copy this text that we had on our homepage. I'm gonna go to my heading and give it a negative margin of about 100. So that just moves it up a little bit. I'm gonna drag in a button icon, change it to take me home, check the typography, 1.5, click on the button, go to the content tab and just then tell it where to go. Now you could, if you want, like paste in a URL, or if you just get rid of the hashtag there and just type in home, it will bring the page up. So now it's gonna take you to the home page. Uh, before we publish that, let's just go over here, hit the mobile responsive view just to check how that looks. You can see the problem straight away. Let's now click the container. Let's just zero everything out and say, give me 20 on the left and 20 on the right. If you wanna add in a background image, you can do. If you wanna be a little bit more glamorous, you know, I could be cheeky and drop this image in over here, which is now, you know, the full size of the container. Go and set this to be a center center. We'll have no repeat. We'll set it as a cover like that. You know, oops, you, but then again, you then you gotta start modifying other things like your color scheme. Because in this scenario, now it's way too light. It's fighting with the text. Let's go with a background overlay. Let's do a background type. Let's go for a white color. Or let's now just wash everything out like that. I mean, that's okay as well, right? You know, does it look okay on the mobile? Yeah, it looks okay on the mobile, fine. Let's do that instead then but go and hit the publish button. You're then gonna get asked to add a condition. You click that, click the drop down, scroll down until you get to 404 page, hit that, and then hit save and close. So now if anyone comes to your website with your URL, but then the extended bit is like an old post or page, they will land over here. So many websites have not done a 404 page. It, don't get caught in that, make sure you do it, okay? Now another page I wanna cover off, and many people never consider this, is a socials page. Yes, we've got the social sharing icons on the contact, but if you imagine you're allowed to share one URL, maybe on LinkedIn or other platforms, you can only ever share one, even TikTok and stuff like that. What are you gonna share? And most people share a link to their contact form, to their services, to their portfolio, or directly to their website, but they can only ever share one link. Well, here's the trick. Why don't you share a link, which is backslash socials? And that social page has lots of buttons and links that could take someone anywhere you want, but it means that you get to advertise more. You can have all of these buttons on a page and we're gonna create that right now. Let's create a new page. We'll call it socials and edit with Elementor. We'll go to the about page. And you know what? I'm just gonna copy this entire container like that. And then I'm gonna paste it. And of course, in the bottom left with the cog, I'm gonna say hide the title. I'm just gonna get rid of the title and literally get rid of everything we have here. Again, this is one of those lazy ways of working, right? The only reason I've done that is because the container has got all the sizing and anything I did in there. It's really quick and easy way to do things. You could create a template, but do you remember what I said about how 
you could have a website with a hundred templates and then it starts to get really messy with looking after things. So first thing I'm going to do is actually drop in a image and we're going to go for our author image, which is our pretend Sarah. There isn't, I don't know who she is. You know, I'm, maybe her name is Sarah. I don't know. Let's just go and set it to be a full resolution. We'll go with 200 on the width and 200 on the maximum width. We will go to the border radius and I'm just going to type in a thousand so we get a nice circle. If I feel like the image needs brightening up, I'll go to the CSS filter and I might just increase the brightness just a little bit, something like that. And you will notice on the image, it's not a perfect size. Can you notice there's a bit of an oblong going on there? So let me just go back into my content and go back to my image. And I can see here the size is not a perfect square. Now, if you have used this image elsewhere, which I did do on the about page, and we will double check that in a moment, what you want to do is maybe add in an alternate version of the image and then just crop it or um, uh, make sure the sizes are exactly what you want. For simplicity, I'm just going to hit crop over here. And if I remove my face for a moment, we can see that the height of this is more than it needs to be. So I'm going to drop this down. And when you do that, you'll notice the values over here. For simplicity, I'm just going to go with 1003 and 1003 like that. And then I'm going to position it to be how I want. I think that works OK. I am then going to hit the crop, then hit save. And the image is now a perfect square. But let me just go and double check the about page. Is the image sizing that sits behind it because it was the same image. Look, we can see it here, 101 by 101. That is still looking OK. So if you do make any changes, please go back and review anywhere else you've used it. Let's drop in a heading below. I'm just going to centralize that, change the text color. We're going to do the typography now. I'm going to go with a 1.4 and I'm going to make it be a medium like that. And again, my letter spacing is going to be a I'm going to go over to the about page and I'm going to copy over this text, paste it in, just make sure I get rid of any custom width that I had. If there was any right or left margin going on as well, get rid of that because I'm just going to reuse what I did on the about page. Just put it down to be about 500 in width. I'm going to shrink my image down because I think that's too big. I'm going to go with 150 and do a 150 here as well like that. I'm going to centralize the text. Now, this is one of those few instances where centralizing text works. Sometimes left align is the way I like to build things on websites because of the way we read and the way our brains work. But on social sharing pages, having centralized can look aesthetically better. I'm going to go to our 404 page and I'm just going to pick up the button we'd already built. This is where you reuse components that you've already designed and set up. I'm just going to modify the size over here to be 1.2. But I will make sure the link option is definitely open in a new window. For the 404 page, you didn't want it to do that. You want it to go to where it needs to go to. But for the socials page, I don't mind if it opens another page in their browser. Duplicate the button and I get some nice spacing there. If I go to the contact page, I could steal the social sharing icons we had. I'm going to centralize it and I'm now just going to change the style of the colors. And if you search for PayPal, you could even drop in a donate button or book me for an appointment, book me for a consultation. So I'm actually going to pop that one right at the top over here. I'm going to copy the style from this button and I'm going to paste it over here. So now we have the same style. But you didn't know that, right? You do your button and you can paste over. I'm going to change the text of the, I mean, by the way, you'd stick in your PayPal email address into there. So when they click it, it will then take them over and they can pay or donate. You might want to say something like $10 or go and pick your currency. Or you might just say any amount, which kind of makes sense. But you might want to pick your currency of choice. I don't like the PayPal icon there, so I might say get rid of that and you might want to change it to be donate to support me. You can also add a redirect page. Now, in this scenario, I would actually say maybe just bring them back to the socials page or take them over to another page on your website. We're going to click on the bottom cog and I am going to say that we actually change this layout to be an elemental canvas because I want them to just focus on what I'm showing them here. I've also got quite a lot of space at the top there, so it's pushing the icons to be quite low. So I'm going to go to the advanced tab and I'm going to change this to be a 30 instead from the top. That is now looking a lot better. Maybe you don't like it that the buttons have got various widths there. That's quite easy and simple to sort out. If I go over here to my uh, button, I can set the alignment to be the full width and I can do the same over here. 
The problem is though, is that now the buttons might look quite wide and I'm just gonna quickly paste the styles here like that. That looks quite wide. You know, it's more link tree-ish, isn't it? But I don't want them to be that. So how do I bring them in? But I don't want my text to come in too much. Again, really, really simple and easy. I'm just gonna go over here and I'm gonna say from the right and the left, that will go with 75. And then I'm just gonna copy that and paste style, paste style, <laughs> paste style, and paste style. So we now have our buttons. They're all doing serving a different function. And look, this is how it would look. Okay, this is how it's gonna look if someone lands on this page. There's no header there. They can still go to your website because you'll have a link that takes them there. They could go directly to your blogs. Maybe it's to um, book an appointment, book a consultation. You could even have a Calendly link in there. You can do what you want. But the most important thing always is to check how does this look on the mobile? And this is where you just need to modify basically how things look. Let's go to the text editor. Let's get rid of that over there. Do we want to make the image smaller? I would actually say yes. Let's go with 100 over here and 100 there. As far as the button goes, the, the text size is okay, but the width we've got here of 75 and 75 does not work. So let's just zero that out, copy that, and then just paste the style. You have a landing zone for them that you can now share out. And that looks really, really good. And all I'm going to do is update that. It's not a template, it's just a page, and it's not actually gonna sit in your menu. It is something you'll share in your footer, but also when you, if someone ever goes, oh, oh, have you got a website, whatever, you could give them this link instead. Because now you're not just sharing your website, you're sharing so much more. What we're gonna do next is create the footer, which is probably the most boring aspect of any web design, which is why I like to do it after I've kind of built out the bulk of the homepage and some other pages, because I really like to put it off. But we need to do it, because in there, we are gonna be sharing like some of the menu pages, privacy policy pages, cookie policy pages, maybe uh, you've got terms and conditions if you're a shop, the social page, social sharing icons, email address, phone number, stuff like that, copyright as well. Back into templates, remember to click the word all because we already had a footer template. To be honest, okay, there is no great way to make this look brilliant. I'm gonna do my best because I absolutely despise templates. Let's just go and hit edit and we're gonna get a blank line there because we didn't actually create anything. Now, if you wanna get a little bit of inspiration, you could go and hit the folder over here and you're gonna get lots of styles. I like to keep them as minimal as possible just because I really have this grating hatred of them. I mean, let me just show you what this one looks like just so you get an idea. We are gonna do something similar. So let me now get rid of the original container I placed in there just as a placeholder. We're gonna hit the plus sign and I'm gonna go for a three container layout. Well, I'm gonna go with a two container like that. So we've got a parent container and then we have two children in there. I'm gonna to go to my parent container and I am gonna zero everything out so everything is flush up against it. I'm gonna set this to be a boxed width. In fact, no, this is not gonna be a box width. This is gonna be a full width and drop in a image. And then I'm gonna set the size to be 100 pixel. Got a bit of text in there. I'm also just gonna go and grab the social sharing icons as well and drop that in below like that. I'm just gonna double check this text because I think it's got, yes, it has, it's got a 50 over there. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's pretty, pretty simple. I'm gonna drop in our contact details. Let's copy that, go back to the footer. I'm just gonna paste that in there. Let's go to style, let's go to our text, go to typography and change it to be a one. I'm gonna duplicate this text and I'm gonna pick it up and drop it underneath the social sharing icon. This is actually gonna be our copyright text and this is how you do it. I get rid of all the text that we have in here at the moment. I then click dynamic tags and down here, you will see the option for current date time. Go and click it. When you do that, it then says April 26, 2023, blah, 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 which you don't want. You go and click the spanner or the wrench. And what you're now gonna do is change the format. Go down, by the way, you, I don't want the time. Get rid of the time. We're not interested in that. Go to the date format, go and click custom and then just type in Y and we now get the year. How cool was that? So every year, your copyright year will change. Do you know how bad it is when you go to a website and it says copyright 1997? You go, what, really? So, you know, you wanna keep on top of that. Then click the advanced tab. 
And this is now where I'm going to add in some further items. If you go and type in copyright symbol into any one of your search browsers, you'll get the symbol. Just copy that symbol and paste it there. That's how easy it is. You don't have to insert a symbol. So I'm going to put the word copyright like that. And I'm going to say copyright reserved with a space like that. Can you see what it's done there? on the page. It's now gone and added it in for us. And I don't need to have anything that sits afterwards. You can do if you want, but I'm totally fine with that. The only thing I will do though, is make sure that this container has definitely got a 20 on the right and left. That's totally fine now. Okay, let's just go back to our desktop. We do need to add in the privacy policy and the cookies policy, which I'm going to show you. Um, there's loads of places you can get that, Termageddon and other websites. They are really, really good. Go and do a search for them. If you do sign up for our mastery module on sharing our stash, you will get a copy of what we use. So I'm going to go in and very quickly add one in. I'm going to add a new page and I'm going to call this privacy policy. Go over to my contact page and I'm just going to copy over the entire contact section again. The beauty of reusing what you've already built out. We're going to just paste this over here. You can see the footer has already started to appear because it's activated. We're going to go to the settings tab, hide the title. I'm going to change this to say privacy policy. I'm going to get rid of this container in its entirety and in fact, get rid of everything we have there. Go back to my footer. I'm just going to pinch um, this text. When it comes to uh, policies, um, the smaller the text, the better, because otherwise there's a lot to read here. Let's just double check that this has not got any custom width on. Make sure it's full width like that. I'm going to replace the text. Um, you might need to go through and format it. And if you do ever get some policies from anyone else, make sure you go and change in all your details. Like here it says add the company name and stuff like that. Make sure you do all of that. Click add new. Type in cookies policy. Go to the settings, hide the title, hit paste. You know the drill here, change this to say cookies, paste that in, double check it all looks okay on the mobile. Yes, it does hit publish. And if you're paying attention, why don't you go and create an accessibility statement as well? If you are making sure your website is well, you know, you've got your contrast, your alt image titles, you're thinking about your hover buttons, you're thinking about your layout. So I'm gonna create a page called accessibility statement add that in. Now there is one thing I will say you must be careful of. Nowhere on here am I using any extra plugin or something that's going to allow you to resize the text. So if you're not doing something, please make sure you remove that. Don't lie or make up what you have not done. Again, let's just hit publish there. So let's add those new pages to our amazing footer. The first thing I'm going to do is get rid of these icons on the icon list because um, they don't actually need it. It's great on the contact page, but for over here, not so much. I'm going to add in a new item. Again, just get rid of the, uh, the, the, um, the icon we have. I'm going to change the wording here to be privacy policy link. Well, you just have to type the word pre and you're going to see privacy policy come up. You can do that. We go and I'm going to add in the next item, which will be the cookies. I would also recommend that if you have any policies or procedures where you ensure that there is no slave labor being used or you enforce fair trading or anything like that, it can be really, really useful to get that on your website. OK, just to show who you're affiliated with. It, it just helps. I've redone the order there. Now, there is something I do want to make very, very clear here when it comes to accessibility. Throughout the website, where I had um, buttons taking you somewhere, they were clearly identified as buttons. From an accessibility point of view, these are all links. When you click on any one of these, they would. So you can see the links in the bottom left there. You can see the greys changing as I hover over some of them. It's not entirely clear that they are a link that you can click on. So one of the tips about web accessibility is when you go to your style and you go to your text, set the decoration to be underlined like that. That now enforces that it is a hoverable item. Of course, another thing you could do if you don't want to go for the underline, because I know not everyone does like to do that, click on hover for the icon list and go and pick a different color. So you get a bit of a color change. To be honest, though, I don't think that is super, super clear. So in most cases, having an underline would work so much better for you. Now, there is just one more item we need to add here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do well, I'm going to hit add new container. So we now have a third container. I'm going to pick it up and move it to be between items number one and two. I'm going to just shrink the size of the container like that in terms of width. 
something like that. I'm going to go to this container, ensure it is zeroed out like all of the others, but I'm going to say give me some padding, about 50 and 50 like that, and into here I'm going to drop in our menu that we already had before. If you want, just go over here, click edit header, and then just copy the menu like that, and then go back down and hit edit footer. So you can jump around even though we're in the footer template. I'm now going to paste our menu, which is currently set to be horizontal. Let's now set it to be vertical. And I'm also going to say align it to the left hand side. But I am also going to say that we do not have a breakpoint for the mobile. At no point do I want that to become a drop down toggle like what we have for the menu in the header. Now I'm just going to modify the size of this if I go to the style. And about eight pixels in terms of the vertical padding works pretty well. So if we now just view this, okay, that is my footer at the moment. It's not amazing, it's not great, but it kind of does the job. We got some links over here, we got the copyright, we got our menu, which is going to grow as we add in more items. Now, the one thing I haven't really done is added in much padding below and also from the top. And if we go to the home page, can you see that it's very lopsided and it's right up against the last item on the page. So let's go and modify that. Let's go over to our footer and I'm now going to change my mind and instead of having the full width, I'm actually going to go with a boxed width. We'll put it back to box and I'm going to pop it in at a 1100 like that. It might still not look absolutely perfect because of the way pages are and I'm just going to move this over a little bit as well, but it will look a lot better than the lopsided approach. Also, if we go to the container that contains the footer, I'm going to say give me some padding of about 40 from the bottom and give me about 50 from the top and then I'm going to hit update. How does the home page now look? There's very little to make a footer look good. I think I've said that about a million times, right? But yeah, you can't really make them look good. Anyway, let's just go over back to the footer. Let's just go over to the mobile and just check how everything looks because now it's not going to look fantastic. Let's go over to this particular uh, container. Check the layout is fine and then just go and hit update. Do remember though that this the display conditions were already set for this earlier on, but if you needed to change it, click the arrows here, go to display conditions and just check, is this gonna be visible on the entire website or only particular pages? That is our basic website done. We only have really a home page about and contact. There's not much to it at the moment. We are now going to start building out the blog pages and we are going to put some example posts in and we are going to use the elemental loop grid feature because we are building in Flexbox container. Now when it comes to the blog post, we will also use a filter system with the grid builder. Elemental are going to be bringing out their own post filter, but to work with loop grid, we are going to be using grid builder. So I just want to point that out now. So keep sticking around for the next part of this tutorial. We've already mentioned on the home page we're missing a section for blogs, like we're going to show off three, but we don't even have any posts built. So let's go and get those built into WordPress first. When it comes to building your posts, you want to be doing it within WordPress. But when it comes to presenting it, that is done with Elementor. In fact, we'll be using an Elementor template known as a single post template but the raw ingredients for that post should be done over here. And this is what you should do. And, and you gotta get your head around this, okay? Because we tend to say build everything in Elemental, but the post, you know, the title, the images, the, the content, just do it here. So let's click add new and we're gonna create a post. I've called it hiking adventure. Now adding content is really simple. You can either start typing over here or you can use the block over here where well, you can add a block and you might say, I'm gonna add in a paragraph where we already are, or I might want to go in and add in an image instead. You select an image and add it. My tip when you are doing posts is that you try and add in as much variable content as you can. Don't just have text, add in images. If you can add in audio, go for it. If you can add in video, go for it. The more richer you make it, the more Google do like that kind of thing. For simplicity, I'm just gonna drop in some Laura Mipsum text like that. 
And then down here, I'm just going to go and add in another image. So I'm going to hit the plus sign, click image. I'm going to then just pick an image from our media library. I'm honestly not overly fussed by what we pick here. I'm just going to go for this one, okay? Just to kind of demonstrate how easy this is to use. I'm going to shrink the image down like that. And I'm going to click the align feature here or the setting and aligns to be in the center. So you can add images and you can resize them, ensure that you have assigned a category. So I'm going to click add new category and I'm going to give this a name. And once you've hit return, it will automatically tick it. You can untick it if you want and assign elsewhere but I'm going to be adding to these as we go on. You can add tags as well. So maybe you want to be very specific. You might put the highlands or the Rocky Mountains or something like that. The other key bit is a featured image. This is going to be important for when you are showing off your blog posts, you know, like the little advertiser for the archive before you actually read it. So go and pick a relevant image. And it's not a bad idea to put in an excerpt as well. Now you don't have to do this. This isn't completely relevant, but if you are gonna give across like an excerpt or a short description before they start reading the post, this is a good thing to go for. I'm just gonna drop in some more lorem ipsum over there. And believe it or not, that's mainly the bulk of what you need to do. I'm gonna hit the publish button. There we have our post. Now what I'm gonna do for simplicity is I'm gonna duplicate this by using the duplicate page plugin, which I mentioned earlier as well, just because I wanna speed up the process we're doing here. Go over to my posts and now I just duplicate and I duplicate again. I'm now gonna go into them and change their image the title, sorry, the featured image and the title. I'm not going to change the body because I just want to get across how this works. I'm going to show you what I'm doing just so you understand it better. I'm going to call this one Rocky Escapes, which sounds like a movie, but it's not. I'm going to leave the content as it is. Over here, I'm going to add in a new category and I'm going to call this one um, Mountain uh, Climbing, hit return untick adventure because that's the new category and down here we have an image I'm going to click that and pick something else obviously you change your excerpt as well if you wanted to and then just go and hit publish so I've gone and created six posts and you can see that they all have different categories well there are one two three for adventure we have a lifestyle one we have scenery and we have mountain climbing as well. And if you ever want to create them, rather than creating them on the fly, you could also go over here to categories and go and add in your new ones as well. And you can see the how many posts I've got and I've got zero for uncategorized. This will become quite important when we come to do some filtering for the posts. As of right now, these are all ugly looking, but we don't really care too much about that massively just yet. What we're going to do is create a page and we're going to drop onto there a loop grid that is going to basically be the archive page for our posts. And then we're going to stick a copy of that onto our home page, but it will be slightly condensed. Let's go and tackle the blog page first. I'm going to go over to templates. Make sure you've clicked all to make sure you haven't already got one in existence. I'm going to click add new and I'm going to create a template called archive. OK, click that. And then I'm going to call it blog archive. Now the word archive is quite important because I'm going to create a blog archive and then I'm going to create a blog page, which is an exact duplicate because that's the page I'll actually be using. And then we'll use a copy of that on the home page. So let me just go and create the template. Again, Elemental's really good at giving you some examples that you could use, but I'm just going to build one the way we want to build it. We have our header and we have our footer already activated. I'm going to take the container from our privacy policy page and I'm going to dump that in over here. Again, you're just reusing elements that you've already built before because it's got our header and we've done our responsive styling for that. Now we're going to build our post archive. Now, the most common way to build it is to drag in the archive post and arguably that looks okay. You mean it's quite standard, but it looks absolutely fine. Or you might decide to use the posts feature instead or widget. So if you go and type in posts, it's this one over here. If we now drag that in, Again, it looks well, it's practically the same as the archive post. The only benefit of the post widget, though, is that you now have the option to use query. And this is where you can include or exclude certain categories or certain terms. With the archive one, you don't get the query tab and you really do need the query tab if you want to have full on control over how your posts look. 
The only drawback to using the loop grid, uh, sorry, the posts feature widget, or even the archive posts one, is that you are very limited as to what you can do here. You can, you know, change the image sizing and move some of these around, like in terms of their distance from one another, you know, how close they are, but that's about it. What if you want the header to be above the image? You can't do that. What if you want the header to be on the image? Again, you can't do that. But that is why the loop grid is so much more powerful because now you can build out the archive or the blog pages how you want. So what we're going to do is go here and type in loop and we're going to bring over the loop grid. As soon as you do that, you get a slightly funny layout here. Don't worry, we're going to create a template and then that's going to be used to home or house our blogs. I must point out though that to get the loop grid to work, you must ensure that you are using the Flexbox container in your elemental features. Nested elements, you don't really need that, but I would recommend you have that activated. Make sure the loop is also active down here. Back on our page, we are going to create a template. Let's hit save. Now this is this is almost weird in a way in that it now gives you a new look to it and it's now saying, well, what do you want to create? You're going to look at this and go, but I can't see how many posts. I can't decide if I want to have two columns, five columns, 20 rows or whatever. Don't worry about that. You will do all of that when you hit the button save and back and you're now back on your original page with the loop grid. At the moment, you're inside the loop grid. So what we're going to do is create a design. I want my blog post to be very similar to the style we did on the home page where we had the call to action widget and we had the text over the image. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to click here and we are going to insert one container. Okay, one container. I'm going to add into there the call to action widget. And I've also just zeroed out the margin and padding of this container as well, just so that everything sits fully in. I go over to my call to action and I'm going to turn this into a cover so the text is over the image. I can be really cheeky where I reuse some of the content that we already worked on. So I'm going to go back to our home page and I'm going to copy this particular call to action that we've already built, go over to our blog one and I'm going to paste the style like that. And we now have to start, bear in mind though, it doesn't look exactly the same. Okay, so if I just go over here, go and change the width to be a full width like that, we now have it back. Bear in mind though, this is bringing over more than I actually need. I mean, it's got the title, it's got a box there for the excerpt, if we wanted to show the excerpt, which I won't, but we also have a button. I'm actually going to get rid of a lot of stuff we have here. The only reason I did it was so that it brought through the paddings and the sizing, because I'm going to show it on this page. I want it to be quite consistent with the look that we have here at the moment. So let's go over to our image first and rather than picking an image, because if you pick an image, that image will repeat for every blog post. We want the featured image that we set per post. And this is what you do. When you hover over here, you'll see what's known as a dynamic tag or a stack, that little symbol. You click that and then you go and pick featured image. That will now bring over the featured image. Literally, that's what it does. I'm also going to change the image size to be full like that. Let's go over to the content. I don't want a heading and I don't want to have a description either. Don't worry about the fact that it's all of a sudden shrunk because it will revert to its proper size when it's brought over back into the loop grid. What I do want to change though is the button. So I'm going to go over here and get rid of the word click here. Of course, everything now disappears. Again, stay with me on this. I'm going to click the dynamic tag and instead now I'm going to pick the post title. I don't have to pick read more or anything like that. I can just go for post title. That will now bring over the post title. But I am going to click the spanner or the wrench and I'm now going to say after the word, I'm going to have space with a bit of an, uh, a symbol like that. So now we get that. So I'm basically implying, look, click here and now you will go onwards. But I need to tell it where that button needs to go. So where you have the link, again, click the dynamic tag and there you will have post URL. That will now say that when you click that, you're going to go to the actual post. And if I hit save and back, you will now see 
how it looks. And you can see it. We've only got six at the moment. We got the image and we got the title. Now, if you feel this looks a little bit lackluster and you wanted something a little bit better than that, if I was to hit edit templates, so now I go back into the template. And by the way, once you've saved it, when you go back into edit, you will now see more than one post. Don't get worried. You're not in the wrong area. This is normal. Save and back means you go back so you know where you are. You might want to extend what we have here. So how about I go and drop in a text editor widget and I'm going to drop it in below like this. It now sits below my um, uh, call to action, but it is still within that particular container. I'm going to go here and I'm going to give this a bit of sizing. So I'm going to say, give me about 20 for the left. So it's in line with the button. And I'm going to say from the right, give me about a 20 as well like that. I'm going to go to the content and rather than having these words, I'm going to hit the tag again. And I'm now going to say, give me the post excerpt. And now what you should get is, is that Laura Mipsum wording that I put in there. I'm going to go to my style. I'm going to very quickly stylize it. I'm going to go with an REM of one. We'll keep it quite small. And then underneath that, I'm actually going to drop in the post info. I'm going to get rid of the comments, but you know what? Uh, in fact, we'll get rid of the time as well, but I will leave the date. I'm going to click that. I'm going to say there's no need for an icon. Give it 20 pixels from the left. I'm going to go to my container and at the bottom of the container, I'm going to add in about 20 pixel margin or padding at the bottom there just to space things out a little bit. So if I was to now go and hit save and back now, you're going to get a slightly different look in. Obviously, it's the same excerpt because I didn't really change it, but you get the idea. And the last thing we're going to add is in the category. So I'm just going to duplicate what we have here at the moment with the text editor. Go to the top one, go to content and where we have the post excerpt, I'm going to hit the X, hit the dynamic tag, select post terms, hit the spanner or the wrench because nothing appears at the moment. And I'm now going to go for category. If you want to go for tags, you can do. But category makes more sense here. I'm not. Yeah, we'll leave a separator in in case there was any item in there. Now, at the moment, our link is a pinkish color. But if you were to go to the style for that, the pink color or the purpley color is not there. So how do we change that to be our brand color? Hit the hamburger, go to site settings, go to typography. And down here, you will now have your link color. So if I go here and I now pick, say, this purple color instead, once you've saved all that and you're back into your loop grid over here, if I click it, I have the option over how many columns I want to show. I mean, the more you have, the worse it's going to look. But you can even have just one if you want or two. I'm going to go with three. I'm also going to have six items per page. You do have the option to kind of like, depending on the types of images you've got, maybe you've got a mixture of horizontal and vertical. The masonry effect can work for you as well. And if you find that you've got various different heights, like some of your images have got a really big title, sorry, not images, some of your posts have long titles or long excerpts, then the equal height can really work well for you. But like I said, the query tab is really powerful. So you might decide to go with, I'm only going to show certain categories here. So I'm going to say include by term, or you could exclude as well. So you might want to exclude a certain category. And I'm going to type here, adventure. And when I pick it, it will only show me the adventure ones. I'm going to get rid of that because I want to see everything. Also, you can decide how you want to set the dates for this. So you might want to go in ascending order or descending order. I'm going to go for ascending because that's the order I went and created things at the moment. You can also adjust the spacing as well. So if we go to style, I might say there is zero gap between all of the columns like that. And that looks quite nice because it kind of fits the style we've been doing on the home page. Or you could increase it and make it much wider. The same with the rows as well. Now, even if I set this to be zero, because we added in some padding, to the bottom of the container, it's never going to be right up against it. And that was the reason I did it. Or if you want more gap, you can increase it. I think that actually looks really smart with how it's laid out at the moment. So it's zero gap there. Everything looks OK because it sits within the container, the 1100. But what about when we get to the mobile? Let's just go and view that. 
Again, the mobile looks fine. And even though the text is brand new, it looks okay. So all you gotta do now is have a think about and go, well, is this definitely the style you wanna go for? Now I think these items are too close to one another now here. On the desktop, it worked. On the mobile, not so much. Let's just hit edit template. Let's go to our container and for the mobile, 50 like that. So the content feels more closer to what is above. And if we go back to our mobile, well, it's, sorry, our desktop, it is still okay. Let's now hit update there or save and back. I'm sorry, you know, save and back and then you hit your update. I'm now gonna go and set the display conditions for this. The condition is gonna be, this is visible for all archives. Now you do get to decide, is this just for post archive or category archives or anything like that? All archives makes total sense. You could, if you want, create two completely different looks. In fact, you don't even have to do two, you could do 20 different looks. And you might say that this particular archive is only relevant for any posts where they have the word adventure as their category. And then you have a different one for lifestyle. And then you have a different one for mountain climbing. And that's if you wanna do that, because it might be that maybe you've got uh, jewelry, you might have a certain look for rings, bracelets, bags, things like that. We're just gonna go for all archive and hit save and close. Now, before we go and create a separate blog page, now I'll explain again, why am I doing it in two different ways here? On the current archive one, make sure you set this to be current query. The idea is, is that if someone goes and clicks a link like the category, they will end up here on this page which you, with, which basically does not have any filtering enabled for it. This is just like a landing page for your blogs, okay? But the real blog page will have a filter system on there. And I'm gonna show you how to do that with the Grid Builder WP plugin. It is a premium plugin. So if you wanna use any other tool, please be my guest, but the really good ones tend to be premium, okay? So let's just copy this entire container. Okay, just hit update, so that is now closed down. Go over to pages, click add new, and I'm gonna call this one blog, and then edit with Elementor. Again, I just wanna reiterate, okay, on the archive one, make sure that when you get to the query tab, you have it set as current query. Otherwise, if someone clicks lifestyle, and then they end up over here, it won't follow through the word lifestyle, so make sure you do that. Now we're on the actual blog page. We are gonna get rid of the title like this and I'm now gonna paste in what we've already done. I'm gonna, basically I'm gonna leave the title as well as it is. I'll then click on the loop grid and over here now for the query, I'm just gonna leave it as um, uh, posts like that. I don't need to set it to current query, posts is fine. And then I'm gonna hit publish. That's how easy it is, okay? That's all I had to do. What I need to do though is add in my filtering system. So let's go and do that by adding in a premium plugin. There'll be a link in the video description for you to go and get this. I'm not gonna lie to you, okay? It's, it's, it's not cheap, it is $49 per year per site, but it is super powerful and really, really good when you're doing WooCommerce as well. So I'm kind of using something that works for loop grid posts and Loop Grid Products WooCommerce as well. And once you've got it, you do need to install it and activate, and then you need to download the Elemental extension. This is free that you get once you've subscribed or you've got the premium version. This is what you need to add in the widget. There are other ways to do it by using short codes, but this is the much better way to use it. What you do is go to Grid Builder on the left over here and then click on All Facets. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a filter which is just for the categories. I'm gonna say create a facet, call it categories, and just make sure you got the same name for the facet name and the facet title. Hit save changes. Then I'm gonna to go to behavior, and I'm gonna go for a filter, and I'm gonna go for buttons, because I do quite like the, the way the buttons look over here. I'm then gonna scroll down and make sure the taxonomy is definitely using the categories. I don't need to include or exclude anything. We wanna show any that are empty. Um, no, I think not. Do we want to show how many posts there are? Maybe that's not a bad idea. So if there's three for adventure, you can show there's three. If there's only one for lifestyle, that might not look so bad. That's how quick and easy it was, okay? Just like that. 
Let's now go back over to our blog page. I go back to my widget and I'm now gonna type in facet and there it is. And that's what you get with the elemental add-on. Then I'm gonna set it by clicking here and picking categories because that's what we've just created. If I'd called it post cat, you would pick post cat. And now I'm gonna select my loop grid. Now, if you're a little bit unsure, maybe you've got seven loop grids on your page, just go over and click the loop grid go down to where it says WP Grid Builder and it will actually give you the ID field over here. So A948, and if we go back over to here, there it is, so let's just now pick it. And that will now very quickly bring through the items. I don't actually like having the title there, so I'm gonna go over to my typography and I'm gonna set that to be a zero. I could modify the look of it even further if I wanted. I go to my choices and make them be more square. I can make the uh, the boards around them be thicker or thinner. I can even go in and modify the typography for the item. So most likely you would go in and go with railway and then you're gonna set your size. So you might go with, sorry, set that to be REM. So when you hover over it, we'll go for a white color like that. So it's a little bit clearer on what you're picking. By moving the filters higher up with a negative 50 margin and I've added in about 10 from the bottom, just to give me a little bit of spacing. And just to show you how good this is, if I pick scenery, you get scenery, you go for adventure, you get three, mountain climbing, or you pick all. That is really, really slick and wonderful to use. But let's just make sure it looks okay on the mobile. So let's just go and pick it. And, and that looks fine. I mean, bear in mind though, it is gonna wrap because of the length of the wording, unless you were to make them ridiculously small or you had much shorter categories. So if mountain was just one word or climbing, that would have fit over there. But again, it, it just works and looks really, really good. Why don't we go and add this now entire loop grid to our home page as well. So I'm gonna go over to my home page and I'm going to copy it. Well, I'm gonna copy the loop grid. I go back to our home page, scroll down until we get to here, hit the plus sign, and now I'm gonna paste in our loop grid. Make sure the container it sits in is 1100 because we've pasted it in. Make sure it is zeroed all out so everything is up against one another. Then I'm gonna click the grid and I'm now gonna change the layout of this to only actually show three. So on the blog post, you get six or nine or 20. The blog archive is where you're gonna land if you were to go and click on a particular category. But on the actual homepage, this is what you will see. And when I double check in the mobile, it looks absolutely fine because we've already checked that. Let's go over to WordPress, go to our menu in appearances. The blog is now there, so let's add that to our menu. Let's hit save menu, and now let's go and view our site as it is now. So you can see here we've got our menu, our header without the logo, because we've got two different logos. You scroll down and you've got your nice, I think that's a really nice layout we've got there. If I click on any one of these, it's gonna take us to the post. Now bear in mind, the post you view is gonna be really ugly because we have not done the single post template yet. So let me just show you what would happen if you hit hiking adventure. Whoa, I know, really scary, right? And just to prove it works, Rocky escapes, look, it's working fine. The image there is the same because we left the content as it was. But what would happen if you were to now go and hit adventure? It will take you to this page, the blog archive page which has just adventure look let me prove it if i hit scenery you're only going to get one post the scenery post but if we go now all the way back up to the top over here and we go to blog this is the proper blog page and if i now go like that we can start to manipulate or jump around with what we're viewing okay so that's the reason why I had the blog archive page which is where you go if you're now going through a query driven route if you just want your standard blog page, well, here it is with the filter system. And on the home page, well, we just have uh, three posts that I'm showing you at the moment, which I think is pretty nice and easy to look at. I mean, what do you think? Do you like it? Do you like the changes we've done? And yes, we did a bit more than maybe you thought you had to do, because maybe you just set up an archive page and you never thought beyond that. But think about a good filtering system to make it a much nicer, user-friendlier experience for anyone looking at your website. The only thing we haven't done is created a single post template. And we're gonna do that. And we're also gonna create a sidebar as well, just to make it jump and feel more nicer. So let's get onto that right now. So there's gonna be two stages. 
first one is the single post template and then inside of there we're going to create a sidebar. Now you may have noticed if you are using the hello theme that you don't get a sidebar widget. With other themes it does come available but you can build it on the fly inside of Elementor and Hello very very easily and that's what we're going to do. We're going to go over to templates first. Remember hit the all. Now we do currently have seven templates. We have two headers, we have a footer, we have the 404 page, we have the blog archive page but we also have Elementor loop item hashtag 209. That is the loop grid and we've basically reused it in three different locations. So you don't have to create it three different times. Just keep reusing what you've created. Now let's create our single post template. Let's click add new. Go over here and pick the single post which is just it. Don't make the mistake of clicking single page. Just go for single post. Then be really creative with your naming which is single post template. It's simple and I know what it is. Elementor does give you, I have to say, some really nice styling. You know, what they give is pretty nice, but we're just going to create one from scratch as we've been doing forever. I'm going to use our about page as a template for what we're going to do here. So I'm going to go over and copy the entire container, go over to our single post template and hit paste like that. I am going to get rid of the padding that we've got at the top there. I'm going to reduce that down to be about 10. So we still have something, but it's not completely there. I'm then going to click the header, which says about. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm then going to just click out of here. Sometimes you have to click out of it to see the dynamic tags. So I just want to show you that again. If you've got words, then you delete the words. It doesn't always show you the tag. So come out of it. Go back in and you'll see the dynamic tag there. I'm going to click that and I'm now going to go for post title. And then I'm going to get rid of all of the content we have inside of here. To be honest, but I'm not sure why I even brought that over. I've got to be honest because I'm actually not really using much, just the header. But what we do have is a container. This container is set as a row. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to set it to be at the top at the moment like that and we do have a wrap functionality in here as well. I'm going to add in another duplicate container like that. So what we now have is, just to look at the structure, we have container and header and then we have two child containers inside. The parent container, I'm going to set that to be a row like that so you can now see what it's doing. I'm also going to set it to be wrapped like that. So now everything is wrapped, but now it almost looks like it's gone back to a column structure. I'm going to go to the heading and I'm going to say make the width of this be 100%. Go all the way across. Container number two though, I want you to have a full width, but I want you to be a uh, 50% like that. So now it just puts it side by side. I'm going to go over to this first container and I'm now going to increase the size of it. And I'm going to set it to be 75%. I'm then going to set the other container to be 25. So we got 75 and 25 to make 100. Remember, the width of this is set to 1100. Into the very first container, I'm now going to drop in post content. You can drop in a text editor and select that, but just dropping in the post content just make things a little bit easier. So here we now have our content added in. If you had gone and applied any colors or styling to your text in your block editor, it would have brought it over. But I tend to say don't go too crazy on that because we're going to go in over here and we're just going to make sure the typography is set to a 1.2 REM like that. And we're going to make sure the letter spacing is a one as well. I'm also going to create a bit of spacing in this container. So still on container number one. I'm going to go over here and on the right hand side, I'm going to say, give me about 50. So we are using 75% of the estate, but we're going to have a bit of 50 pixel gap over there. I'm going to go in with about 30 from the top as well, just so we're not pushed up right against the header. Now you can add in further items to sit within this container. If you go over to the widget, if you want to add in uh, comments, if you want to add in a table of uh, contents, so every time you have a H3 header on your post, if you used it in your block editor, you could use table of contents. I've 
got a video on that if you want to go and watch that as well. Over into this container, for consistency, I'm going to just do a 30 from the top again, just so that things sit in line with the wording that we have here. I could drop in the post info at the top over here. We'll get rid of the comments one. Um, time, not so bothered about that. If you want to show the author, you can do. If you want to add in the post excerpt, you can as well. I'm just going to add in a little bit of spacing here between the elements. And you could also add in the featured image. So we could, if we want, straight after the header, go straight into the image over there, remembering that the container Container that we just copied over already has the 20 pixel for the left and right and that is looking okay yeah that's looking absolutely fine be a good idea though to save this before we do the sidebar so I'm going to hit publish add condition and I'm going to say that this is going to be visible for all singular now I would probably say go and pick posts as well just to be on the safe side I've seen people just do that and you can get away with that but you're better off defining is this for per category, per tags or anything like that. But just say it's for all posts and just make sure it is set to all as well and hit save and close. Like I said, better safe than sorry. Now, what are we going to be doing over here? Remember, this is a 1000 by 100 uh, width. And we know that this is 25% of that. Let's go back over to our WordPress, go to templates. And we're now going to create a new one. We are using containers, by the way, uh, sidebar, yeah, sidebar. And then we're going to hit create template. I'm going to hit the plus sign and I'm now going to pick a container, which is column. I'm going to set this now to be a certain size. 275 is 25% of 1100. This is where the sizes you pick are, can be your friend. The minute you go for like 1,111, then you now start playing with decimals. But this is the size of our sidebar that we currently have. To help us out, I've actually gone back into my social page. And by the way, I've got these browsers open in my window. I'm gonna copy this image, go over here, and I'm just gonna paste it. I'm duplicating stuff I've already done. I'm gonna pick up this heading, and we're going to pop it in over here as well. Paste, and I'm gonna move it to the top like that. I'm going to change this to be about Sarah like that. Copy this little bit of text over here. Let's just drop that in below like this. I love exploring the great outdoors. Da, 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 da. Let's just check the size of that. That was a 1.1. I'm going to drop it down to a 1. I've also dropped that title down to be a 1.2. What about the contact form? Okay, you know what? Let's go and grab that as well. Let's just modify the form. And I'm actually going to get rid of the name and get rid of the email. I'm going to make sure that this is set to be a full width like that so it goes all the way across. I'm going to set the button to actually be full width as well. I know I said I don't like that style, but I am going to do it here. I'm going to go to the form, go to the form field, click the email, and I'm going to change the placeholder from email to, to subscribe like that. Go down over here now to where we have the button and change the word send to uh, subscribe. I'm going to reduce the font over here just to be in line with everything else that we've got. Now, if you're using a service like MailChimp or MailerLite or ActiveCampaign, you need to go there and get your API key from them or ID. And then what you would do is when you come to Actions After Submit, you would come here and you might go with, say, MailChimp. You'll have an option down here. And what you then want to do is get your API key entered and then go and get this to be connected over to your group or however you've set it up. So every time someone fills that in and hits the subscribe button, it adds it to your mailing list. I'm now going to drop in a loop grid. Now we are going to have a slightly different one. Be careful though. Don't just go over here, uh, say to your homepage, copy this over and then modify because if you modify it, it will modify it for every single page. Now I used it on the blog archive, the blog page and the home. I can get away with that. But if you were going to have a completely different look for them, create a separate loop grid. So over here, I've now got a loop grid. I'm going to go to my home page. I'm going to hit edit template. I'm edit. I'm, I'm going to copy it, but I'm not overwriting it. I'm then going to completely copy what we have here. So I'm just going to copy the container. OK, copy the container. Just hit save and back so everything stays intact. Go over to my sidebar and here I'm now going to hit create template. So we create a brand new template. I will now, uh, add, well, I will now paste over here. 
And what I'm now going to get is the same as what I had before, but I'm going to modify this to make it easier for me. I'm just going to hit save and back. I know this feels like a little bit of back and forth, but you'll understand why. Once you've done that, now you can go in and select your column. So I'm going to change that to be one by three or one by four even. We'll go with one by four. I'm then going to go and edit the template because now it's easier for me to see because before it was stacked into like, well, not stacked, it was aligned into or inlined into three columns. Now I'm going to modify this. So I'm just going to kind of do something like this. Um, uh, yeah, something like that. And then what I will also do is just check that looks okay. That looks fine. We hit save and back. So now we have a different style for our uh, posts over here. Can you see here? We've now got a slightly different, they are still quite big in size and you might want to modify that. In fact, I think we should modify it. Let's go over here to our call to action widget or whatever we're using. Let's edit it. Let's go to our style and let's adjust the height. So let's make it be about, I think we should go with the 150, something like that. That looks okay. Let's hit save and back. And I'm going to go over here and I'm now just going to pick up this header, duplicate it, add in a bit of spacing from the top there. And we'll go with something like about 40 like that. So it's just a little bit spaced out. Change the title to be other posts. We'll also click on the query or the loop grid. Go to query and down here, you want to click on the word exclude and then you want to say avoid duplicate. So what you don't want, if you're reading a post, you want you don't want the same post to appear here as well. We then hit publish. And in essence, we've just created a sidebar. Let's just double check how this looks on the mobile. Really important this, all right? Always do this. Don't just rush past it. What you're seeing is a very extended look of it, all right? But it's going to be sat below the post, okay? So there we have our wording. The wording is fine. You might want to make that a little bit bigger. I mean, I would say, um, you know, about Sarah. No, 1.2. It's okay, actually. It's 1.2. The image there, other posts. you got your wording and we've got for ah. Now, we've got the form, which is down here. Do you remember why? If you're paying attention, you'll remember why if you've been watching these videos. If you go to advanced, we had set an order on the contact form. Get rid of that and it will now sit in the right place with where it needs to be. Have a think about your layout. You know, does it need to be more spaced out? Anything like that? I'm going to go with a 10 there. I do think for the purpose of the mobile, I'm just going to go into this container, zero everything out and then go with a 20 and a 20. It makes sense, doesn't it, for the layout in terms of how it looks. Let's now hit update here. Here's now where we're going to add that to our single post page over here. But what you don't do is copy this over. Okay, you close this page down and go over to templates and you will now see sidebar and you will now have a short code here. Copy that short code. The reason why I'm doing it this way is that if you were to now copy that and paste it into your single post template, we are going to go and grab a short code. And into the field, we are now going to add in that bit of uh, the ID for it that we had before. Then we are going to hit update. And this is what you get now on the right hand side. We now have a sidebar with a subscribe option. If you want to go out and check out this person, by the way, remember it opens it in a new browser window. You can do so. And one final thing we will add over here is the share icon, because this will take you these social sharing icons that we have here. They're going to take you to the page Sarah's page. But I want someone to share this on their own social media profile. So we're going to go and grab the share icon and we'll drop it in. I think just over here is not a bad idea. So it's just, you know, you could go above the excerpt if you want or however you want to do it. You have various options there. You can go for icon and text. You can go just for icon. You can go for text as well, whatever you want to go for. I think icon text works quite well. I'm not going to stylize these out, mainly because you will get to pick and choose how you want it to look um, in terms of, are you going to add in like pins? By the way, look, if I click here, you do have a range of options, Pinterest, Reddit, um, WhatsApp, email. You even have a print option. So if you want to allow people to print it, let me just go and put it as four. Let me change it to be a flat image, something like that as well. 
So maybe you're doing blog posts about recipes or menus and you won't be able to print them. You can do all of that. Just to complete things, I'm gonna drop in a text editor over here. I'm gonna change this to be share. I'm just gonna add in some negative margin like that just so we have it sat above. You could make it in line if you want depending on how many items you have. And always check how do things look on the mobile. You might need to adjust a bit of the margin. I mean over here, make sure you've gone and selected auto for the column so it aligns things a little bit better. You can change the style of it how you want, but I think left align just works pretty well. Go and view our website now. If I was to now hit hiking adventure, this is the page we come to with our sidebar and our information if we were to go back and instead we went over to the blog page and we clicked on surreal surroundings the image the wording you got your sidebar it all looks really really good or at least better than what we had before we've improved the home page with the blog bit we've got a single post template to make things look much nicer we've got a sidebar that has a subscribe option as well and we're doing all of this within the tools that we're using. Now, I accept that I have said you've got to get another premium plugin if you want to have the filtering system with the blogs. But if you're not bothered about that, you don't have to do that, okay? But there are other options out there. Most of them do cost money. There are some free ones, but they don't really work so well, especially if you want on-the-page filtering. I have got tutorials on how you can do things whereby when you click it, it takes you to another page. That's another quick free way to do it but I think the grid builder is really really good I hope you're liking what we're doing if you are please hit the smash button subscribe and let other people know about this tutorial we're doing We know that page speed is rocking on the home page, but what about the other pages? Well, on the social, it's 100 for the mobile, it's 100 for the about page, and it's 100 for the contact. Now, I know a lot of you are going to say, but you have very little content on them. That's besides the point. The main thing is that by doing some of the page speed performance things that I did right at the beginning with the code snippets as well, we're keeping on top of it. And remember, build your page, check the mobile responsiveness, and then go and check your score. And if the score goes down, try and address it. We're now going to expand on the website and imagine that we're going to sell some products as well. So we got our pages, we got our blog post, but now we want to sell some hiking bags, backpacks, rucksacks, things like that. So let's go and install WooCommerce uh, payment gateways and let's go through some of the settings. Now, if you're very familiar with WooCommerce, you might want to skip some of the steps, but go and look at the timestamp. But if you're new to WooCommerce, I think you're going to find everything we do here very, very useful. Go over to plugins, add plugins and do a search for WooCommerce and then we will install that. Now, when it comes to payment gateways, you are going to have to install something like Stripe or PayPal, or there are other options as well. So when we get to that stage, I will revisit the plugins page as well, because when you're using Stripe, you install a different plugin to the one that you would do for PayPal, but I'll cover that off later on. Now, once you've installed it, you will come to a wizard screen, and this is where you just got to fill in a few details. I would leave this box unchecked because sometimes I'm not really bothered or interested in half the things you're going to get from WooCommerce. Now, a lot of the options you get here do not make or break your store, okay? Because everything we're going to do, we're going to build manually. So don't expect that if I go and click this, my WooCommerce store is going to function in a completely different way. You can hit other, you can tick one of these, it's up to you. Now, this screen is a little bit important. We're going to be selling physical products. We could also sell downloads, which we will do when we eventually get onto the LMS or the courses bit. Now, if you're going to let people access your website via a subscription or a membership model, you can use a facility provided by WooCommerce, but it's going to cost you X amount per month. Now, there are other plugins you could use, like Paid Membership Pro for subscriptions or even memberships. It's a free plugin, even though it's called Paid Membership Pro, and the stuff you get for free will be more than enough for you. However, they do have a premium version as well where you get extra features. But if you did want to go down a subscription or a membership route, consider Paid Membership Pro. Again, there's some options here about how many products are you selling or you're selling them elsewhere. Again, this does not make or break 
what you're going to be doing with WooCommerce. It really doesn't. WooCommerce very nicely does give you some extra business features. Now, before you go and hit continue, I would recommend you expand on this and you do uncheck some items. So many people will look at this, enhance speed and security with Jetpack, and they leave it. I recommend you untick it because this can be problematic when you are using Elemental websites and other page builders as well. Sometimes there's a little bit of incompatibility or conflict. Please remove it. You don't need it, seriously. I'm also gonna get rid of MailPoet because maybe I might use my own email mailing subscription list with MailChimp, MailerLite, ActiveCampaign. You can go with MailPoet, but don't just go with what anyone gives you. Research and check what is the best solution for you. I'm gonna get rid of the Google listings and ads, and I'm gonna get rid of TikTok for WooCommerce. Now, we are gonna be doing SEO later on, so a lot of these items I've unticked, you're gonna try and influence your own way. I'm just trying to reduce the amount of extra plugins that we're gonna be adding onto your system. Now WooCommerce does in a kind of a nice way then say, well, do you now wanna use one of our themes? One of the most common ones that people use is Storefront over here. And they go and change and modify things like the cover art or the hero banner and some of the images, obviously. But if you go and pick one of these, you are in effect gonna be undoing a lot of what we've already done with the Hello theme. Now you can reverse engineer and get things to be back where they were, but if you're just building a shop website with no blog and no landing page, these are a great way to start. I, on the other hand, I'm gonna continue using our Hello theme because I like to have control over what we're building and I don't wanna add in any extra bloat where I then spend more time trying to undo things. Don't start adding in your products yet. Go and now revisit your plugins to see what else has been installed because I did leave some of those tick boxes ticked and go through the WooCommerce settings. It's always good to get your settings right before you start adding in extra items. So when we now go over to our plugins, you'll notice we have extra ones. I mean, we've got a duplicate page that I was using for the blog post. Eventually, I'm gonna deactivate and remove that. We also have pinned interest for WooCommerce. This is where you're gonna allow people to find your products. Now, we are gonna be addressing a lot of how people can find your products with SEO. So I, do I really need this plugin? I'm gonna say no, deactivate it, and I will be deleting any that I deactivate later on. We have WooCommerce. We also have WooCommerce payments. We have WooCommerce shipping and tax. The benefits of it is it's an automated tax calculation. Now this does depend on where are you selling in the world. If you're only selling in the UK, you'll know what the tax rate is, 20% VAT, if you are VAT registered. If you're selling in America, you might have different tax rates for different regions maybe. But if you're planning to sell across the world, having an automated solution like this could be really helpful for you. I'm going to assume that we're only selling in the UK. So again, I'm gonna deactivate this plugin. I've intentionally brought them over because what happens is when I look at some websites that people have built and they got WooCommerce, They've gone and left everything ticked and they've got loads of items in there. They're not utilizing or using nearly all of them, but you're adding in bloat into your WordPress website. Also, plugins are usually loaded with JS, JavaScript. This is extra bloat that is gonna slow down your website. Only have here what you know you're gonna be using every day. So at the moment, we have nine plugins. And remember, two of them are for WP Grid Builder, which we're using for the filtering system, but we still only have nine plugins. Again, keep it lean and mean. Let's now go over to the left-hand side to where we have WooCommerce on our dashboard. And it does say number six next door to home, but that's just like the initial page where it's now saying, well, you gotta do this, you gotta add your products, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes, I will not go through every single step on here because you don't need to. This kind of talks you through, but you don't need to go through it systematically how it is. You can just follow what I'm gonna show you. The key bit though is the settings down here. Let's go and click that. And there's a lot of tabs here and we are gonna go through them very quickly. 
The general one, this is where you go and pop in your address, which we did with the wizard already. Where are you going to sell to? So I'm going to say we're only selling to the United Kingdom. You can add in additional countries here like that. Where will you ship to? Again, you may only ship to specific countries. Now, let's say someone was buying a product from Japan. Not only can they not buy it, but it can't even be shipped to them. So someone can't buy it from the UK and then ship to Japan. Are we going to enable taxes? Yes. Now, did you notice I'd removed the WooCommerce shipping and tax plugin, but that's the automated solution. You can still calculate them manually if you're only selling to specific countries with this setting here. So again, enable it, but save yourself the automated plugin. And then at the bottom, we have the currency options. Now mine is already defaulted to pound sterling. You could go in and start to pick an alternate one if it was relevant. We're gonna have the currency on the left. We're gonna have dot, 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 number of decimals too. I am fine with that. And then I'm gonna hit save changes. Now there are many tabs. We are gonna go through them all one by one. Let's now go to the product tab. What will be the name of our shop page? Now, I am gonna show you the pages once we've gone through this. Because when you install WooCommerce, it goes and adds in lots of extra pages. So this is already defaulting to the shop. But if you didn't want it to go there, you could, if you want, scroll down and go, actually, I'm gonna go for maybe the about page. It will be my shop, which makes no sense, but maybe it was. You're going to put your shop products widget over there. Now, you will notice, and you must have called, you must, you must have seen it. We have the word cart twice, checkout twice, and my account twice. Sometimes WooCommerce does that. We will go in and we will remove any duplicates that appeared. So please don't worry about that. This is quite important with add to cart. When you add a product to the cart, do you want to jump straight to the cart page? This is only useful if you're selling one or maybe two products and you know that someone will either buy X or Y. They're not probably not going to buy both. Whereas if you're selling multiple products like many bags or t-shirts or jeans, you want someone to add the jeans. I'll add that t-shirt as well and I'll have those sandals or a bag as well. So add to cart or redirect to cart is useful when you're only selling one or two very specialized products. Otherwise, leave that unticked. Are you going to enable your users or purchasers to leave reviews? This isn't a bad thing to do if you're trying to gain confidence or trust in what you're selling. If you're not bothered about product reviews, because you've got to consider moderation and double checking that people aren't putting fake reviews in, I would um, disable that. Now we'll go to the tax tab. Remember, because we've enabled it. To keep things easier. You could just put the prices of the products on with the tax included, as long as you then calculate it for your own tax purposes. You could do that. Or you could say it is exclusive of tax. So let's say something was £100. And then you'll have the tax, which is an extra £20 for 20%. And it will show that in the cart and the checkout. Settings here are pretty self-explanatory in, are you going to calculate the tax on the shipping address? Well, because they're buying from the UK, that's pretty standard. However, if you are now selling globally, you're going to have a different tax rate for America as opposed to the UK, as opposed to Australia, etc. So this can be really useful for you. For simplicity, I'm going to say that my price is already includes the tax there. Again, just go and hit save changes. Now let's go to shipping. This is kind of the fun one and the one that sometimes scares people a bit because when you go here, you have this different colored screen and it just says add shipping zone and you go, I just want to add shipping. In fact, I want to have free shipping or I'm going to charge $2.99 for shipping. What is a shipping zone? Just click it and follow the steps. UK shipping. And the region for this will be the United Kingdom. It brings it through because we'd set that to where we were selling. If we were selling in multiple areas or multiple regions, you can even do it by a continent as well. So if I was to go and type in Europe, it will bring it up there. So you don't have to go for instance, if you were selling in Africa, you wouldn't have to go through and put every African country in. You could just put Africa in as a continent. Then scroll down and click the add shipping method. You have options here. Are you going to have a flat rate? Are you going to have free shipping? Are you going to have a local pickup? Maybe you work from home, so people have to come to you to, once they've purchased, they have to come to pick up the items. So you have that. We're just going to go for a flat rate. 
I'm going to hit add shipping method and then I'm going to edit it. I'm going to ensure that this is not taxable because our prices will already include the tax. And I'm going to set the cost to be $2.99 like that and save changes. There may be some products I sell whereby there is free shipping. So let's go and hit that. Go and pick free shipping. Hit add shipping method. Go to edit and then I'm going to enable the condition for when it actually kicks in. So sorry, I didn't mean per product. When does this actually kick in? So I'm going to say you must have a minimum order amount of £50. So once you hit £50 and above, the free shipping kick kicks in. $2.99 for anything below that. And we will then hit save changes. So now we have those two rates there. Now let's go over to payments. During the wizard, the WooCommerce payments plugin was already added. Now don't be fooled by that because that is actually Stripe. So if you don't intend to use Stripe and you're going to use PayPal, you might want to get rid of that. That being said, it is a really handy plugin to use if you want people to be able to buy using their debit or credit card. So they haven't got a PayPal account, they haven't got a Stripe account, they can actually just put in their actual card details and buy an item. Most WooCommerce stores that I work with tend to have WooCommerce payments and the PayPal widget, which we will add on in a moment. So let's just scroll down over here. It does say get started, but before we do that, I want to show you that we have WooCommerce payments, so credit card, debit card, etc. We have direct bank transfer. If you enable that, whenever anyone buys anything, they will then have like details for how do they now pay you. So you would put in your business sort code or account number. They might buy an item. It will say the item is now uh, being processed, but it will not allow the item to be completed. The item can't be completed until they have made a payment. You would then have to manually come into here and say, right, I have received the payment. WooCommerce ain't going to know if the payment landed in your bank account. So once you know you got it, you will go here and you will say order complete. Then the item is now ready to be shipped, depending on how you do that or the customer will get a notification as well to say, yep, the order is now completed. And if it was a virtual or a downloadable product, they can now access it. Very few times have I worked with anyone where they like to enable this. Most people like to go through an electronic payment gateway. And the same applies to check payments and cash on delivery. So until you go back in here, and hit completed, it will always be seen to be an order that is still being payment processing. When you enable the WooCommerce payments with the toggle, it will take you over here. First thing we're gonna do is hit finish settle, and then you'll be sent over to this new page, which opens up called WooCommerce payments. Now this is where I feel like there's a little bit of trickery going on here. This is gonna connect you with Stripe. If you already have a Stripe account, make sure you don't go and start sticking in a different email address. Go and use the one you normally use with Stripe. If you're not using Stripe, then go and enter in your email address. You'll then get an email where you then have to click connect. And lo and behold, we're now on another screen where what will happen is you'll enter in your email address or if you've already got on with Stripe, and you can see here now it says powered by Stripe. And you'll either set up a brand new account or log in and then you'll follow the steps it gives you just to make sure it is now connected back to your website. It is actually really pain free to do this, but I do want to offer one little bit of advice. If you're keen to get your shop online as quick as possible, go and set up your Stripe account or go through the steps here via WooCommerce on your WordPress at least seven to eight days before you intend to start selling. Because when you first connect to Stripe, they are more than likely going to say, OK, if you're setting up as a business, we now need some business verification from you. So they might need copies of some documents or photographs that show what your company registry number is. It can take six to seven days for that to fully properly turn around. So don't delay and get on connecting and get this process started. Now, when you are setting up, it is very important that you put the right URL in here. So if you're using a staging site or a subdomain or anything like that, get that done now. You can alter this later on, but save yourself the hassle and get the right URL in from the get go. And although it might have come across as complicated, it is a very simple process. Now, I mentioned about if you set up as a business, it can take six to seven days, maybe even a little longer if you're not careful. 
But when you connect, you have the option to decide if you are an individual or a sole trader. If you do that and you put your bank sort code and account number in, it basically just connects you up. So I'm not advising you to go and set up as an individual if you are a business, but if you want to get it done really quickly, that's what you would do. And now we're back in WordPress. It puts you back in there. You don't have to go there. It takes you back. And now our store has been verified. Let's go back to payments and we can see that it is now ticked. So this is now enabled. One of the nice things about the WooCommerce payment is that since it first came out, it has grown. So if you now want to enable other options like Gyro Pay, you can click it. You do also have the option for Apple Pay and Google Pay. So again, that's another neat feature. So people can come on, they can pay directly with their debit card or credit card. They can use Apple or Google Pay as well. And you can also add on some further details like what will appear um, when they purchase something. So I'm actually going to change this to be our hike. This is where you would pop in your email address and your phone number. So something like info at ourhike.com. But the thing that is blatantly missing here is PayPal. To enable that, you have to install another plugin. So let's just go over here to all payment methods and you see the option for discover other payment providers. Let's go and click that. By the way, you don't have to go down this route. Okay, it's far easier for you just to go into your plugins, add plugin and just go and get it from there. But I want to show you what is available to you. So here's a range of, let me close that. In fact, this is quite a good thing as well. Um, I know in some geographical locations, PayPal is not allowed for you. So if you wanted to go into here and typed in India, it will now show you what is available. You got Square, you got PayPal, Peach Pay, Amazon Pay, etc. Now, if you click this, what will happen is it will now download the plugin to your downloads folder, and then you have to go and import it. It's far easier for you to just go back over to your WordPress website, go to plugins, add new, type in WooCommerce PayPal, here it is. Even though it says two stars, don't be put off by that, okay? Because some of that is just down to how people have installed it. I have had zero issues with this plugin. Hit install and activate. And when you go back over to WooCommerce settings payments, you'll see an option over here, which is connect your account. If you don't see that, go over to all payment methods and you will see it here as well, where it says PayPal. And you have the toggle there and finish setup. So if I just go and activate that, it brings you to this page, which is where you would have ended up anyway if you clicked connect your account. So I'm just showing you multiple ways of how to get here. Now, we already are accepting credit and debit cards via the Stripe account. So I would not tick this. Just go for enable PayPal payments. We're going to click activate PayPal, enter in your PayPal account and log in. Decide if this is going to be for personal use or a business. Now, I must stress again, if you are a business, don't try and cheat or anything and go, well, I'm just going to go with personal. Stay safe. So I'm now going to connect this website to my personal PayPal account. And then go back to WooCommerce. Even though that is all done, you need to go back into WooCommerce settings payments, click all payment methods and make sure it is definitely enabled. Just because you've gone through the, the motions, make sure it's enabled. And there you go. We've done the Stripe and the PayPal. It might feel long winded, but it's not that difficult. And you can easily do this within five to 10 minutes. Now, if we go to the accounts and privacy tab of WooCommerce settings, this is where you get to decide on, can people buy an item without having to create an account? Not recommended. It's always a good idea to make them do that. Number one for returning, but number two, if they ever say, well, what did I pay for and how much did I pay? They can log in and they'll see their account details. So I'm going to get rid of the guest checkout and I'm going to say customers can create an account during checkout or on the My Account page as well. Then go to the Emails tab and you can now manage, well, where are the emails going? Are they going to go to you or are they going to go to the customer? So for a new order, you probably want it to come to you, but where the customer has made an order, they would probably need to have details come back to them. To be honest, you don't really need to change any of this, but you might want to change the email address or you might want to change what is the standard color. So when they get an email, what is it going to be? The standard color for WooCommerce is this purple plummy color, which doesn't look great if you're trying to do a bit of branding on your website so that when you get an email at the top, it will have this color. If you want to be really specific though about the content inside of the email, Go and hit manage and now you can start to modify what is actually said within there. In the advanced tab, 
is where you now get to define, well, what are the pages uh, for the cart and the checkout? So we can see here that if I go to cart, I if I was to type in cart, you'll notice there are two items over here. Now I am gonna make a note of the uh, pages there because sometimes, like I said, WooCommerce goes and installs it in twice. You do also have to add in a terms and conditions. I've seen websites where they don't have that. You're setting yourself up for a fail. So go and create a terms and condition page, very similar to what we did before with the privacy policy or the cookies policy. And once you've done that, go and enable it. I've just created one on the fly. It's actually just a copy of the cookie page. You can see the word cookies there, but this is the terms and conditions page. If I now click this arrow and I type in terms or even term, you'll now see that new page there. So I'm just gonna click that and that is now enabled. You don't need to really modify anything else that you see on this page. I would leave this as it is and just hit save changes. Now, if you are gonna start connecting to like fulfillment centers uh, whereby someone buys the product and then the details go off to someone else in the world, a company, who are going to handle the distribution, packaging, delivery, anything like that. You may need to go through one of these over here and they will usually advise of where you need to put it or there'll be some instructions where you need to put in an API key. You would go over here and you would enter in those details, but it all depends on the solution you're using. So we're not going to cover that here because it is very dependable on third parties and they will know where to put it, so they'll instruct you on what to do. In the multi-currency tab is where you can enable other currencies. Now we've said you can only buy or sell items to anyone based in the United Kingdom. So I've gone and put pound sterling, but what if you want to allow them to also use euros as well, or even dollars, because they may be in the country, but they are currently using dollars from their bank account. So I'm going to enable the euro and the United States dollar as well. And I'm going to hit save changes. Now, if you go back to WooCommerce, it is still going to say that you might have three or four items you still need to do. This annoys me because we're going to do everything in a very bespoke way. So I sometimes just like to click one of the items. It goes and adds in a plugin and then I'm going to remove it just to get rid of that really annoying number. Add tax rates. Let's just get rid of that as well. And the final one is add product. This will disappear eventually. It's gone and added the Pinterest one again because I picked it to kind of get rid of that number and I'm now going to deactivate and remove it. I'm one of those people where I only like to have notifications of anything that I really need to be notified about. That was the WooCommerce setup or the settings and there's quite a lot there but if you go through it methodically you will be absolutely fine. And now let's go and add in some products. Now the things you really should be considering are the title of your products, the description of your products, is there gonna be any variation? So it might be you have a rucksack, but you have three different colors or sizes or a mixture of the same bag. So think about that. Think about your costings. Do you know how much of each item you have? So do you have 10 of this bag and five of that bag? Are you gonna manage that as well in terms of the stock inventory? Think about the prices. So is the red bag more expensive than the blue bag? But most of all, Think about your images. Let's go over to the media library where I brought forward the or brought through the images earlier. Now, once you've installed WooCommerce, it will give you some dummy images over here. Don't worry, we're going to get rid of them later on. These are just for like example product placeholders. When you scroll down, you're going to see I've already added in some bags. Each one of these is a 500 by 500 pixel image. And you will notice that the bags are kind of all relatively in the same position. I've used Canva and I have centralized them in a certain area, but the entire size of this, if I just show you here, if I just hit the crop button, can you see there's almost good spacing all the way around that? Let's just hit cancel. I also have some products where I have variation. We've got a purple bag, we've got an orange bag and a red bag. They are the exact same bag. I just have different colors applied to them. Again, I did that via Canva using a one of their um, edit color features. Really cool. And I bet that's what lots of people probably do on shopping websites anyway. Consistency in your images is really, really important because if you have some images and you can see the curtain behind one or a sofa or someone's leg, it does not look professional. And if some of your images were different sizes, let's say this was half the size of this image, even though in reality, this is probably double the size of this bag, by making them look consistent when you're viewing them on a page, 
it looks much cleaner. Whereas if you had a bag that was like that and another bag that was like that, but you haven't standardized the sizes, it's, start, it's going to start to look like you're in a garden where you have different size plants. You want everything to almost appear equal. Let's go and add in our first product. We're going to go to products and we are going to click add new. Once you start adding in here, you can do things on the fly. You can create product categories as you go along. My big recommendation, like I said earlier, is nail down what are your products, what are the attributes and things like that. Create them first so that when you come to build, you now pick from a select list. Whereas if you do it on the fly, and sometimes you have to do it on the fly, you might end up making errors or issues and human error does creep in at this point. Let's go over to categories. I'm gonna type in rucksack. I'm gonna type in backpack. Now you will notice we already have clothing, hoodies and uncategorized. I'm gonna get rid of the hoodies one because we don't need it. And I'm also gonna get rid of the clothing as well. Now, if you decide you're gonna break the backpack down even further, I could go over here and say, uh, we'll add in another name and I'll go and put shoulder for like a shoulder backpack, if that even makes sense. And I'm gonna say the parent category is the backpack like that. I could add in an image as well for any of the categories, which I'm not really bothered about. And I'm gonna click add new category and it's underneath the backpack. I'm actually gonna get rid of that just for simplicity where we're just gonna have three categories. Next, we're gonna go and do the attributes. Now we're only gonna do this for the bag where we had three different colors. If we were also selling clothes with extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, and things like that, we could add those attributes as well. We could also add attributes for the type. So it might be that the category is going to be a bracelet, but it might be different types of bracelets or different types of hats, but you don't want it to be a subcategory. The attributes are really, really powerful because if you're going to have a different price, for the different attribute, you really wanna be utilizing this, but we're gonna use it very simply for the color. Now WooCommerce has already installed it for us and it's using the American spelling at the moment. I'm actually gonna delete this and I'm gonna start from a new. I'm gonna type in color, then hit return and that will now be added. Then I'm gonna hit configure terms. So the first term we're gonna go for is red. Let's add that. Let's go and add in purple as well and we'll add in orange. Now we're ready to start building our products. So inside of WordPress, go over to products and then click add new. Let's go here and type in rugged backpack. Here's where you would go and add in your relevant details. You can be quite creative as well at this point in terms of alignment, bold italics. You could even drop in further images as well if you really feel you need to, but I'll leave that up to you. On the right hand side, I'm gonna select the product image. So we will click this and I will pick this backpack and set that as the image. Now, if you have further images you wanna show maybe from different angles, this is where you would select the product gallery. So if we had further images to highlight maybe how this could be used or how people are utilizing them, and I'm just for simplicity gonna go and pick uh, some of these images here like that and that. And I think we'll go with this one as well. I, just so that you can see it when we go to demonstrate it on our actual product page, let's just add those to the gallery. So I've gone and added in three images there. You will also have the category as well. So we're gonna set this to be a backpack. Now this is where you do have the option to create a new category and doing it on the fly is okay, but I think it's better to do it here so you're in control and you know what you're doing. And of course you have the option down here, which is just hidden by my face, which is just here. You can see at the bottom now you have product tags, where if you want to add in any further information about what kind of backpack it is, maybe brand, anything like that, that you know people are going to be searching for within Google. But we will come back to revisit this when we get to the SEO stage. Now, once you've sorted out your description, you want to try and take one little bit about that, a smaller chunk of that, and drop that into the product short description. Don't copy the entirety of what you had before. You can do. You can get away with it. 
but I would always say the short description is called short for a reason. Now let's get on to the other details. So is this a simple product? Is it a grouped product? Now grouped product means that let's say I'd created five backpacks and they're all different products. And then I say, hey, for a special price, you can have all five of them for a special reduced discount. The grouped product is what you would pick. And then once you've picked it, you would then go and add in your individual items for the four or five that you're now going to group together. It doesn't have to be four or five. It can be any number that you want, which is more than one. You also have the idea to do a variable products as well. Sorry, a variable product. Let's just go with simple product. And I'm going to say that the price of this is $9.99. In fact, no, the price of this is $14.99, but we are going to have a sale price. Now, you don't have to put a sale price in. If there is no sale, just leave it blank. But I'm going to pop it down to $9.99. But I'm also going to schedule this. So I'm going to say that price is activated from today until the end of May. So from now until the end of May, this is now activated for you to go in and buy at $9.99 after that date. So on the 1st of June, it will then revert back to $14.99 automatically. Let's then go to the inventory. Normally with a WooCommerce, you should have a number. You should have some form of ID. I don't know, it might be numbers or something. If you have not done that, think long and hard about how you're going to manage your stock or if you are dealing with other people who are delivering items. So make sure you have got a SKU number or an ID in there. Is the item in stock or out of stock? Can people, is it out of stock, but you can still actually do a back order? So if you do out of stock, it's out of stock. No one can buy it. But if you do on back order, it's out of stock, but people can still buy it and they will know that it's out of stock, but it doesn't stop them getting it so that when it's in stock, you will then distribute it to them. And what if you're only allowed to have one of these items? Now, this becomes really relevant when you're doing a virtual or a downloadable product, because why would you want someone to buy the same course more than once, especially if the course only gives you certain items? So for this particular item, we are going to track the stock quantity. And I'm going to say that we have 50 of these in stock. Do we allow back orders? I'm going to say, no, we don't. We only have 50 and that is it. And I want to be notified via email when we got down to 10. So once 40 are sold, I should be keeping track of this anyway. I want to get an email that says to me, hey, you've only got 10 of these. Do I need to go and order more stock in? Now, if you're selling a course, and we will come on to this later on in this tutorial, it's going to be a virtual or maybe a downloadable product. If you go for virtual and someone buys something and the payment has been completed, they can access whatever it is that they were going to access. It might be uh, courses, it might be videos, it might be anything on there that they can literally click and open and have a look at. If, however, you go for the downloadable, an extra bunch of features open up whereby now you're going to say, OK, once you've purchased, you will now have access to a particular file. If I click choose file, let's just say I was going to let them have access to this. Let's pretend this was a PDF, a bunch of courses. It could be an ebook, could be music, could be videos, anything that's locked behind a paywall. When I hit this now, once they've purchased, and by the way, you might want to put a name here, you know, and you put name, PDF, whatever. Once they've purchased, this will become available for them in their My Account location. And then when they go to My Account, it will be there. They can click it, open it, read it, download it, do what they want with it. This reiterates why you need to think long and hard about what you're doing. Don't just jump in and go, we're going to create a WooCommerce website. Think about your products, what you're selling, how you're going to sell them, the variations and any other details. Let's go down to shipping now. If your shipping is dependent on the weight of an item, you might want to go in here and start putting in the weight uh, per kilogram, all the dimensions as well. With these bags, we're not worrying about that, so I can leave that blank. Now, when we come to build our store, we do have extra widgets where we can do what's known as an upsell or a cross sell. Thereby, when someone buys a particular bag, it might say, well, hey, you're buying this bag, you might also want to buy something else as well, which goes with this bag. It might be an extra little tag. You know, imagine clothing. You're buying like a blazer, 
well, don't you want to buy the trousers that go with that? And what about this shirt? And what about this tie? It's a really great matching set. So this is what you would do here. So I would go in and I would do a search for a product. Now, you're not going to really find anything in here because we've only really created, we're creating one product at the moment. But you would go and add in all of those items. Now, if we go down to attributes, this is where we can now pick the color and click add. And then we can define if this is a red bag, an orange bag or a purple. Now, in this example, I'm not going to use that until we get to the variable product. So I'm going to leave this just as it is. I'm just going to hit remove as well because I don't want to confuse things at this point. In the advanced tab, once someone has purchased it, do you want to leave them another note? Like maybe you want to say um, the item will be with you as soon as possible. Um, we will we will contact you to get further details. Now, in its simplicity, that is the product done. So I'm just going to hit publish or update. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this many, many times and I'm just going to substitute the titles and the images. I'm going to add in a ninth bag, but this is the one where we are now going to use the attribute color. So let's just go and duplicate one of the ones we have here. Again, just to make things a little bit quick and easy with how we're building. I've changed the name and I'm going to pick the red one first. I'm going to clear out all the images that we have here at the moment for the product product gallery. I'm also going to remove the price as well. Now over here we have simple product. I'm going to go down and I'm going to pick variable product. So I'm not going to create a red product, an orange and a purple and then group them together. I'm actually just going to create one product and you'll have a field on here where you pick your color and the different colors might have different prices. Let's go and click variable product. Now, because we duplicated and we'd already gone and set items in here, I am going to remove this here and I'm going to remove the skew as well because we're going to set this individually per product. Now, the moment you go for variable, an option would have appeared here. Let me show you the simple. OK, we don't have variations. When you go and click variable, now we see it. Let's go and click create new attribute. Now, we already have the one in here for color. But what if we decided, oh, we need to create an attribute for does it have zips or no zips with button, without button, number one or number two, something like that. You could do it on the fly, but we're just going to pick what we've already created. And this is why I recommend you do it to maintain control over what you're doing and to keep things consistent, especially if you've got someone else who's going to be creating the products for you. They might type in the wrong word or the wrong different types of variation. And I'm then going to add in my terms. So we know that we've got all of these added. Remember, we added them. That's why they're visible here. If you do it on the fly, you would have then typed in a uh, color and then you would have typed in your orange, your purple and your red. So I'm going to go with orange and then I'm going to hit save attributes. Then I'm going to go over to variations. Now, this is where it's going to say, well, what do you want to add? Well, we've just gone and created them. So the option here is create the variations from the attributes. Remember, over here, if I click this, this is what they are. If I go and type in blue, I could do. We don't have a blue bag. But if you wanted to add one in on the fly, you could do. But let's just go over to variations and we are going to say click uh, create based on that. It will give you a warning and go, do you really want to do that? Let's say you went and had uh, three attributes and every single one of those attributes had uh, three variations inside. You're now going to get multiple options going on here. So have a think about how much variation you're going to be adding. I'll hit OK. And what it will now do is say three variations have been added because of the three colors. And you can see them here. Let's go and click the orange one. This is where you would define your SKU. Are you going to be managing stock? Is it a downloadable or a virtual item? No, it's not. First thing we're going to do, though, is set our color. So let's click that and then pick the orange bag. And then we're going to set the price. So I'm just going to go with $19.99. And I'm going to say that we have 45 of these. And then you can go and set any other details required. Let's now go to the purple one. Let's go and set the image. We'll put manage stock. I'm going to change this to be 35 bags. And the price for this will actually be $19.49. So for some bizarre reason, it's a little bit higher. And then the last one, which is red. And again, you can set a sale price. You can schedule it as well if wanted. Let's now hit sell save changes. And just to finish things off, I'm going to go to the product gallery and I'm now going to add in those other two images, which were the purple and the orange as well, and just add those to the gallery so they are now visible. 
go and publish that. We now have our nine products. You can see the categories for them. Oh, by the way, I've got this as casual. Let me just go to quick edit because it is not casual. So we now have our nine products. You can see the range of categories. You can see the images. You can see the prices. Some have a sale, some don't. But if you now go to this one here with the Roma, well, we have three variations. The, the, the lowest or cheapest is $19.49 and the highest is $23.99. So we've got a bit of a range going on there. So this is great. We've got our products. But until we stylize this inside Elementor, it looks really ugly. Let me show you. We're going to go and view our store. And this is how it looks. We have a sale logo over here for some of the items. We can sort them by popularity, even though none have been sold yet, high or low or low to high prices. We have the items. It doesn't look all that enticing. You might say, hey, I'd love to buy one of those. You can see the ranges of prices as well, like here, there's a range. You can see here where we have the sale price uh, with what the original price is and what the sale is. But here's where things get really, really ugly now, okay? Let's just go into the corporate one. Let's click it, and this is what you're gonna see. We very nicely have the PayPal pay later option added via the PayPal gateway. You can hit add to cart where then you will start to be able to pay via Stripe and all of that. We have the bag, we have images over here if you want, you know, the gallery images that we added. This is where you do need to be careful though. So I intentionally added in some landscape images because I want to show you that if you're not careful with how big they are, you get this variation and it does not look good like that. I don't, I don't like it when things start to move like that. Keep it consistent. We have our short description, title, add to cart. The button is not branded. You've got your bigger description. We've got some related products down here as well. And obviously we have our footer. Let me now just show you the one where we had a range, which is this here. It doesn't matter where you click, whether you click select options or up here, it's gonna take you to the page. You have your images below, but we now have this option called choose an option for your color. Let's go with orange. We have the orange, 19.99, 45 in stock. We go for red, it's gonna say 10 in stock, 23.99, and we go with purple, 35 in stock. You get the idea. But the way this looks does not fit the brand or the look that we've done with our homepage, our blog pages, or anything like that. And this is where Elementor is going to massively help you out. The logical step now is to go and build out our templates. Now, rather than just duplicating the blog ones, I want to build them from scratch just in case you skip the blog one. So I don't want to assume you've watched every single second of this video, which I would love it if you did. So what we're going to do is go over to WordPress Elementor or the template, and we're going to build a shop template basically for where all the products are so you can view and buy whatever you want. Then we're going to go and do a single product template as well. So when you actually go into the product, we want to make sure it looks really nice and clean. Let's go to templates, hit save templates. And as I've said a million times already now, go and hit all so you can see exactly what you've got built here. This is the one that's being used for the blog or the layout, but this is the one that's being used for the blog sidebar. Now you can rename them. However, I have found that it's better for you not to do that because sometimes I have found they actually break a little bit. So you might want to keep a record somewhere of exactly what those IDs are. But if you're being very methodical, I know I've only built two of them for the blog, so I know what they are. We're going to go to the top. We're going to click add new to add a new template. And we're going to go down here and pick products archive. I'm going to call it shop archive and hit create template. Now, I just want to show you what we were using originally for our loop grid for our post. So this is what the layout was like. I want to go for something similar to this for the shop as well. But let me show you what you could do if you weren't going to use loop grid. You have a feed, well, a widget over here called archive products. I'm just going to drag that in. This is kind of like the standard that you will get out the bag with WooCommerce whenever you're using Elementor, even many page builders. It's very limited as in what you can do here. You can hide items, you can change the styling, but if you wanted the text to be over the image, 
you're going to have to go and use an extra plugin or if you wanted the price to be above the image or if you wanted the image to be below the select options or add to cart, it is very limited as to what you can do. And if you type products, you also then have this version. So the archive products and the products are very similar. This is very much like what we did with the blogs as well. You're going to look at it and go, well, that's exactly the same. What's the difference? Well, you're missing an item over here where you can do sorting, but that's really easy to enable. What you would do is enable pagination and then say allow order and it reappears. But you also have the query option. This is missing in the archive products. A lot of people make this mistake. They start building a website or the page or the template and they just drag in archive products because that's the one you see here. You don't want to be doing that. You want to be dragging in the products if you're not going to use in the loop grid because now you have the query option to include or exclude categories. So let's say we only wanted to show off casual in here. I would say include. I would then pick term and then in the term bit here, I would type casual. And now this will only ever show the casual. So maybe you want to have different shops laid out on different pages. Maybe you might have a page dedicated to casual items, for instance. So this could work for you. But as I've already said, I don't want to be limited with creativity in how we're going to create it. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to type in loop and we are going to drop this in. Please remember if you are using Flexbox containers, well, sorry, to use loop grid, you got to make sure that Flexbox containers and loop is enabled and activated in your elemental features. Go to WordPress, elemental settings, features, make sure they are activated. First thing we're going to do is change the template type to be products like this. And then we're just going to click create template. You can't really do much else here. Okay. You can start messing around. I would say don't do any of that. At the moment, it's like a grid of three columns. Again, don't worry about that. Just create your template and then you'll have control over how many items are you going to show. Let's hit create template. It will ask you to save. Just do that. And now we can start building. Now you are going to get almost like literally an empty nothing. Don't worry about that. Have a think though at this point about your structure. So are you going to have like your product image here and then have your um, buy now add to cart to the right of it? So maybe you want to go with a container set as a row, maybe go with a container with two child containers or columns if you want to call them that. Or are you going to have everything stacked? So if we look at our blog post, I actually used a call to action widget here. Because the call to action allows me to put the wording over it. There are other ways to do it, but this is one of the simplest and easiest and quickest ways to do it, especially if you ever decide to add in a little bit of like hover interaction. So when you hover over it, the image or the wording changes. I have not done that here, but you could do that. So let's go and do that straight away. Let's go and drop in the call to action widget. By the way, you can just drop it in and it will, if we go to the navigator, you'll see that it has now created a container. You don't have to go, oh, I've got to drop a container in first. Now I'll add in the call to action. There's good ways and bad ways to do things. The simplest way is just drop it in and it will put the container in for you as well. Now, if we click on the call to action, the wording is below. If I change this to be a cover, the word will now go over it. For simplicity, I'm just going to get rid of the title. I'm going to get rid of the description and I'm going to get rid of the click here button as well. Now, the moment I do that, everything completely disappears. I'm going to make the title of my product actually be a button. So when you click it, it will take you through to the single uh, product template page or where you can see more details. So rather than ent entering anything in the title or the description, I'm going to go down to button text and I'm going to click the dynamic tags. And then I'm going to scroll down until I get to product title. Remember, don't pick post title. You need the product title. So now we pick it and the wording has come out and we have this style. And it is very similar to what we got here, except we had a bit of a white hover effect. We'll address that in a moment. The positioning though is not great. So let's just go back over to our style tab for the call to action. Let's put it on the left and put it at the bottom. But then I'm going to go in and add in 20 padding from the bottom and 20 from the left. So you can be very specific over your positioning. Now let's go over to the content tab and go over to image over here. We were on the content here, but now we're going to go to the image. Rather than adding in an image like an ice cream van, which will be visible for every product, you want to click the dynamic tags 
And you could pick featured image, but it's best to scroll down and go for product image. Click that and we now have our product appear. Now let's do a little bit of clean up. I'm gonna go over to the style, go to the button, go to uh, typography. It's already already gonna be on railway. Click the pixel uh, size and change that to be REM and pick one. I'm gonna leave it as a 500 medium and I'm gonna set my letter spacing to be a one as well. I'm then gonna close that. I'm not gonna change the colors here because it's bringing through all the colors that we've already got in our global library, but I will go to the hover effect and I'm gonna say make the text color be the accent color and make the background color be white. And there we go, that's now looking fine. However, if we go back to my blog template, there was a bit of an arrow going on there and we didn't have any animation. At the moment, we've got zoom in effects and the wording moves as well. So let's just completely remove that. Let's go to the hover animation, set it to be none. And for the background, I'm gonna set that to be none as well. I'm gonna go back to my content, go over here, to where we have the button text with product title. If you click the spanner or the wrench, you can actually make this be very specific to a particular product. So you might say, um, I don't care what product you pick, the minute you hit that button, it will only ever go into one place or one direction. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna make sure it's dynamic per product. But what you do wanna do is go to the advanced tab, and where it says after, I'm gonna put space and I'm gonna then add in a chevron. Now, what about directing this? Cause we haven't completely done that yet. There are two ways to do this. You could, if you want, go down to here where we have link and I could go over to dynamic tags and then click post URL. Now, the other way you could also direct them to the product is I've done it on the button. But I could say, actually apply it to the whole box. Let's just update that. And now when we go here, it doesn't matter where I click, and that is a much better way to do it. One last thing before we add any details is I've gone back to my hover effects because I've noticed we're getting this overlay here. So I've gone on to hover and I'm gonna click here and I'm just gonna make that be completely transparent because sometimes I feel like some effects are really not needed and they take away or they pull you out of what you're trying to show. Now let's add some further items like the text editor. Maybe we want to show off the category. I'm going to give it some margin of 20 on the right and 20 on the left. Go to dynamic tags, scroll down until I get to product terms. I'll then click that, but I'm not liking the word categories being there before the word backpack. So I'm going to click the spanner wrench it's already selected product categories, which is what I want. Uh, if there were, if it was sat within more than one category, it will be separated by a comma. Again, I'm okay with that. Or you might want to go with a pipe effect like that. It's entirely up to you what you go for there. Let me just pop that comma back in. Uh, we are not directing to just a single product, so leave that set as all. And in the advanced tab, I'm now gonna get rid of the before categories like that because I feel like it's okay just telling us it's backpack. And again, this is very similar to what we did with the blog page where we will have an archive uh, page for this and then we'll have a separate shop page where we've got some more fancier filters on there as well. What's really cool is that when you hover over it, if you look at the, uh, in the bottom left there, you can see the URL, it's already pointing to product category backpack. And that's one of the things I really like. You don't have to go, you don't have to start setting in a separate URL. Okay, great. Now what I'm gonna do is now, well, if we go back over to here, we did have an excerpt. Now I'm not gonna pull forward the short description or anything like that for the product because the short descriptions could be very varied or messy and you might have applied different styling. And if you are using custom fields, which we're not covering in this tutorial, you could bring some of that over as well. So let's say you've generated a custom field or something that tells us a bit more about the branding of the bag, you know, different companies, etc., trademarks, copyrights, you could bring that over as well. Let's just go and bring over the pricing like this. 20 on the left, we'll do our text, do our typography. Again, we're on railway. Are we gonna go for a REM of one? And that actually does look okay. I'm gonna drop it down to be a 500 in width. And for the letter spacing, again, I'm just gonna drop in a one there, just so it everything's kind of like pretty standardized. Now, if you find that your items are too spaced out, because I think it, it, there's, there's a bit of a gap going on there, I could go to my container, scroll down here where I have 
have gap between elements and I could set that to be zero. But now then you might find that actually now the category is too close. So one of the other ways is just leave, remove that out completely. Go to your pricing field and just give it a negative top margin just to bring things up a bit. And I'm going to go for about 15 there. 20 is a bit too close. I think that's just a little bit better. But what if you want to add a button where they can now add to cart? Because this is all good and well that you click here and it takes you over to the item. But what if you know the item, you found it, oh, I want to add it to the cart straight away. Let's go and drop in the add to cart. At the moment, we have a variable product. So it gives us the wording for select options. If, however, we had a different item, it would then say something completely different. In fact, let me just show you. If I just hit update for a moment and then go over to my shop archive page, you can now see how this is coming. Uh, we haven't aligned this, so ignore the fact it's not in line. But we've got select options and then you got number one, add to cart. Let's just zero it all out. Give me 20 from the left and then we'll go with about uh, five, minus 15 for the top. Just made a duplicate of the field over here and where I do the tags or the stack, Rather than picking uh, the terms, product terms, I've gone and picked the product short description. So this gives you an idea of what it would look like. So remember, because you're in container, I can put these items wherever I want. I can rearrange them. I can do what I want, okay? The final thing I'm gonna do is just set the style of this button. We go to style, we go to button. Just check your typography, add in a hover effect to the button, and then just check that you're happy with it. If we turn back to my homepage, you'll notice that all of my items are stacked, you know, kind of like against one another. And I want to maintain that look. The slight problem though is the shop is very spaced out. So I'm going to go in and add in some border here. So I'm going to go over to my main container. I'm going to go to style and I'm going to go and give it a border. I'm going to give it a solid border. I'm only going to keep it one. I'm going to keep it really, really, you know, faint. It's not going to be like blatantly in your eye, but you will notice it. I'll go with a bit of a faint color so it's not pure on black and you can see it there and we now look at our page, how it currently looks. Now, you are gonna see gaps here. That's because we've not done the final step, which is setting the query, okay? But what we now have are borders. Once you've done all that, double check how it looks on the mobile, and that is looking okay. However, I have now noticed the bottom over there. So I've zeroed out all the margins and padding, and I'm now just gonna add in a little bit of spacing here, and I'm already at the bottom there. So that's now looking, that's looking pretty good now. Let's just hit, uh, go back to the desktop. Obviously check on your tablet as well. Hit update and then hit save and back. If I click on the loop grid, this is now using template number 309. We have two templates for the blog. Well, one was for the blog, one was for the sidebar. This is now the template for the products. Let's now go and set up how it looks. We have the options now activated for the number of columns and the number of items per page. I'm actually going to increase that to be a 12. I think we only have nine. Yeah, we only have nine products. And then I'm going to go to style. And when we zero those all out, now everything is going to be sat quite snug against one another. Now, I accept that the height of the images or those blocks is bigger than what we had on the home page. But in terms of layout, it will still fit. And in a way, the blogs are quite verticular because you have the text over there as well. If we go to the query tab, you can also start to decide on how you're going to order your items. So are you going to order by the name, the date they were entered, the popularity in terms of how many sales they've had as well. I'm going to set this in name order. I'm going to go for ascending like that. And the other option we also have is pagination. Now, I've set this to show nine products. What if I set it to show like three across and two rows? So I only show six. You could then also say, well, what are you going to now enable? So I might go for like a um, previous or next option. So let me just go back to my layout. Let me change this to be three, for instance, and then you'll now see the previous or next kick in with the pagination. So bear that in mind. If you activate it and you're showing all nine, that ain't going to show because there's nothing else to lead off to. And then we have the grid builder, which we are going to use when we now want to do some filtering on the actual shop page. This is the page that will be used for when you now click over to now go look at category specific, for instance. Let me show you that. If I just go and hit uh, publish, it will now say, where do you want to show this? I'm going to go with add condition and leave it as all product archives. You could, if you want, go and set it as your shop page, your search results or anything like that. I'm going to leave it as all product archives because once you click backpack, I want you to land here. 
Um, also, there is something I forgot to do. I need to go back a step. I must do this before we get onto this bit. You could also do the product categories as well. So you could have a different looking uh, layout for backpack, rucksack, or casual. Now, before I go and set this, let me just hit save and close. If I go back over to my query, this is quite important. Make sure your source is set to current queries. Manual selection, related products, all of that. You know, if you want to be very manipulative over what you're going to show, but I'm going to show current query. Because this is where the ordering kind of slightly goes out the window because now it's all going to depend on what you go and pick. Let's just hit update, add condition, and now leave it as all product archives. Now we'll hit save and close. Now, if we go back to our blog page before we did the one with the grid builder filtering, we want to maintain consistency with how everything looks. So I'm going to copy this entire container. I'm going to hit paste there. I'm then going to go over to my navigator and make sure the container I've just pasted is now sat above. And you'll now see the items. Uh, if we just click on there, I'm going to remove that. And I'm now going to pick up the one we just created and drop it in. And then I'm going to get rid of the old one like that. And then I'm just going to change the title over here, get the right gear. You can be quite inventive. You don't just want to put the word shop products because it feels a little bit lackluster. So be a little bit imaginative over what you're showing. So this is where you'll end up if you were to go and hit the casual button or the rucksack, but it's not the actual shop shop page that we're going to be advertising inside the menu. What I'm going to do is copy this because once you've done it once, you want to kind of reuse it elsewhere because we're going to use the same template again. We're not going to change the layout. When you go back to pages and scroll down, you will already see one over here called shop. So this is where WooCommerce creates pages. Do you remember I mentioned the cart, the checkout, but sometimes what it does do is go and add in duplicate pages like over here. So if you see two cart pages, I'm going to view the one that WooCommerce has created that's as identified as cart. And then I'm going to open the other one that is also cart and just have a look at the difference. This page that has not been assigned cart page is bringing up the cart and we are going to modify this and how it looks. However, the second page, which actually does have cart page identified, actually says this. Oh, you found an old path. It's gone and brought up our 404 page. So my advice is get rid of the ones that aren't working. And one of the other tips in case you do get this issue is go and hit quick edit. That one says cart. The other one says cart two. So if you have a checkout two or a my account two, like over here, you want to get rid of those pages. Of course, this is where you may have a problem because let me show you what happens if you try and delete this. If I hit trash, you're going to get this error. Can't move it. Do you remember why? If you go to WooCommerce and you go to settings, do you remember the advanced tab where we identify where everything goes? That's because at the moment it is going to one of those pages. So we know that 281 is where it's already going. I want to go, sorry, 282. I want to go to 281. If I go to checkout, I can see the description is 284. I want to go to 283. If I go to the account page, which is 286, and I just type in my, I want to go to 285. Terms and conditions is absolutely fine. Then go and hit save changes. Now, Majority of the time you will not come across this, but if you do and you've got two pages and you're a bit unsure, just check the one that's errored out. Usually it's got a hyphen number two in the URL. Make sure you are now looking at the correct pages and now go and remove them. So now I can get rid of this checkout because look, it's the one with the hyphen two, but now it's no longer assigned. I can now trash it out. Now the shop page at the moment, if you were to view this, it's going to be bringing over the archive that we've just gone and created here. So let's now look at the shop page. That's what it's pulling over. OK, it's not any different, but we don't want that. And if you were to go over to pages now and you click edit and then you click edit with Elementor, you will get this message saying you can't edit. You've got to enable safe mode and then you go and enable safe mode and then you try and edit and then you hit another problem and you start to pull your hair out. And then sometimes people go and install a theme that's already got everything built in because they start to struggle. It's because of the way that this currently is hooking up to a template. So what you want to do, 
Okay, and, and, and trust me, this is completely safe to do. I'm going to rename this. So I'm just going to call this shop results like that. And I'm just going to change the hyphen also to be shop results. Now, you don't have to do it this way. I like to do it because I'm going to have a different looking shop page, ever so slightly different with Grid Builder for filtering than what happens when you click on it. So we've done that. What you then need to do is go over to WooCommerce, go to settings, go to products, and ensure that this says shop results. This is not your shop page. This is where you will go when you are using the product archive. So when you click it, it takes you to that specific page, okay, which is using the products archive template. What we're gonna do instead is create a completely new page. We're gonna click add new. I've called it shop. And to be honest, when for shop pages, don't try to be too fancy with what you call it, my factory. No, just call it shop. Then click edit with Elementor. Now you can go in with edit with Elementor. If I go back over to my archive page, which is here, I'm just gonna pick up the entire template because I'm gonna reuse the items. Go over to my new shop page, go to the settings in the bottom left, hide the title, and then I'm gonna paste everything in its entirety. I will go over to my loop grid. Remember, hit the pencil to edit it. Go over to query. And I'm going to say, now show me my latest products. And this is now in title ascending order. But let's go a step further, because if we now look at the blog page, we had these nice little uh, filters that we had. Well, let's go and create that. And if you haven't watched the rest of the video or the previous ones, you are going to need the Grid Builder plugin. There are many other plugins out there, but for working with Elementor Loop Grid, this is brilliant. It's not free. There is no free version. It is $49 per year. Um, I'm not affiliated to them or anything like that, but I have found it is the quickest and easiest and smoothest way of working with Loop Grids. So once installed and activated and you've put your license key in, you go over to Grid Builder and you go to All Facets. Here's where we created one for the blog category. I could, if I want, just duplicate it or create from scratch. But let's do it from scratch in case you haven't followed through. We're going to click Create a Facet and I'm going to call this one Product Categories. And then I'm going to copy the title and I'm going to paste it here as well as the facet title. You can hit save changes at this point if you want. And then I'm going to go to behavior. So we're going to have a filter for, say, uh, the price. We'll do a filter for the categories. We'll do a filter for uh, attributes. Now, re remember, I've only done the color attribute for, say, um, some of the bags, not all of them. So you want to be careful over what you show here because it sometimes doesn't work very well, but I'll show you that. And we're also going to do one for sorting the items as well. So for now, let's just go with a uh, filter and buttons. I do like the button look. I really do like that. Let's just scroll down. We are now going to ensure that we pick the product categories, which is here. Um, if you were going to only do it for, say, the backpack where we had a subcategory, then you would go here and go and type in backpack and it would then pick it and then you could have your subcategory. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave the logic as and so you can pick and choose what you want. And in terms of display, are we going to show empty choices? I don't really want to do that. I think it's very, very pointless. Are we going to show the choice count? We could do or not. But I definitely think there's nothing worse than when you see a category you pick it and it goes, there's no items. I really hate that. And some people go, yeah, but I'm letting you know that we sell them and we will have them at some point. I don't care. Just show me what you have available right now. Let's just hit save changes. Let's go back to all facets and add in a few more. I'm going to add in attribute color. Now this, I'm just letting you know now that this probably won't work very well because I haven't done it for all of the items, but I just want to show you how it operates. Let's go to behavior. We're going to go for a filter system and we're going to go for color picker. Now, Grid Builder is really, really clever in how it starts to identify colors, even though when I did the attribute, you might have noticed that it had the word like Grid Builder or uh, color picker. I didn't actually do that. It will automatically assign the colors for me, and it is really clever how based on the wording it does that. Let's go down here to taxonomy. You can choose other fields as well. So if you've got a custom field, you could use that as well for any of your filtering. Let's go to taxonomy. And when I scroll down, you'll see product color. That is the field I added in as an attribute. So it's now going to pick it. 
We're not going to have any parent terms. We're not going to include or exclude. We'll now do one for a price range. So let's do create a facet, go to filter, and then we'll go for range slider. Now, this is the point where you could get a little bit mixed up because if you start scrolling down here, you're not going to see prices. In fact, you won't see in any of here and you're going to start to go, well, how can I do a slider with my WooCommerce prices then? Here's what you need to follow. Make sure you've done everything I've said here, filter range slider, then go over to your custom field, then pick post field. It's a little bit like go here and go there, but once you've done it and you follow these steps, you'll be fine. Inside here of the custom field, you then want to go and type in price or you can type in WC price, but just start typing in the word price. And what you're after is here. So are you after the sell price, the regular price? What do you want to go for? I would say just go for the price because if only half of your items have a sale price and half don't, then don't pick sell price. Just like if half have got a regular and half don't because they've got a sale price, do you get the idea? So just go for the price because that's the valid price at this point in time, whether they have a sale or not. Let's add in our last facet. Not very imaginative, I know, but you know, you get the idea. Let's go to behavior. We're going to click sort. So I'm going to pick custom field. And then over here, I'm now going to pick my field and go with price. So we'll go with the price there. I'm going to say we go in a low to high. So we go in the ascending order and I'm going to say low to high. We'll go and add in another field. And this one will just kind of do a price high to low, or you might want to do ascending, descending, anything like that. Let's just scroll down to custom field again. It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? Because it's not really a custom field, but it is a custom field. So just go with it. Let's just type in price again. And we got WP price. I'll add in another option where I could go for post title and I could say uh, name A to Z as well. So I'm showing you different ways that you could write it. We'll put that in ascending order. Let's go for post date and we're going to say put latest and we're going to have it in descending order. Yes, because we want the latest date there. Now at the moment, it's just going to be a drop down. But if you enable a combo box, that means that not only will you have a drop down, but you also have a search bar as well. Because I'm adding in a lot of items here, I'm going to leave this off. So if you don't want to have like a searchable text field so they can go and type in backpack or whatever, you can leave that off. So we have have quite a wide range of facets now. Let's go back over to our shop page, which is over here. Remember, this is the shop page, the new one, not the archive, the shop page. We're now going to go over here and I'm going to go and type in, not grid, sorry, I'm going to type in facet and I will now drop this in. And then I'm going to select my facet. So the first, I mean, I could go for any one of these up here now. I'm going to go for product categories first, select the elemental loop grid. Now it's already knows that it's got to select this one because there's only one on the page. If you ever get stuck because you've got more than one loop grid, click on the loop grid, go down here to where you have an option called WP Grid Builder and it will give you the ID 7B, uh, 7FB, sorry. If you go over here, You'll see it's the same one there. I mean, there is only one, so we don't really need to worry about it. If you see this warning, don't get worried, okay? Remember, we pulled over our loop grid that we copied from the shop archive page. So if I click over here, because the loop grid is there, I know it looks invisible, but it's there, and you'll see it in the navigator. If you go down to query, it's currently pointing to the current query, and this confuses uh, the WP Grid Builder. So go and put it to latest product, so it's now in ascending order. And now our filters appear. What I really like about this in terms of styling, if we just click over here on the facet, is I can change the title to be a zero. I could then get rid of it. I could do a bit of um, a, a movement with the padding or the margin so I can decrease the spacing. I can change the color of the button, the highlight color, the font, the outline, all of that. There are so many options here for you. And really quickly, I've already gone and applied it. I'm going to show you how this works in a moment. I'm actually going to duplicate it first, go over here, and I'm now going to pick the attribute color. And you will now see the color. Let me now hit update and show you why having colors only for some products is not a good idea. So if I click casual, it shows me casual. If I go for backpack, it shows me backpack. If I go for all, it puts them all back into title ascending order because that's how we set it up. However, watch what happens if I go and click orange. Yes, that bag is not orange, but that's because it's a variable product. But do you notice how everything else disappears and you have to click it again to go back? 
So let's say you've got the color black, but you've only done that for say four products and there's five other products that also have black. Unless you add that attribute color to every single product, and it's so easy to do, it's in the video, okay, we've covered it then this can actually go against you. Right, let's just go back to the shop. Now for simplicity, I am gonna remove the collar one, but I wanted to show you how you could do it. Let's go and pick price range now instead. And it is very big at the moment. And you can see the style of it is 1035. So let's just go back over to our facets, go to our price range, which is this one here. I'm gonna say we'll put the pound sign at the start. I'm gonna say we will have two decimal places and you can now see what it's done. Now this is really, really wide. We are gonna shorten this, but I wanna bring everything over first. Let's just duplicate this and again now bring in our last item, which was the Wu Sort. Very imaginative, imaginative name, right? Um, and that's it. But let's now get everything to be sat in one line. Let's go over to our parent container. This is currently set as a column. I'm now gonna make it all be a row. The moment you do that, you can basically see what's happened. Everything has now kind of just gone in a bit of a convoluted state. It is all in wrap as well, which is fine. I'm now gonna go over to my title, go to advanced, it is full width, great. Let's then go down over here to the loop grid go to advance and again set this to be a full width so it stretches all the way across remember though everything in here is already set to be a 1100 container because we're just reusing what we had before now we have our items kind of sitting and looking a little bit better but i do want to make them a little bit wider so i'm going to go here to my price one I'm gonna set this to be a custom width and I'm now going to increase this. Now you could use pixels, you could use REM as well, whatever size you wanna go for. I'm just gonna go with 25% for now. Clicking back onto the container, I am gonna say set the content to be justified as space between. So this is right on the left. The sorting is right on the right, and then we have some nice equal spacing between them. Let's now click update and view this. So if we pick backpack, we know it's going to work. I could go over here and now shrink the prices down to be, say, uh, let's just go with $12.99. There you go. It's only going to show me those items, and it takes into account the sale price. Let's hit reset, and it puts it all back. And how about if we sort these to be from prices high to low, which it has now done. As a filtering system, Grid Builder is damn impressive. But we still have a little bit of a problem. If I go and click this, and this is just plain ugly, so let's go and improve it and make it a bit more like how we nicely laid out our blogs. Let's go and create our single product view. We're gonna click add new, we're gonna go over here and we are gonna pick single product. Before we use single post for the single post template, now we do single product. Let's click that and give it a title. Click create template and Elementor does give you some pretty nice, you know, layouts that you can start from. Maybe you're new to Elementor or working with products. You can reverse engineer or just work with these place holding wireframes they give you. Like I said, we've gone and copied what we had in the single post template. If you're not following through and watching all the videos, I strongly recommend you do that. Right, over here, we're gonna get rid of the item here. This is a short code. Remember, we pulled through the sidebar short code or the template. Let's just kill that off. And then over here, we have an image, we got some items, etc. I'm gonna leave the featured image here at the moment. We are gonna modify this. We're gonna go over to our title that is currently a dynamic tag to the post title. I'm gonna hit the X, we're then gonna hit the dynamic tag and we're gonna scroll down until we get to product title. Let's then go over to our child container that we have here. Remember, the layout for this entire container is set as a row. So we've got a header and then we dropped into child containers that sit side by side. The heading, which is a product title, has a custom width of 100%. If you had set it to be something like that, this is what would happen. It starts to wrap on, not wrap onto itself. It starts to then almost sit in line because the width of this is not very big. By setting it to be a full width 100, it means that the child container cannot sit side by side because it's now, well, you can't exceed the 100% unless you went and did some absolute or fixed positioning. 
Let's now go over to this image, which is currently called the featured image, which after refreshing the page is now converted to the image uh, of the actual product. Sometimes this can happen because I've gone and pasted in from the single post template, it brought that over. If that ever happens, just uh, hit publish like this, by the way, and then you'll see the save close option here. Just hit save close, we're not adding any condition yet. Go and refresh the page as well sometimes and it brings it through or sometimes just by luck, it does it like five or 10 seconds later. So don't feel like you've got to delete it. Of course though, I could have got rid of this completely like that and then said, give me the product image and if I just drop it in here and we then get our image, I'll, don't worry about the resolution of it because I know it doesn't look very sharp. And then we got, if there was any variation in that, you would also get that down here. Now, if you don't want to go for this view, we did do a video where we had a completely different way of doing it, where you just drag in one featured image or even an image widget and then use the dynamic stack and it will only ever give you one image. And then you could drag in a gallery widget, which would then show you the product galleries. The only drawback to that though, is that if I was to now click on over here, the, well, it kind of swaps over. Whereas if you have them as two separate widgets, what would happen is when you click it, it actually just opens up a light box, which isn't kind of maybe the best way to approach it. Currently at the moment, the size of this is ridiculously big. So let's go and modify that. Let's go over to our first container and I'm gonna make this be, and then the second child container, I'm gonna make be 60. I'm gonna pick up my short description and drop that into container number two. Pick your custom fonts, make it a size of 1.2. I'm going to go and grab the WooCommerce uh, breadcrumbs as well like that. By the way, I just want to point out something. If I just quickly update, save and close and show you this on a preview. If you were to click, I mean, the Roma is not going to take you anything. If home is just going to take you back to the main website. But if you click on backpack, it takes you to our products archive page. So, you know, the template we made, we have the we have the shop page that has the filters. But the one that just shows you those items, remember we set that up, That again, this is again the reason why I've done it this way. So you now go straight into that. If you'd enabled any reviews for people to do, you would obviously drop that in as well, like the product rating. We're going to drop in our product price and we might as well go and drop in our add to cart as well. That does not look nice at all. I know, trust me, but we're going to modify that. Let's just go over here. Let's make this be a little bit darker. I've increased the side of container one just to be 45 and decreased this to go from 60 to 55. I don't need to though. I mean, one thing you will notice though, if you look at the size of that, we do already have a bit of padding over there. If you remember the child container number one already gave us that. So you might want to adjust things if you feel like they're, you know, they're too close to one another. Let's now just modify the add to cart. It is currently set as an inline. If you were to go for stacked, you will get this look, which again, you could go for, but I think the inline just works and looks a little bit smarter. Going to ensure that we're definitely using the custom fonts there. And then I'm gonna follow through the color scheme that I've used elsewhere. It's the background color and we'll make it be white for the text. And then when you hover over it, you're gonna go to black. And again, you'll have white for the text. You don't have to keep doing that, by the way. You'll have spotted that and gone, why is he doing that? Once you've picked white, unless you're changing it, you don't have to do it again. Again, this is one of those things where a little bit force of habit, where I like to just put them in because I feel like it can be quite vital for maybe someone else who might take over the website or looks after it. Don't always assume that you're going to get a care plan or a maintenance package to look after it. Don't assume that. And when we go to the variations, which is what we have here. Now, please bear in mind, on this Roma bag, we have three variations, which is why we're getting this. If you did not have variation, as we don't on most of them, you would not get this appearing. But because it's a, because it's um, available to us now, we can do. Now, what if when you come to build, though, this happens whereby, let me just save this for a moment, you actually see a completely different product. This is what you do. So let's say it showed one of the casual bags. You go over to settings in your bottom left. You go to preview items. And then over here, you hit the X and you go and put in a different bag. So this is what happens if I type in all terrain, this is what I see. So I might go, hey, yeah, this looks really good and just move on and walk by. And I've taken note of the fact that that is in green, okay, 50 in stock. If I go back over here now and I change that to be the Roma bag because I need to be able to see the variation because I need to stylize it. 
it's good to be a, it's good to modify and build things now rather than revisiting later on that being said i do revisit things quite a bit as well anyway let's go over to the variation now what you can do here is very very limited and it is a little bit annoying as well even if i go over to the advanced tab and i scroll down and say we'll make it all white it won't it's still going to leave that as gray let me just show you what happens if i was to make it blue that's what it does it then it it because what you have here is a bit of an overlay going on over the top. And it is, for me, really annoying because I don't need it to be that big. I really don't like this at all, especially with how the word is moved over to the left. I mean, if I go over here and I go to, I mean, let me show you again. If I go to variation, the spacing is more to do with the up and down kind of thing. And the width is the width of the box and all of that. Um, if you go to advanced and I go, okay, well, give me a left like that. It, it starts to get really, really ugly and annoying. Let's first get rid of that gray color there, because again, you know, I, I don't like it. What you need to do is make sure you're on the add to cart, go to advanced, go down to where you have custom CSS, click that, and then paste in this little bit of code over here. Um, you can instantly see what it's done as soon as I pasted it. It's gonna remove the color. And if I was to change this one to be like that, you can actually have different colors in. So if you wanna have like a black and a dark gray next door to one another, you can actually do that. Let's just pop that back to be white. We still have the slight problem though in that this is like way over to the left-hand side. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna add in a little bit extra, which is text align to the left and a padding left, I'm gonna make a zero as well. Now the text is all the way over. I'm gonna change my label because the size is a little bit small. Let's just make sure it's definitely on a railway. Go over here to the size, make sure it's a 1.2 as well. Uh, make the weight be a lot smaller than that. I think 400 is okay. And I'll just go for letter spacing one as well. Go down to custom CSS and we've already done a little bit to it. I'm gonna add in a little bit more and I've gone for padding top 18.5 pixel just to move it into the center there. And that's basically it. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna leave a little bit of space there because you'll notice that when we come to do the variation, it adds in a little bit of text. So you might wanna keep that clear. One thing that is very um, evident though is that this all does look a little bit cramped up. So let's just go over to our pricing one, zero out. And I'm gonna say, give me about 30 uh, pixels spacing from the top. It is a very good idea to use EM, REM, and if you're trying to build a responsive website, it's a good idea to use Clamp as well. I am gonna cover that in a later on, right at the end when I start to talk about better responsiveness, but I just wanna get through building a decent single product template. I'm going to keep these share icons actually because I think they're not a bad little feature to have. Let's just drop these in over here as well. And you can see what we've got going on with our layout at the moment in the second container. I've just added in a bit of top margin as well just to put the share bit down there. And I'm gonna say centralize it so it pushes everything down. Go back to my advanced and I'm now gonna get rid of that padding over there. And that's looking a little bit better in terms of layout, especially with where the buttons currently sit as well. Go and check how it looks on the mobile. So this is now the view on the mobile. Remember the containers brought over the sizing. So the parent containers got the uh, 2020 on the left and right. Again, you know, once you do it once, just reuse the same elements again in a way because it's currently set as a row. Everything is in the center. Now at this point, you might think, why well, don't, well, I'll just align the items and it doesn't do anything. You do have to get your head into gear with the way Flexbox containers work. I'm now gonna hit start. Okay, so it's because we're on a row, start means left. Okay, because you're looking at and going, well, it's, it's in the center, you know, well, you know, that, is that right? Well, no, think of it. If you were to now hit end, it actually takes you to the end of the row, the start of the row. Okay, and it's, and it's you got to get used to the way these items are positioned. I would definitely say the typography for the text here needs to be shrunk down to be a one when you're on the mobile. The header is okay because that followed through what we did before. Everything else here is okay, uh, except this really ugly looking uh, share items. Let's just go and address that. And that's looking okay. So now let's go over here. Let's now duplicate this container that we've got because we know it's looking okay. I'm going to get rid of the header, obviously. I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to completely get rid of actually this container that we have because we're now just gonna have one container like that. 
I want to make sure that this is a hundred percent all the way across. Get rid of that. Get rid of the price. Get. I mean, I mean, you could keep the share as well if you want. You could still repeat yourself at the bottom. But I think once is more than enough. Let's just clear that out. And then over here where we have the text, uh, the short description, let's get rid of that as well. And we can bring through other items like additional item product data tabs is the most obvious one to bring over. So this is now where, you know, I mean, if there's any of the further details, you are going to get that. The nice thing is that everything is nicely laid out. The only real thing I'm going to do is just make sure that we have consistency in what we're doing. By the way, um, when it says default, that will default to your global font. However, out of force of habit, I like to just be sure and always make sure I pick railway just in case the theme or the website accidentally goes and picks something else. Uh, so we're just going to go with a 1.2 for the REM. The last thing we're going to add at the bottom over here is uh, related products. So we didn't set any upsells or cross sells, which you could use. So if you had set any, like, look, if I drop this in here, you're not going to get anything. I didn't set any. So when we were doing the WooCommerce products, if I had said, if you buy this, you should also get this bag or this hat as well. We didn't do that. So I'm going to get rid of that. And what I'm going to do instead is just bring over product related like that. Um, I really don't like the look of this in terms of the wording and the sizing. So what you should do is just go in and change it. Just change the font sizes a little bit just to match everything we've got. Uh, other things you may want to take into account is that when you scroll down, you do have all of these. Well, the heading we've done, you know, the box, if you want to change that as well, the sizing you can do. I'm going to leave that. Now, when you hit update or publish for the first time, you are going to get asked to go, well, what's your condition? You could set up a different single product template per category or even for individual items. So over here, I could say actually uh, for the rucksack category, show this look for the casual, have a completely different look where you might have a background image. I mean, I haven't put background images in. I've been quite bland in a way with what I've done, but you could have like a curly pattern or something going on. So I'm just going to leave this as all products for now and I'm going to hit save and close. So if we now go back over to our shop that we have here and I now go and pick, say, the corporate bag, you're going to get this. I mean, look, the images here are a bit ridiculous. I, do you remember when I created it? I did say I on purpose went and picked, in, you know, like images of various sizes to highlight how that's not always a good idea. But you can see what we get there. And when you scroll down, you've got the other items. And if you go back and go and find a variable item, which is this one, go and like pick your colors and, you know, things change and you got your very, um, your other items. That bit of CSS code I gave you there makes a major bit of difference, in my opinion, on how you can make this look. That is our single product template finally done. There's still more to do. We haven't even touched the cart or the checkout page. I mean, look, if I was to go over here and say, OK, let's go for the all terrain bag. I add it to my cart and then I go and view the cart. This is how the cart page looks at the moment. And it's not bra it's not br color branded. And, it, you know, I think it, it's a little bit boring. What I do want to highlight, though, is this little bit over here, where currently we have a flat rate of 299. If you remember when I did the WooCommerce settings, I said that if your cart value was uh, 50 pounds, then it is free. Now, if I go and put this to three and I update the cart, Look at this. This is what happens. You now have to pick the free shipping. Otherwise, you might accidentally go and pay, pay it. That is not good. And we're going to work on the cart and checkout page. And then later on, I'm going to show you a code snippet that's really easy and simple to apply, whereby you can make this automatically only show the free shipping item and not the flat rate once you hit the £50 threshold. Now, when you go to cart or checkout, you'll notice here it says edit with Elemental. The very first time you come here, you will not have the word edit with Elemental. What instead you'll have to do is you have to click edit. And this is what you'll see, a blank page with a short code. When you go to checkout, you won't have the edit with Elemental. It will just say edit, quick edit, trash and view. You click edit and you'll see this and it will say WooCommerce underscore checkout. This is the standard. What you want to do for all of them, for the cart, the checkout and the My Account is click Edit with Elemental. 
and it brings you into Elemental. And then you have this. Now you're very limited as to what you can do here. You have a short coat, so you can't rearrange anything. You can go to the style tab and maybe mess around with the typography, or you can click on the actual container or section or whatever you got. Again, go to style and you have some further options. So for the heading, you know, link colors at the moment, you can go and change them. But it is a very old fashioned standard way of doing WooCommerce. And if you're using Elemental, you might as well get the best out of it. What you wanna do with the cart, the checkout and the account page is go over here and type in cart and you have a new widget. Go and drop that in because I wanna show you the differences between both of the styles and then hit update. Just drag it in, we're not styling it yet, we're just gonna have a quick look at it. By the way, you would also have one for the checkout, which is here, and if you type in account, you will have my account as well. Just go and drop them in below the standard ones, just so I can show you the two different layouts. I'm gonna to go to WordPress and I'm gonna to go to visit store. Remember, I haven't actually added shop to our menu yet, and on our home page, we don't have any items visible either. So it's really quick for me just to jump into the store like this. Let's now go and add this to the cart. And then we hit view cart. This is now the original cart. And if you scroll down, you'll now see the new one. Um, you're going to go, well, is it really that much better? I think in terms of layout, it does have much more legs on it. There's the checkout page. And when you scroll down, you've got the payment options here again. And if you want, you can go and click PayPal and play with PayPal. So nothing is actually lost. I am going to address the thing about the flat rate and the free shipping with a free code snippet, but we'll come on to that moment uh, later on. But you have that. And if you scroll down, you've got the elemental version, which is practically the same thing. Look, in fact, I feel like the checkout here does look a little bit smarter, if I'm really honest, than what we have here. Let's get rid of the standard um, uh, WooCommerce cart that we already had. And instead, we're just going to stylize this. If you click on it, you now get to see your options. So do you want to go with a one column approach, which is great on the mobile, but leave it as two for the desktop. And if you're wondering what the mobile looks like, it will revert back into one. We do have quite a lot of spacing over here at the moment, but don't worry about that. If we go to the update summary, you can now start to modify your wording. So if you don't want to have the word update cart there for when you make any changes, you can go and change that. If you want to stretch the button, you could do. I mean, I'm not going to. You do also have the option for, are you going to allow them to apply a coupon? Now, if you are never going to have any coupons on here, I would say just completely remove it. The same with all of the wording over here. You can change them to suit what you want to say. Now, the additional options is a good one. So if I was to go and activate that, it will update the cart. So let me show that. If I now change that to be a three, it will now go and automatically update. So I don't have to have the update button there. Go to the style tab. This is where we can be a little bit more experimental. So if you now want to change the background color, I'm not, I prefer to leave it as white. One of the tricks about when you're selling products is you want to keep your cart and check out as clean as possible. I have seen some pages where they have loads of other stuff going on. They have videos added on. They have lots of lovely background images. And I'm like, no, keep it really clean. You want them to go, I like it. The price is fine. Yep. Okay. This is what I'm going to pay for shipping. And away they go. You don't want to distract them. You could even give them a border radius like that. I've just gone really crazy. I just want to show you though that you get so much more with the uh, elemental widget than what you got with the standard. So if you just want to go standard, go for it, because it is quick and easy. You can, fly, you can get your shop done really quickly and out there. But if you care about the presentation or your client had one, you know, you want to give them something a little bit special, that little bit of effort can go so far. Obviously, typography, I'm not actually going to do it here. Um, it's not because I'm not wanting to do it, but because it's like um, with cart and checkout, I, I don't overly worry about the fonts that's coming through or anything like that. You could argue about the Google page speed for your cart and checkout, but let's be brutally honest here. Okay. Who cares? All right. You just want to make sure it loads through fine. You don't do too much messing around and they convert and buy. What I will do though is change the link color to be our branded color. We have a border color going on here of a bit of a aqua or blue color. I'm going to change that to be a non. So you could get rid of the color or you could add your own one in and also be quite creative in that you can actually add an image to the buttons as well. I don't recommend this. So I'm just going to go and grab our logo and add it in. And you can see here, it does not look great at all. I mean, you could go over here, make it a cover, a contain, 
do some positioning, but I feel like that is way too crazy. The other option is to maybe just use like a standard button. But I think, again, I think that's just overkill. So it's a great, nice little feature you got there, but I wouldn't recommend it. And that's literally it. I mean, I haven't spent too long on it. I'm trying to keep it really, really simple, but I've just made sure it kind of still fits the brand. Now, the one thing is I should have mentioned, actually, is if I just go and hit the settings, I don't like the title we've got there with the cart. So I'm going to get rid of that, hide that title. I'm going to go open one of our other pages. I'm just going to copy that entire container, go to my cart page, drop it in over here. So, well, it should go to the top. Sometimes I don't like it the way it drops to the bottom. So let me just pick that up. By the way, I should actually have mentioned this and I should have spotted this earlier. Because you're using the WooCommerce cart and checkout that comes with it, even though we're using Flexbox container, everything sat within a section. So if you want to continue maintaining that you're working with uh, containers, you want to get it out of there and stick it into a container. So the first thing I'm going to do is go over to my container, get rid of the text, okay? Go down here to where we have the cart, which all sits within one. Even though it's split into two columns, it sits within one, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to copy it, go over to here, and I'm just going to paste it. And then I'm just going to delete the old section. So what we now get is this. Now, don't be surprised if when you look at it, it looks like it's more lopsided over to the left-hand side. What you have to do, if this ever happens, by the way, uh, go over to your advanced tab and just set your width to be full width 100%. That's what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this entire section. Now we're going to go over to the checkout page. Remember, you hit edit, you drop in the, uh, sorry, you hit edit. Then you go to edit with Elementor so that you can now do everything that I'm about to do with the page. So let's just go over here to the checkout. This is the original one. I'm going to almost ignore that and put a paste over here. Make sure that this new container now sits at the top. We're going to get rid of the title over there. This one I am just going to call checkout, okay, because I don't think I want to be too personalized at this point. I'm going to go down over here. We've already dropped in the widget. We're going to copy it, go over to this container, and I'm just going to pop it in here for now. I'm going to get rid of the cart. Again, I cannot stress how when you do things once, you start bringing things over, it just works, okay? It just works really, really well. I'll show you again, you have options here. You can set it as one column, which I really don't like. You can set it up as two column. The neat thing also is you can make the right column sticky. This does not work well on the cart, which is why I didn't apply it. But over here now, well, let me show you what it looks like without, okay? So as you scroll down, right, your payment bit almost gets hidden. You make it be sticky, it stays there within view until you get to the bottom. It's like a inbuilt sticky column there. I think that works really, really well and I would recommend using it. Link, we'll give that a link color and again, set my hover color for that as well. See the color there. And of course, let's just get rid of that border type. Just set that to be a non because I don't want that there. Now, there is something I haven't actually shown you on the cart page, but it is here. And the reason I don't like to go into it is because I, again, I like to keep things really simple. If you go to style, okay, you have the option for customize. And if I go over to the cart, you also have that there as well. Now, when you click it, you're gonna get a plus sign for the cart and checkout page. If we look over here to where we have the coupon section, we don't actually have a styling section for that. Everything I've just done at the moment with like the colors, it was applied to everything. The same over here, the coupon doesn't have its own like particular styling. So if I was to apply a background color, it would apply it to everything. If I go to customize, I hit the plus, I can now customize individual sections. So if I was to go and click coupon like that, the customized coupon now becomes available. If I open that, I could go in and go, all right, you know what? We're gonna have a completely different background color. There's a reason I don't like to go into this is because I don't, again, it's one of these things where I don't like to overdo things, all right? If you really want to do it, go for it, but you don't have to. Anyway, I'm going to hit update now. And the final page that I just want to double check everything on is the my account page. Let's go and hit edit with Elementor. Remember, you got to hit edit, then hit edit with Elementor. And then when you're into here, you would then drag in the my account widget. Just type in account and you'll see it. Drop that in and you can see the difference in styling. Again, let's apply the same principle that we've already done. I'm gonna go and grab my cart page. 
I'm going to hit the plus sign. It will probably shove it at the bottom anyway. That doesn't matter. I pick up the container and move it to the top. I expand on it. I then grab the widget, copy it, and I'm just going to paste it over here. Get rid of the cart because I've duplicated it. Get rid of the section and get rid of that other container I added. Again, everything is now consistent. Let's go over to our settings. Let's hide the title. Um, and let's just change the wording. So keeping this really simple now, you could, if you want, go over here and say, change the wording if you want. I mean, you know, your orders, my orders, um, downloadable orders, something like that. You can also make this be horizontal as in bars like that. It looks really awkward at the moment, but if I was to do this and make it go into start, it'll, it's, it's a weird one, this, okay? Because you would think, why doesn't it just do that automatically? If you hit start, left, right, stretch, because that's how it defaults to. So I might want to go with something like that. I might want to reduce the spacing from there to be something like, let's go with a 20. I don't like how close they are. So let's go to the style. We have the spacing over here. Let's go with a 20 there. Just to sp I mean, 20 actually does look quite big, doesn't it? We'll go with a 10 instead. You can now change your background colors, your typography. Hover, we're going to change the color to be a, uh, a white color and the background color will be a black like this. And on the active one, we'll have a white color and we'll go with, whoops, not a gradient. We'll go with a that accent purple color we got there. So you can see what's going on now as we move over the items. Okay, on the mobile, everything looks okay, but there is a payoff to this. Look how big this container is. It's not very big at all. If I was to now do this, can you see the footer has come all the way to the top? And that's because there's not much content on there. Now, if you're okay with that look, which I have to say, because it's very clean, it doesn't really matter that much. However, if it does bother you, there's two things you could do. You could either go over to your layout uh, of your container and make your container height be bigger. This now moves to the middle and you are probably going to start doing all of this. Oh, how do I get it to be to the top? It's not going to the top. What do I do? This is one of those things that if you don't know about it, you will overlook it. We are currently wrapping. If I undo the wrap, it now puts everything there. If I go and stick it as a column, it will now be underneath. But what if I wanted to leave it as a column? And let me put this all back to how it was and put it back on wrap. So I've just shown you really quickly, okay, take the wrap off and stick it as a column. Job done. But what if you want to leave the row and you want to leave the wrap? How do I get that to be back up at the top? We have an option here called align content. Hit that and set that to be flex start. It is now back in place. Okay, so I'm just showing you that you could do it with the column feature and no wrap, but if you have the row and you got the wrap, this is what you do. Go and hit it at the flex start and it will stick it up there. And everything is still fine in the mobile. We can now just hit up. I mean, I mean, hold on, by the way, I said there was two ways to do it. So that's the first way. The second way is you don't actually touch the height. So let's just completely delete that. And instead you go over to your container, which we're in already, and you might go, ah, oh, you know what, let's just go and add in 400 like that. You know, and obviously the more content you have in here, like as you start to like look at your orders and stuff like that. Um, and by the way, here's the options you are getting as well uh, for what the different tabs are. But I think that looks pretty fine. And again, keep it clean because you don't want to distract them. If we're viewing our store now and I add to cart and I hit view cart, we now go to our checkout page. This I don't like very much with the way the PayPal button is right up against it. So let's go and sort that out. And I've dropped in a little bit of code that says margin. This is the key bit, actually, if I just do this here. Margin bottom 20 pixels, semicolon, and then close curly bracket. Now, if I update that and I now preview this page, you will now see that the buttons have moved down by 20 pixel. Now, Looking at that code might scare you a bit because you're going to go, where the heck do I get that? The trouble is, though, is that this bit here and the 281 is kind of standard, but this here, the 00 AFD39 is specific to my particular car. OK, so you are going to have a different code. Where do you get that code? It is really, really simple and easy. So please don't get scared at this point. OK, Let's go to proceed to checkout. Uh, when you're previewing it, you right click and you click inspect okay uh, it depends on google chrome or whatever browser you're using now when you do that you will get a lot of gobbledygook on the right hand side over here S don't start clicking anywhere else because straight away over here you're gonna see what the the code we're after so this 
from 281 all the way up until the end. In fact, you can go all the way to the very first curly bracket. Let me just show you here. So you wanna go all the way over here. You can even take the curly bracket if you want. You wanna copy all of that, okay? Then close this down. You can even close down the preview page. Then paste that here. Then type margin bottom, 20 pixel, semicolon, and end the curly bracket. If you wanna put 100, if you wanna put five, 10, whatever you wanna go for, you then hit update. You then now preview that. You now have your spacing. Pretty simple, right? Very easy thing to do. And by the way, if anyone is wondering, if you were looking at this, uh, the checkout page, you don't need to add any code for that. When you go and enter in uh, PayPal, that is already nicely laid out. It's just on the cart page, it doesn't do it automatically. So you gotta drop in a little bit of code. But like I said, you don't have to do this. If you're gonna just, if you're happy for that button to be sat side by side, go for it. So that's our cart and checkout page done as well, but we're not done yet. Hold your horses. Remember the issue we've got here, flat rate and free shipping. Look, if I go and hit this to be a one, it only has flat rate. You go and change it to be a 10, the free shipping should kick in because we said anything over 50 pounds is free shipping. But the user now kind of gets to pick and you don't want them to do that. You want it to automatically just show the free shipping. The way to do that is to use a code snippet. Let's go into snippets. Let's go and click add new, free shipping when 50 plus, then click the link in the video description that will take you over to Code Snippets Cloud. This is where you'll end up. You just wanna go over here and click copy to the code and go and paste the code in. Now, we're not completely done yet. You will notice over here, we have the words for free shipping number two and we have flat rate one. What you need to do now is make sure you've got those in the right order. So let me now show you what I mean. If I go over to WooCommerce and I right click and open the settings in another tab and we go to shipping and then I go to my UK shipping and just open that up, we have flat rate. Uh, by the way, the wording you use here is quite important. Flat rate is my first one. Free shipping is my second one. Look at the wording, look how you've written it. Let's go back over here. So flat underscore rate is my first one. Free, I mean, uh, to be honest though, the the, high, the the capitals and all of that don't really matter, the uppercase, but it's the wording. So if over here you'd called it freedom shipping rates, you gotta make sure you do freedom underscore shipping underscore rates, but free shipping is number two. So free shipping is number two. And what you wanna now do is set your value so over here is the threshold, and I'm gonna say the threshold is 50, like that. You might wanna change your wording as well, just so that if anyone sees this in future, they will also understand. And I hit save changes and hit activate. Now when I view my cart, it just says free shipping. If I was to go and change this to be a two, and it will now, remember I've got the automatic update going on, now the flat rate 299 has kicked in. Again, let's just change that to be a six. Watch, the flat rate disappears and it just says free shipping and only free shipping is applied. Yeah, I know it's another code snippet, but come on. If you do want to like reduce distraction and confusion with your customers, how many times have you gone to a website and it kind of, it doesn't actually, you know it's free shipping, but the option for the flat rate is still there. And for some reason, the flat rate is still ticked. You don't want to be caught up having these little mini arguments of, hey, I paid more than I should have. Really simple and easy for you to just make things flow so much better. Now let's go and improve the way our website looks because we haven't added our shop or any of those extra pages to our menu. So back into appearance and menus, we're now gonna go and add in our page. We have the shop over here. Remember though that you do have shop results, which is what you go to after you clicked on a category, which is I don't want you to do that because you would do that via the category. We also have the cart, the checkout, and the account page. Now I'm just gonna show you what it would look like if we went and added all of them. I could rearrange the items, I could maybe stick them inside one another, but I'm just gonna very simply, in fact, I'm gonna get rid of the checkout, okay? Because ideally you wanna go via the cart. So I'm just gonna do something like this for now and then just show you how does that look on the front end and what you're gonna get is something like this. And it starts to get a bit more busier. Also, there's a chance they might not and see the cart bit. I know it's there, it's visible, but they might overlook it. So let's go and add something in to make that a little bit clearer. What we're gonna do is we're gonna remove them 
and we're going to drop in a couple of widgets so they can see the basket total and for the account we'll actually add in an icon like of an avatar of a person that they click and it will take them through to their relevant page let's go and get rid of the account and we'll get rid of the cart as well we'll leave the shop though and let's just hit save menu then we're going to go over to our templates remember we have two header templates we're going to work on the header of our pages and then whatever we do there, we will then copy and paste over into the header home and just remember to remove the logo because we don't have the logo on the home page. So if I go to header of a pages and hit edit with Elementor, this is what we have. We had a space between going on and you're now going to get to see what I do with how we now tinker with a very basic header and we take it a step further. Let's just look at the layout of what we have here. We have a container with a logo and a WordPress menu. I'm gonna go and drop in now a cart widget. Now, the way I do it is not how you wanna be doing it, but I wanna show you the problem and how we get around that. If I go and type in cart, you will now see the cart widget. We don't want that. What we want is the menu cart. So I'm gonna grab that and I'm gonna just drop it in. And I'm going to rearrange it maybe, maybe to be something like that. And you can see what's happening. It's now got our price and it says our total because we were playing around and adding items. Well, I don't like the layout of that. I mean, if you want your menu in the middle, you can move on at this point. But what if I go, no, I want it to be all the way at the end. Well, look, I do that. My logo also goes with it. OK, space between. No, I'm back here. Space around. No, now it's moved in space even. It's just not working, is it? So let's just put everything back to be, uh, sp sorry, uh, space between like that. I don't want that to be in the middle. So how do I get this to be sat over there? Some people, what they do is they go and start doing absolute or uh, fixed positioning of how you position. And you're going to enter a world of pain when you start to move between different breakpoints. So here's my big killer tip. Just go and drop a container in like that. Then inside of this container, go and drop in your menu and your cart. So let's now get everything into one line. And if you, if you understand containers, this should make sense. You want to hit row. You can see what it's done. Everything is now side by side. It's before they were columnar, vertical even. Now they're in rows and then we sit them to the end. Now we have the look I was going for like that. Look at that. Now we've got it. Let's just go and stylize this. I'm not going to do too much on it. You've got a bubble. You've got a plain effect as well like that. I think the bubble one I tend to find works really well. You can decide on different styles as well for how you want to demonstrate it. Do you want a basket? Do you want a cart? Medium, light. You can change the style. You can change the size as well. You can also automatically open the cart. So let me, I'm going to activate it just to show you what it looks like. So if I now hit add to cart, this now opens up over here, um, view cart, view checkout. Again, this is a nice, neat little feature if you want to go for it. Sometimes people don't always want to do that because can you imagine if you've got 20 items that someone might buy, every time they add an item, this happens. Then they've got to go, oh, I'll close that. Oh, I'll add that to cart. Oh, it's going to open again. I've got to close that. So have a think about your user experience, okay? Because I know a lot of people, they go, oh, yeah, I really love this feature, but... Now I've got to hit that to close it. So how many clicks am I adding for you? Uh, it, for me, it can be a little bit annoying because look, I can't go here, add to cart and then click here. Well, I had to click twice. Okay, let me make that clear. To now add this, I've got to click, closes. It hasn't added it. Then I click, now it adds it. So the number of clicks can be a bit unnecessary. So let's just go back over here and I'm not gonna automatically add the cart. Don't want a border, so I'm just gonna pop in a zero there to completely get rid of it. Set my size to be one REM. I'm gonna make it be a four. I don't like how bold it was there. If I feel like I do wanna take it over a bit more, I could just click the navigation menu and I'm just gonna say, get rid of some of the right margin so we could take it even more over. I'm gonna just drop that in over here. I mean, you could put it at the end, you could put it in the middle. I actually think it's better off sitting um, before the cart. Go with this one over here. I'm going to set this to go to the account page. You just type that in and it will now link to that. I'm going to go with 24. Now you will notice the positioning of it is like way off. That's because we haven't aligned anything. So go to our container and then just hit align items to be in the middle. Now this is where we are getting a bit of like the contact thing is now way too close to that. So I'm now just gonna, in fact, what I'll do 
is let's remove the 30 from there um, and now just double check like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's looking okay. One of the drawbacks to doing that approach though is that someone might not know what that is. So I've gone and done it, but you might want to have a think about, do you want to have that on its own? Do you want to have it with the word my account or account underneath or above or below it, which you could do if you were to go and use the icon list instead. If you were to drop that in, now you could do it and you've got the icon and the wording next door to it. So I'm going to swap it out now. So I just want to show you, you could use the icon, but if you think like it's not too clear, then just swap it out. Put your title in, make sure you're linking it correctly to the relevant page. Go and set your sizing and your typography. And there we go. So you can make things look a little bit special. Now, before you move on, okay, remember to always go and double check how does this look in the mobile because now we have a completely different layout. Before we had our logo lovely positioned with our menu over here. Now we've got these further items. I'm gonna to go to my logo first, go to the advanced tab and the width, and I'm gonna say, make this be a custom, and I'm gonna leave it in pixel, and I'm gonna make it be 110 like that, just so that things are where they are. And then I'm gonna to go to the child container. Over here, we have the full width. Uh, you wanna make sure that it probably will be set as in pixel make sure you put this to be percentage and then what you want to do is now reduce this until we get to something like this i've now added back into here my icon i should have mentioned though i i didn't say it in the video i just copied it and put it somewhere else because in here all of these items now even when i go to 378 uh as the width as the minimum it it starts to look very very cramped up especially because of that menu so what I need to do is hide this and use this one instead. The icon without the word my account is linking over to the account page. So this my account, if we go to the advanced tab, go to responsive, I'm gonna hide this on the mobile. Whereas this one here is gonna be hidden if we go to responsive on the desktop and the tablet. Okay, so look, if I go to desktop, you only see this one and that is now hidden. I know you can see it there, but it's not actually in view. If we go over here to the mobile, that is the one that you will see. We now view that, the menu still opens as it should. So that's all excellent, but now what we need to do is just make sure that is the uh, works or looks the same on our other menu. So what you do is you just copy that as it is, go over to our templates, go to our a header home template, hit edit with Elementor, because don't forget, you will have updated this page, right? So now it feeds through to all the other pages. Go to our home. I'm just gonna paste this here for now. Make sure everything is okay. Go and delete the header. Everything should stay as it is. Go and double check now how it looks on the footer. Just go and minimize that. Let's get rid of the original header because we have two there for a moment. Go to our new container and make sure that this is current, this container, Okay, it's currently set to 60%, make it be 100% and then just make sure everything looks okay. Now, I'm not liking the look of that because um, it's all stretched out. So we're just going to go to that container and I'm going to say, put it all towards the end like that. It's now very closely spaced out. So let's go and give this about 20 and that. And I think we can go bigger than that. Let's go with a uh, 30. And that is now looking okay. And we can now make sure it's fine on the desktop again. Everything is okay. Always double check. Don't rush things like I am. Go and click update. And now when we visit our website, that's what we've got. And if I was to now go over to say the shop page, we go to the shop page and we have our logo back as well. And if I click that, now I get the summary and I can do view cart or checkout. Remember though, if I do this, it's not going to open the sidebar because I'm not a fan of that. But you click it, it shows you the items, or you can just go to your cart and you can go and mess around here. And that is, in essence, basically the WooCommerce shop done. But there's just one little thing we need to do. Do you remember on the home page, I went and added in a rugged and an Outlander backpack? They're not currently going anywhere. So let's just go over to the page here, our home one. Here's our button. Let's click it because it's a call to action. Go to where we have content and we have our button. Where does it go? This is pretty simple here. I'm going to go in and start typing in rugged and it will now bring up the product. This is why the naming of your products can be really important. Let's go and click that and then we'll click over here where we have the Outlander. 
And the minute you type out, all of these will start to appear wherever the word out could be present. So I'm just gonna go with the Outlander like that and now click update. So on our home page, when I click this, it will take me to the rugged page. And if I hit back and go to the Outlander, you know where it's going. I hope you've really enjoyed what we've done there and you've learned a few tips and tricks with how to approach things with a WooCommerce website, but we're not done there. We're gonna take things a step further. What if you want to now also sell courses? So you've got a shop, you've got your blog post, but you also wanna sell courses or materials or PDFs or downloads or anything like that. How could you do that? And how can you allow people to access that once they've purchased it? We're gonna take the website a step forward. So we've got our products, we've got our blogs, but what if you also wanna sell courses? Maybe you want people to buy something and then they can access videos, PDFs, images, or just content, but you wanna put it behind a paywall. You don't wanna give everything away for free. You can do that using WooCommerce and an extra plugin that will restrict the content until they purchase a product. What we're gonna do is do it for three courses and I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. Inside of our media library, I've already gone and dumped in three images. These are 1920 by 1080. You could make them smaller. They've all been made in Canva. They're quite simple, just showing three different styles there. Um, they've been saved as a PNG from Canva and then using bulk resize photos.com converted into WebP. You can see them there. They're only about 19 kilobytes in size. For a 1920 by 1080 image, that's pretty, pretty good. What we're now gonna do is go and create the three individual products. So we go over to products, and this is where we're gonna kinda of be doing something very similar to what we've done here, but just with a slight difference. I'm gonna call this one Rockstar. I'm just gonna add in some Laura Mipsum text, but here's where you may also wanna add in like some further information. Remember, you are selling a course here. So what's the benefits? What are they gonna get out of it? Then I'm gonna copy the entirety of that text I'm gonna scroll down until we get to the short description and here's where I'm gonna break a rule. I said the short description in the earlier video for WooCommerce was keep it short. In fact, for the course, don't put everything in here because this is gonna be important for the part when you're now telling people about the course. You wanna get over that this is a benefit to you. So don't just have a short description and then expect them to scroll down to now get more details. By the way, you can be quite inventive with this. You could, if you want, start sticking in testimonials, further images. Remember, you do have options over here to add media, so you could even drop in a video as well. Then over in product categories, I'm gonna go in add in a new one, and I'm gonna call this one courses even. I'm gonna go in and add in my image and for this one we will go with that image over there. For the pricing and the setup I'm gonna say this is a simple product. It is a virtual product though and we are gonna add in a little bit of code where anything that is virtual instantly becomes completed and I will explain that when we get to that okay because at the moment all of the other rucksacks and backpacks we're selling in the shop they have to go through a processing payment sequence and then they have to be marked as completed. So once you know the payment's landed, it is now completed, you will then go in and uh, dispatch. And I'll show you that when we get to that stage, okay? So bear with me on that. We're gonna go and set in our price, 99.99. We will then go to the inventory and we'll put in a fake SKU number. We're not gonna track the stock because we want everyone to buy it. You know, we don't wanna say, hey, there's only 40 courses left unless that's your business model or marketing strategy. We are gonna say though that this is sold individually because I don't want someone to go on and buy 10 of the same course. That it, make, it does make very little sense unless you were offering membership with like a monthly subscription then, but again, even then you need to log in. So I would say just limit it to one person or one item. And then I'm gonna duplicate this twice. So I've got three products in total. So we've got our three items, Peaky Blinder, High King Maker and Rockstar. I know, very, very inventive. I've just left the prices as they are. The key bit is that they all fit within this courses bit because we are gonna have to go and modify our shop in a moment, but that isn't gonna take long at all. Then we need to go and create pages for the delivery of our courses. So I'm gonna go over to pages, go to all pages, 
and I'm going to click add new and I'm going to name this as the same name as the product but the only difference is I've now added in the word course at the end of it. Let's then go hit edit with Elementor. I've jumped back into my privacy policy page just to copy the container that had you know basically the look of it there. I've pasted it into the new page, the Rockstar course. Go to settings in the bottom left over there and say hide title. So that is now gone. And now here you can have a bit of a think about your delivery. Do you want to still maintain the amount of padding that you have at the moment over here? Let me just click on the container. Do you want to maintain that 60? Do you want to reduce it? Maybe for the course, because now you are delivering something a little bit different. Welcome to the Rockstar course. And now what you do here is entirely up to you. I could add in like loads and loads of text. I could go and drop in images. I could go and drop in video. I can drop in PDFs. I can drop in images, carousels. You could even drop into here like a link for a Zoom uh, session as well. You can do whatever you want and you can update this page as many times or as little as you want. The idea is, is that whenever you come here now, this is going to be the content for your course. Now, at the moment, anyone can access this and we are going to control that, OK, so that you can't access it until you purchase the Rockstar product. So we have our three pages. We've got the Rockstar course, we've got the Peaky Blinder course and we've got the Hiking Maker course. It's really important that you have the word course in your URL. So I just want to highlight that over here. If you look at the URL, it's got Hiking Maker hyphen course. You've got to make sure that's in there. Otherwise, you might get confused with which page you're touching. I do apologize apologize for how bland those pages look, but I just want to get over to you that you could create that with however you want. OK, and I don't want to say this is the layout you want to go for because it depends on your content. So there's a little bit. Of, I don't want to say do this, do this, do this. Remember, you are working with Flexbox containers and you have a range of widgets that you can use to display whatever you want. Now what we need to do is set up a page whereby we can advertise all the courses because we're going to have a separate course page. These will not be visible on the shop because the shop is more for selling backpacks. Now you could include them. At the moment, they are in the shop because we haven't excluded any categories. The courses, they are there. If I was to go over to shop right now, there they are. It sits there, but then it starts to get messy, right? You've got a mixture of these courses and you've got a mixture of backpacks. It doesn't look great. And I want the shop to just be the backpacks. So what we're going to do is create a new page. Now, I am going to open up the home page because I'm, I'm going to reuse elements from that in terms of the structure. But let's go and create a new page. I'm going to call it courses, edit with Elementor. And we're going to go through the same drill as what we've done at the moment. Once it's open, go to the bottom left settings, hide the title. Let's go to our home page. I'm going to pick up this container, go over to our courses, and I'm going to paste it in its entirety. I'm then going to get rid of the logo. So what we now have is um, well, we've got some padding in there, 60 and 100. We've got a bit of text. I'm going to get rid of the padding that we have here completely. I'm going to go to the layout and I'm going to make this be a minimum height of, I mean, you could go with REM, EM, you could go with uh, VH, VW as well, not VH, VW, VH, viewport height. I'm actually going to make this be about 500 in height and I'm going to centralize the items here. I'm then going to go over and give this a background image, so container style, and I'm going to pick this image that I've been saving, this one over here. We're going to make this be a cover. We're going to go with a center center. Ooh, center center is not good. We'll go with a top center then because that's the danger. If your image isn't like full height of the screen, your center center literally focuses onto the center and you might chop off like too much of the legs or too much of the head or the sky or the ground or however you're building it. Let's go and turn this into be a white and I'm going to change the typography now to be about 700 like that because the typography is now a five and I've put the word join the adventure. Remember I said about the line height always go up by about 5.5. I mean if I do five that is the standard so you can get away with that but sometimes if you want a bit more space and just add in a 0.5 into the sizing over there. I'm going to convert this to be a h2 uh, tag and then I'm going to duplicate it have another one which I will convert to be a h1 tag because it might contain the keyword when we get onto that I'm going to hit the text shadow just to make it pop a little bit give it a bit of a dark color over there just so you can I mean look can you see the wording there with the white over the yellow so that just gives it a little bit of you know just pops it out a little bit there 
before we move on let's just check how that looks on the mobile i mean by the way if you feel like it was a little bit lopsided you can go over here go over to custom and now it, you know it might move it all the way over to the left so just go to the x1 and then just kind of move it a little bit so i, I prefer it actually to be roughly about there yeah that's looking much better now i'm going to go down to my home page and i'm going to use this particular container that actually had another container i'm not going to use the call to action one because i am going to have two buttons on this so i'm going to pick up this container go over to my page and I'm going to dump it in here. Now you will notice as soon as you do that, we are up against one another and that doesn't look so good in terms of the flow of the page because it feels like full width jumping into box width. You've got to be very careful of that. So I need to add in a little bit of breathing space. We go to my container, go to advance and I think 60 should be okay. Can you see the difference that makes that little bit of breathing space helps you out? Okay, great. We're then going to go over here and remember the text that describes the product is your selling point. So make sure you make that as expansive as possible. You know, add in what you need to add, basically. I'm just going to go in and get rid of some of the padding just so I know what I'm playing with over here. I'm just going to reduce that. That had 60 top and bottom to, in fact, be 30 top and bottom like that. I then go over to this container. So we had a parent container and inside we had a child container. The child container contained the text and the button because I'm going to change. I'm going to have two buttons side by side. Let's go to our container that did not have any background image on. The child container did. So we'll go in. We'll change the background image there and we will go with the Peaky Blinder one first. So there we have our image. It doesn't look very bright, but don't forget, that's because if we go over here to our background overlay, I actually added in an overlay. So I'm going to clear that out so that brightens the image. We have some text, which you would obviously want to change to be whatever you want to say. We have a button, but let's just inspect the child container first. It is currently set as a column. I'm going to convert. No, well, let, no, let me show you what happens if we left it as it is. I'm now going to add in another button. So we have two buttons there. That actually looks okay. You could get away with that. Let's go to the first button. I'm going to change this to be see more details like that. And we'll put in like a bit of a chevron going in over there. The link for this is very important. I'm going to type in peak. Actually, this is not the peaky blinders one. This is the hiking one. So I'm going to type in high. And you'll see here, Hiking Maker, which is the product, and Hiking Maker course. That's the actual course. We want to go for the product. I want you now to go and get more details and then hopefully purchase it. That's all we're going to do there. And obviously, you would go and change your buttons and your styling and anything like that. The second button, I'm going to change that to be Access the Course. And then I'm going to put the Chevron in again. The link for this, again, I'm going to type in High king maker this is now the actual course page okay so the the see more details is the product but if you've now paid and you want to access it you hit that button and that will take you in now you might want to modify the, the style of the buttons i would probably recommend you do that so i'm just going to go in and give this a slightly different color and the reason why i'm doing that is that if ever you get someone contact you and they go oh how do I access the course? You go, look, go to the courses page, hit the black button, make sure you're logged in and away you go. Sometimes being able to describe things by saying, go there, click that color is much easier than, yep, somewhere on the page, it's the third button, it's somewhere 50 pixels from the right. It's easier, right? Now, the problem is the buttons are below one another. I want them to be side by side. So we go to our child container and I'm now going to set this to be a row. OK, and this is what happens. Everything just kind of moves out, um, kind of. Well, it basically does what it's doing. First thing I'm going to do is justify this all to start at the start, basically right at the beginning. The second thing I'm going to do is hit the wrap function. And now what happens is it kind of wraps like basically that. OK, the third thing I'm going to do is go to align content and I'm going to say flex at the end. So it pushes everything down. OK, so it's a bit more like that. Automatically, everything is now sat by side by side. If that did not happen and it wasn't doing that and the buttons were still like um, cramped up against one another or the button was still over here, go over to your text, 
go and check we like your paddings and margins and then make sure that the text was set to be a full width. I don't have to, but I'm going to do it anyway. Go over to your button. And if the button was also like full width, so it looks like that, just go in and hit custom and adjust the width of it to be how you want. Now I'm going to remove that because at the moment everything is sitting quite nicely. I'm just going to change the title to say Hiking Maker and I'm going to change this also to be a uppercase and I'm going to increase the font to be a bit of a bold, uh, give this some letter spacing of one as well. And then I'm going to go and check how that looks in the mobile. So let's just click that. Uh, you might want to change the top over here to be 378 as a minimum. First thing I'm going to do is go over to my parent container. I'm going to say give me about 60 from the top there goes the child container this is where I now I'm going to add in a bit of padding let's just unlink that first so I've gone 100 from the top and 20 from the bottom again you may want to maybe think about your images I mean I did make the logo quite big there maybe I should have made it smaller in hindsight but for the bottom button we will definitely remove that because otherwise it's just well it's fighting for attention now with the other button there page I mean this is very very basic you could possibly put in more testimonials and stuff but don't forget they're going to get a lot of that maybe on the product page but you could add in more items you're trying to get across hey this is a really good course what we then do for the next for the second and third course is just duplicate this. I don't mind having the space because I want my courses to breathe now, okay? And all I'm gonna do is just change the content for the images and what we're advertising. Peaky Blinder course, you go over to the button. Remember, you change your text here as well. We go over to the button and where we have the link, I'm gonna type in peak. And this time, remember, you are going to the product. We go to the course one, you just delete that and I type in peak and you are now going to the page. This is where they will actually access it. So if we now view that, that would be our course selling page. And one of the reasons why I like to do it without using a full blown LMS bit of kit is I'm not overly bothered about things like certificates or progression or module one, module two, module three. Once I've designed the page, I could have accordions on there. I could have tabs on there. I could say to you, make sure you do everything step by step. Because let's be honest, just because a course page says you got to go through all of these items and get a tick. Well, it's really easy to open it. The tick appears, then you move on to the next one. And I don't like to limit people. I would like to say, well, look, here's a course. There's about 100 things on here. If you want to jump to item 90 because you actually know the first 89 stuff, fine, go and do that. So I don't like to limit you, the user. And at the moment, there's nothing to stop anyone. Like if you've got the URL for that page, you can go in and see all of the content. It's not restricted. Let's sort out our shop pages first. Now, something I want to point out, you can jump straight into the shop and modify this. But if you jump into the shop results, you're going to get this error pop up saying you can't edit. Now, you're probably going, why can't I do that? It's because this is driven by the template. You must remember that. So what we've got to do is go over to our templates and here we have our shop archives. So let's go and edit that. OK, that is basically like a copy for the shop. They look the same, except the shop page had these um, grid builder filters on as well. I'm very quickly and easily just going to click on here. For where we have our loop grid, we have our query. I'm going to go to query and I'm going to say exclude. I'm going to say exclude by term. And then down here where you have the term, don't put it over here with search and select. Down here, I'm going to type in course and we'll have product categories for the courses. And when I do that, they are now excluded. Now, you will have noticed over here, this did change um, in terms of layout. So if I just get rid of that for a moment, you'll see here, because we have the extra item, all of this pushed up against one another because of the width of it. So you might need to modify the width of your items in terms of custom width. Remember, this over here had a custom width of 25%. If I was to maybe decrease it to be 20%, 22, it would be fine. So I'm just going to pop that back to 25, go back over to my loop grid over here, Go over to my query and remember what we said we are excluding by courses like that. And I'm just going to, well, hit update there. So that now means the courses are not visible on the shop page. Now, when you come to do the template, which is for the products archive, which is the shop results page, even though I go here, and this is something you're just going to have to get used to. If enough, I go into exclude and I say by term, 
and then over here I type in courses like that and I exclude it, it doesn't necessarily disappear. Do this anyway and hit update. Do it anyway because, because technically you're not going to get to see this page unless you go via here anyway, okay, via the category page. This is here, but if you get your head into gear, you're not going to see this until you go via here, but there is no courses here. So don't worry about that. Remember, you click casual, you go through to the casual page. Does that make sense? The single product template is visible for every single product. Let me show you the problem. Let me just go and edit with Elementor and I'm going to change what we have here as well. So this is our single product template and you're going to go, yeah, okay, it looks okay. We got all of our information. Let me go to settings let me go to preview and let me now get rid of that and let me bring over one of our items. So let's go with the Peaky Blinder one. Watch this, okay? Remember, the short description is not now short. Look at that. Doesn't that look really, really wrong now? We got all this huge amount of text and then your price is down in and we got another description. It's too much, okay? So here's what you need to do. Let's go and pop this back in to be, uh, let's just uh, get rid of that. Let's just go and pop in a rock, not rock star, not rock star. What was it? Roma. Just so that we know everything is okay. Yep, that's all looking good. What you want to do is down here where you have obviously the update button, you want to go and click save options and you want to click display conditions. This is currently on for every product, but I need to add in another condition. So we click add and I then go to exclude and I'm now going to say exclude category and the category I want to exclude is courses. Just type it and it will appear. So this is visible for all products, but not for courses. Let's then click save and close. Copy the entire container. I'm not bothered about the bottom one, if I'm honest, because my description and my short description are the same. So I'm just going to copy this entire container that we have here. If you haven't been watching the WooCommerce videos with regards to how we built this, please go and watch those because it explains how we built this as a container with two child containers. And we did a, we added in a little bit of CSS to style this out as well. We go to our templates. We click add new. I'm going to call this one course product. Click create template. We hit paste and we have this. Now, what I now do here is pretty, pretty easy. I'm just going to open up the navigator so I can do it quicker. So I can see my two child containers over there. I'm now going to go, well, we have the product image. We have the breadcrumb, which, you know, do I want to keep that or not? Maybe yes or no. We have our short description, which we now know is going to be bigger. And we have our pricing. Well, you know what? I'm going to pick the pricing up and I'm going to drop it underneath the image over there. Because I know my courses only have one image, so I don't have to worry about the fact that you have thumbnails here. The add to cart, I'm going to drop that in as well. The text editor with share, yeah, let's go and take that. And the share buttons as well. This might look a bit odd because it's now a little bit more cramped. So this is where you may want to have a think about how many buttons are you going to show? How big are you going to make your container? I am for now just going to get rid of the print. I don't even know why we had that, to be honest. Why did I ever add print? But anyway, you got Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, something like that. Okay. I'm then going to go over to my settings, go to my preview and I'm going to get rid of, oh no, we're going to leave it as the Peaky Blinder actually. We'll do the Peaky Blinder there one and do apply and preview. Can you see the difference that makes into the terms of the styling? Um, actually, I've just realized here we had a, this child container had about 30 so I'm going to go over here and give this one about 30 as well, just to pop things in line like that. I'm just going to make a few modifications to the sizing we have here. That's what it would look like with auto. This is what it looks like with stacked. But if you want to just go with some, I mean, okay, well, let's just go with stacked. We'll go over here and I'm now just going to decrease the top of this and bring it over like that. If you want to add any of the further items onto this page, you can do, but you can clearly see here why having the description again would make very little sense. So this is where the short description and what you add is very important with the selling point for the product. Then go and hit publish. And this is where now you're going to say you do, you're going to get an error 
because we already have include for all the products. But what you're going to say is only do this now for the product category. All right. You don't have to say products and now exclude rucksack backpack. But this one, just say include in category. We're going to go with courses like that and hit save and close. Now have our courses. We're going to add that to the menu. I'm not adding the individual courses. You could do as a drop down if you want. So when people have purchased it, but I'm just going to say, no, you go back to the courses page because I almost kind of want to keep reminding them that there's other courses there as well. We're going to pick this up and we're going to pop it in after the shop like that. Save the menu and you can now see courses. So let's now just go and open that window and it's now going to take us into the, I mean, I, didn't, I don't know why I opened it in the window. Just click the page, right? There you got your home. There you got your courses. You can scroll down. If we now go to the hiking mater and hink, hiking maker course and say see more details, it takes you over to the details. Great. Let's hit the back button. If you hit this, you will see the content, which we are going to restrict. But I just want to show you, click that, you're now into the actual course page. We are going to stop that. But just to remind you, we have a different layout now for the courses. But if we go over here to the shop or any other shop item and we now go, let's go to the all terrain, you have a different single product template coming up for that. So you can be very specific over different looks and feelings for categories. If you're liking what we're doing at the moment, please don't forget to smash the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Please share this video on forums and anyone else because I really hope you're getting a lot out of this. And don't forget about our super course that you can go and get more details from our website. Now let's go and restrict the content so you can't access it unless you purchase a product. Now I do want to point out that there are many ways you could do this. I'm going to use a plugin which you can get for free whereby you've got to purchase before you can access the page. You just pay once because I'm selling one off courses. So if the course is £99, you pay that and you can access it for life. Maybe, though, you want to set up like a monthly membership. So you've got to pay monthly or quarterly. There are plugins out there called Paid Membership Pro. There's other ones as well. If you go over to plugins, go and type in WooCommerce subscription, because remember, your product is on WooCommerce. You've got this one over here by WP Swings. You've got the YIF as well. WooCommerce do give you one, but you've got to pay for that. And it's quite a ridiculously high cost, in my opinion. But there are plugins out there. I'm just going to use one that you pay once and you can access it. Type in restrict WooCommerce and there are quite a few other options on it. But the one I really like is this one here, page restrict for WooCommerce. OK, there are lots of settings when you go into settings, but I'm going to tell you now, I actually don't bother with any of these. OK, I don't limit it to anything because I have full on control over how I'm doing things. I then go over to where we have pages here. And believe me, this looks complicated, but it's not. We have the hiking maker course. This is going to be locked by the Hiking Maker product. This will automatically bring through your WooCommerce products. That's how clever it is. So Hiking Maker is the Hiking Maker product. And I'm going to say not all products required. I don't know why. Don't ex expect or ask me to explain why. But Hiking Maker just make sure you say not all products required. We then have the Peaky Blinder course. Well, it's going to be the Peaky Blinder, not all items required. And then we have the Rockstar course. And I'm now going to go with the Rockstar and not all products required. You scroll down, you hit save. If I now go over to our page, I go to courses. I mean, I could also have gone just down here to the actual button. Did I show you that? I'm not sure. If I go over here and hit it, it's going to take me to the courses page. If I now go here to see more details, I will see more details. We're pretty much established on that. But watch what happens when I click access the course. Your access to this page expired or you haven't bought products needed to access this page by Hiking Maker in order to access this page. Now, one thing I will say, the styling of this isn't the greatest and it, I, it's something that really gets on my nerves a bit. But you now want it. You have to click that and it takes you to the product page. If you have purchased it, though, then you would be able to access it. So this is a really cool way of doing it. And if anyone is worried, well, what about all the other products? Let's just go over to the shop page. Let me click the all terrain bag. I'm going to hit add to cart and it will obviously go to my cart. In fact, let's go to the courses, add that to the cart and we can see our items. Now, 
there is still one other thing we need to address here as well. I mean, hopefully I've kind of rushed that a bit, but look, it works. You can't access the course until you purchase it. And remember, because your product is virtual anyway, I want to prove this to you. OK, look, if I go in for the rocks, well, if let's go with 1999 for the rock star and then just update that. Can you see there that even though that is below 50 and we added in a code snippet, it still does not apply any shipping cost because it is a virtual or a downloadable product. So we've created a course page, courses, and restricted access to them until you buy the product. But there is a big downside. When you buy it, until you now confirm that the order is completed, i.e. money's landed or whatever, I, if I've purchased it, cannot access the course that can really put people off. If I buy a virtual product, I want to be able to download, read it, do what I want with it straight away. I shouldn't have to wait 24 hours or 48 hours for you to confirm I paid. So what we need to do is drop in a code snippet that automatically completes it. Let me show you what I mean. In your WordPress dashboard, when you go to WooCommerce, you'll have an item over here called orders. Now, if anyone had purchased anything, their details and what they have bought would be here. I'm not going to have any because this is kind of like we're just building this on the fly. I'm going to go in and create a fake order. By the way, this is something you could do if maybe you were you were giving a product to someone or they were buying it via other means or processes. I'm going to click add product. I'm going to go and type in rock for the rock star and I'm going to add that. By the way, if you wanted to give a product away for free, just go and click the pencil, change the price to be zero like that, hit save. And what will happen is it will then say, OK, there's been a coupon applied of $19.99. You can have it for free. So I've gone and created a fake order. The trouble is, that, I mean, by the way, this isn't the right way to do it because it doesn't even have a customer name. You've got to go and register a customer in uh, as a user. So create them as a user down here first, then the name will become available for you to pick. But anyway, the thing is that this says pending payment. So they've now paid, but that's what will happen. You need this particular order to convert to become a completed order because until it completes, they can't access that product and that is going to really annoy people. So what you need to do is go over to snippets, click add new, give it a title and then click the link in the video description and go and grab this code. Click copy, go back to your snippets, paste it in, save changes, activate. And if anyone now purchases any of those courses now, please do not go purchasing anything. You're not going to get anything back from me. It will say completed. And when they then go over to their website, so over here, visit site, and then they log into their account. I mean, obviously it's not going to work for me because I haven't done it via the, that account. But what would have happened is when they go over to their orders or downloads, it would say, sorry for their orders, it will say they've paid for it. But then they can go to the courses page, they can click access the course and then they'll access the page. It might feel like there were quite a few steps there. So we created the three products. We created three course pages. You know, they're just duplicates. And then we modified the content. Obviously, that's what you would do. We created a separate course page that would like steer you towards the course you want to go for and the gateway to access them. We installed a plugin to restrict things until you actually pay for that. And then we added in a code snippet. Now, there are LMS products out there that you can get for free with add-ons and extensions, or there are some where you've got to pay a bit of a premium. There is nothing wrong with them. The only reason why I like to go down the route I do is I have full-on control over the where, how the products are displayed, where they sit, the actual product page. Because a lot of these plugins or themes that you can get, they slightly dictate how you are going to do things. And if you ever say, well, I want to jig the layout, they go, yeah, you're going to have to go and do a child theme or go and get do loads of CSS editing. And if you're not comfortable with that, it can get a little bit messy. So if you want to build everything out with Elementor and you're not bothered about a certificate at the end, I mean, you could do. I could still pop a certificate at the bottom of the page and then I go, great, you've now completed download, add your name, you know, however electronically you want to do it. There is an elemental widget called progress tracker. So as you scroll down the page, the progress tracker, like a bar or a circle will start to fill up. Again, there's little things you can do to make it feel a little bit more interactive. But that is how we've just added an LMS component almost to our website.
so we have a website built. We're doing really well. But you know what? All of that is a little bit worthless for a client if they're not on Google. Just because you release a website, Google does not sort you by the date of release, whether they're all filtering search options. But if you want to get onto page one, you got to do something known as SEO, search engine optimization. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where you can put some of your keywords and we're going to do it on the home page. Now, my tool of choice is Rank Math. There are lots of other options out there, but I strongly recommend you give Rank Math a go. It is a free SEO tool built for WordPress and it is amazingly easy and brilliant to use. Go to your WordPress site, go to add plugins and then go and do a search for Rank Math. You can't miss it, install it and activate. It has a really simple wizard and all you gotta do is connect your account. It's great that you can connect in so many ways whereby you might have an email or password or you could register or maybe you've already logged in or connected before. So go and click one of these and it will go straight through. Again the wizard will take you through. Now you might be tempted to go and hit the easy option. Don't do that. Just go through the advanced because all the steps they give you here are very crucial. You will get asked some questions. It's a little bit similar to what you would have done for WooCommerce and other platforms as well. So just go through and answer these as best as possible. It's not a bad idea also to make sure you have an alternate version of your logo for social sharing. I've got a square version over here and I'm going to add that in. I mean, look, if you have only got a horizontal, it does allow that. You know, do look at the sizes it recommends. But I've got a 1000 by one, no, 500 by 500 WebP image, which you know, on social media postings, that can work really well for us. Now, it doesn't matter if you're in a Chrome browser, Edge or anything like that. Just go and connect to Google services. Uh, basically, you're just going to use your Gmail account. You can see why you need to do that. It's for the Google Search Console. Now, we have to submit our website, submit the sitemap. We then have to initiate a crawl and indexing. Now, you might sort of go, what? Why do I need to do all of that? When a website is released, if you want to get found on Google, you've got to be crawled and searched and indexed, okay? And if you don't go through these steps and you've had a website built and you've never done this or your designer or developer has never instructed you, then you might think your website is out there on the search rankings and by chance you might end up there, but you really want to do it properly. And one word of warning, if you are doing this for a client, and it's obviously going to be maybe connected via their Gmail so that they can go and look at their search console or analytics. You're going to need access to their Gmail account. So they might have to go to their Gmail and they might have to give you permission or authority or shared access just to do this. Once you've done that, you'll be taken over to this screen and nine times out of 10, it will automatically stick the URL in here. If it doesn't, because you have an account with shared access to other websites, just click the drop down and go and find the relevant URL. Make sure you pick the right one. Now, the very first time you do this, you may notice that this is gray and you might not think anything of it. You might think it's just a bullet that needs to be green and the same with the analytics as well. So even though we're doing this process, we are gonna come back to go through the proper verification. And I'm gonna so show you the Google Search Console screen as well, and what we need to do to make sure we're fully connected. The next screen is about your sitemap. This is what is submitted to Google, which allows it to scan and understand the makeup of your website. You know, what are your navigation menus? What are your pages? Do you have any products? If you are not selling any products, you might want to untick this. If you don't have any landing pages, you might want to untick that. I'm actually going to leave everything on for now. I'm also going to leave the categories and the product category because I have a WooCommerce shop here. If you did not have a shop, you might want to just untick those like that. Um, when it comes to including images, if your images do not have relevant titles and alt titles, you don't want to go for this. Make sure you have gone through your website. And I mentioned this in a previous video. Go and put in descriptive titles. That is, that's great from a web accessibility point of view. Make sure you do that. Otherwise, this could go against you. So don't just have an image whereby the title is 001XYZZCXXX. That means nothing. 
make sure you give a reasonable title and an alt title. And I leave this as it is. I mean, I strongly recommend that you don't index um, empty categories like that. If you start to index empty categories, so stuff like uncategorized, or maybe you created a category for wheelbarrows, but you haven't got a single product or a post or anything for wheelbarrows, why would you want that to then be visible as an option for someone to click on Lugal, Google, Lugal, on Google, they go through to it and there's no wheelbarrows and it says, sorry, there's nothing here. You've just put people off coming to your website again. And that's basically it. Now you can set up advanced options, which we will go into once we now are looking at the website and we've worked a little bit more on the home page. So what I'm going to do is hit return to dashboard and we're back in WordPress and you can now see there's loads of options. Now, please do not worry about a lot of these options. It's actually really, really easy and simple to go through. Now, before we jump into them, there are options down here as well. So I'm just going to very quickly go through each of them one by one and it's not going to take long. Please do not be scared. Let's click on the dashboard. We can see here that we can now monitor whenever we have a 404. Now I've set up a 404 page, but maybe you want to know when uh, a URL occurs. Sorry, let me explain that better. Maybe someone hits an incorrect URL and it sends them to a 404. It might be an old post. It might be a link that you put out on social media, which is no longer valid. You want to know about that so you can redirect people to the correct page. The analytics is enabled, but we have already addressed, mentioned the fact that it's not fully verified yet. So leave that ticked. I'm not going to do anything here. The content AI, uh, and I'll show you how you can use that, um, is a good thing to keep ticked. Um, if you want to get some further help with your keywords, we're going to click image SEO and we will visit that setting. Instant indexing, link counter, local SEO, very important. If you're trying to get a foothold in your local area or community, I'm not worried about the sitemap or the podcast. Bear in mind, these are the pro versions. Like if I was to go and click this, just to let you know though what the Rank Math Pro costs are, if you want to get it just for like a single site, it's $59 a year. You can obviously expand and you get some more features enabled for you here, like more credits, tracking of keywords as well. Let's just close that down. Uh, redirections, this is a good thing to do. This goes hand in hand with the 404 now. So if I had an incorrect homepage, I can use this inbuilt feature to now redirect them to the correct page. I'm the only person looking after this website, so I'm gonna leave that off. SEO Analyzer, we'll leave that on sitemap, obviously. Uh, the video one, this is a nice, neat little feature, but it's not a deal breaker, if I'm honest. Uh, Google Web Stories, I don't need that. And obviously, we have WooCommerce as well. So that was all pretty quick and simple. Now, one thing I did not mention, though, and I will tell you now, is that you can import and export your settings. So whatever you do here, once you've done it, you could export all of this, okay? And then, you, so you might have one for a standard website, a blog website, a WooCommerce website, like what we got here. You can then export all of these settings, stick them somewhere. The next time you load up a new um, a WordPress website, you can then install Rank Math, right? Skip the wizard if you want, jump over here, click import, and it's basically gonna import all of these settings. So everything I'm telling you now, you do it once, you do it well, you keep it secret, you keep it safe, and then you import it in and away you go. Right, let's just go back over to our dashboard, which we've already identified is fine. Now I'm gonna start going through the settings. The first thing I'm gonna do, well, I could go to analytics, which is this one here. This is much more useful when you have the pro version, okay? If you really wanna get a lot more details about what's happening on your website, I'm not gonna lie. You could use Google Site Kit, which is a plugin. You could use Google Analytics, which I'm going to show you and go and review there. Your host server provider might give you some details as well. And once you've installed all of this, if you go over to Dashboard Now, over here, you will have this visible on your screen as well. This has 000 because it's a brand new website and we haven't done the proper verification submission of the site maps to Search Console or Analytics yet. But over time, and it can take about a week before values start to filter through, this kind of gives you a lot of info as well. Now let's go to general settings and this is the one 
that can scare you a bit. But watch how quick I go through this. So for my links, I'm not going to change anything. <laughs> for my breadcrumbs, I won't. For my images, um, do I want it to add a missing alt attribute and a missing title? There is a danger to this because you could say do this and then it's just going to add in the file name. Actually, OK, let me rephrase that. If all of your images were, let's say here, the Maldives, for instance, let's just say you could do something like file name at Maldives. Now, this is a really bad example because it already has the word at Maldives in the title. But can you see here? Let's say um, you were uh, had photographs of food, burger, drink, kebab whatever, right? Now you want to add in an extra little bit of wording. Um, uh, kebab cooked by Imran, chef at the restaurant, whatever. So if you want to do that, you can do. I personally prefer to go through systematically and start adding in my titles, especially when I'm working on each page. But if you want to like get it done really, really quickly, you can go and use this. I'm going to leave this as it is. The Webmaster Tools links in a little bit to the analytics down here, and I'm going to come back onto this one later on, okay? I'm going to leave the robots, uh, robots, robots, the robots.txt as it is. I'm going to leave the others as it is as well. I'm going to leave the blocks as it is. However, if I was using the table of contents on my blog posts or anywhere like that, I might say that, right, all of my titles on my blog posts are a header three, and that's already being pulled through into the table of contents. So maybe I want to exclude all of these. Now, I'm just going to leave them as they are because it doesn't really bother me. But just to let you know, you might want to have a think about that. I don't have any brand. So if I did have like a particular field, like a custom field or an attribute that I had built, it's most likely going to be an attribute, to be honest. Like it would say product brand, then I would go and pick it. I don't have the brand here, so I'm not going to pick that. I'm going to leave this as it is. I'm not going to touch this. This is the 404 monitor that we went and enabled. I'm going to leave that as it is. The redirection, I'm again going to leave it as it is. I mean, look, um, sorry, I should mention this. The fallback behavior is a pretty neat feature. Um, and I would say that maybe every time someone comes to a page where there's a 404 or there's an issue or somewhere, I might say just redirect them to the home page. But then again, some people might go, well, hang on, I clicked here. Why have I gone to the home page? So but because I spent time creating a 404, I'm telling you this page does not longer exist. Now click the button to go to the home page or take me home. Now let's go back in and revisit the webmaster tools and the analytics. We'll go to the analytics first. Refresh the page and it goes green. So if you ever find that you've gone and hit reconnect or you haven't and it's not green, just refresh the page or refresh the website. But we still can't do the analytics, OK, because we haven't kind of built it up yet. And it isn't difficult. Seriously, go over to Google and do a search for Google Search Console. Go over to the link and go and click start now. Now, if you've already um, logged in via your Gmail account, it should go through okay. If not, you've just got to like put in your login and your password, verify, and you'll be through. If this is the first time you're using this, your website will already be here. If you have other websites on here, just click the drop down and then go and select it. And if you're wondering how was your website on here in the first place, don't forget down here, you kind of did this bit. So it's kind of already kind of taking you halfway there. Bear in mind that you're going to have no results. We've just done this. Like we are doing this right now as you watch. OK, so of course we're not going to have results. And it does say here it can take a day or two. It can sometimes take up to a week. So don't come back tomorrow or the day after that and go, hey, where's my results? Give it six or seven days. So let's initiate the verification process. Even though it has found it, you need to go here and click add property. You then need to paste in your property into the URL prefix. Make sure it's got the HTTPS, OK? Don't do it without that. Put in your full URL and then hit continue. And you should get this message which says ownership auto verified. Now, if you don't get this, you might be given some steps whereby you've got to go and stick in a bit of code into your website, into the header of your website or even down to your host provider. Your host provider can advise you on this. But what you also get if I go here back to WordPress, if you click the search console verification page, there is a page that over here that pops up. 
but again, takes you through some steps. Now, this might look scary, but it's not. You just got to go through methodically and get some little bit of script added. But I luckily don't have to do that. Now, if you didn't get auto verified, you will get given a little bit of code like this. What you want to do is copy that entire code, go back over to your website and drop it in here and then just hit save. And that then just basically means we are now verified. Now, in a way, I didn't really have to do that because mine automatically went through. But if you ever have an issue with that, go and do that, okay? You'll get given a bit of code and then you drop it in. So back in Google Search Console, there's still a bit we need to do. Like we need to sort out our site map. It's already been submitted, but we need to do it for our products and our blogs as well. So we're gonna come back onto that later on. Leave it open in a browser. We are gonna revisit it very soon. What we need to do is sort out our Google Analytics. I'll put a link in the video description, but just do a search for Google Analytics. There's the link, go and click it. So in the bottom left, you'll see a cog. One thing I will say about Google Analytics, it's not very clear and you're like going, well, how do I add? Where's the plus sign? It's down here. Go and click admin and then you want to click create account. I'm going to call this one website tutorial, um, you know, because this is a tutorial we're doing. I'm going to take all of these items. I'm going to click next. I'm going to give it a name over here. Again, I'm just going to call it website tutorial. You can set your set your time, your currency. This is if you were going to start going in for other services or um, like adverts and stuff. But, you know, don't worry about the fact it says British pound there. If you click the advanced option, it's going to say, do you want to create a universal analytic property? Now, depending on when you're watching this, this is going out of fashion in July. So leave it unticked. Now, if you have done this in the past, and you've only ever done a UA property, you need to do what I'm showing you now for GA4. So please bear that in mind. Let's go and hit next. You then click create. You're gonna say that um, you, well, make sure you read everything it says here. Don't just tick it like I am. And you'll now see that the account has been created and the property as well. If you click on set a persistent over here, it does say collect website and app data. This is quite important. It does mention you've got to add in a Google tag. Where it says not started, click the chevron there and manage data streams. Then go and click, well, pick how your app or what you're doing. Obviously, we have a website, so I'm going to go with web. I'm then going to stick my URL in here. I'm going to call it website tutorial again. And I'm just going to click create stream. Again, this is something people sometimes kind of overlook. They've gone and created their property. And by the way, what you're seeing right now is what would actually happen. The minute you do that, it kind of then starts to go do 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 it like that. Just let it happen. But they think they've gone and done this and then they move on. You follow the steps I'm giving you. And I really wish Google would make it like a million times easier. But if you follow what I'm doing, you'll be OK. Now, if you want to use one of these plugins here to add in your Google tag, basically to make sure everything works OK, Monster Site, Site Kit, you can do. Or you can go for Install Manually and this little bit of code here you can pick up and drop into the header or the footer of your theme. I'm going to put a link to a video in the description which tells you exactly what code you put in and where you put it. But instead... I just come back over to Rank Math, I refresh the website, and now my account is there. Before, if I had hit the drop down, it wouldn't have been visible. Go through the steps, okay? You create your account, you create your property, you then go and create your stream. If you ever want to come back and get this information, you haven't lost it, okay? You come back into Google Analytics, you go over to Setup Assistant, you go to data collection, you click the arrow here, manage data streams, you then click this and it will then go and give you the code, well, the view tag instructions and the code there. Now you will see there's a warning here. Don't worry, this is a brand new website, so nothing's going to really, it takes a bit of time for things to start filtering through. So don't worry about that. Back onto here. I know it feels like a bit back and forth, right? But that's just because I'm showing it to you. You've now selected your account. You then go and select your property. Remember, we created it. And over here, eventually, it will bring through the data stream. If any one of these is blank, it ain't going to work for you, okay? So just bear that in mind. Now we can scroll down and, well, you know, do you still want to have your email reports or anything like that? I'm okay with that. It is every 30 days. If you want to have it every day, every seven days, you're going to have to go with the pro version. If your clients are really hot on analytics, they could even just go over here and start to see the info when it starts to feed through. 
for the statistics or you could get it fed to you over here. So it all depends on you and your client's needs. That might have felt a little bit complicated, but the rank math bit isn't and wasn't. It was the Google search console and making sure that's okay and the Google Analytics. But we're not done with the search console. We've got to come back to it and resubmit a bit more and start an inspection and a crawl of the website. But don't do that until you have now gone and maxed out your keywords. So if we now go over to pages, in fact, you can go to posts as well. You'll now see down here, it says SEO details and it says non-applicable, keyword not set, schema, article. Let's now go and start addressing this. Now, I'm only going to do this for the home page due to time. But what I'm going to show you is the same kind of logic you would go through for every page. Well, not every page. Let me change that. Only do it on the pages you really want to rank high. So am I going to want to do it for the 404 page? Probably. Well, I've got a template for that. Probably not. Am I going to do it for the accessibility statement? Maybe. The about page? Maybe. The contact? You know, maybe. But really, I want to be maxing out the courses page, the home page, the shop page, the socials page. So anything that you really want to be ranking high on Google. Let's go over to our home page. And by the way, we are going to be revisiting the URL for this as well. It's one of my little tricks I'm going to show you. And one of the things I really like about Rank Math is now we have an SEO tab over here. It's integrated into Elementor. Okay. I know Rank Math actually works with other tools as well. So if we now hit SEO, I have a score of 16 out of 100. That does not surprise me because we have not identified the keyword here and we haven't ensured the keywords are in certain locations. Look, if I scroll down here, it's not on our meta title. Well, it says the word our hike. We have the word hiking there, but I haven't said hiking is our keyword yet. It's not in the SEO title. You know, if I, I, could, I could start to go through all of these things, H1, H2, URL. There's loads of places we need to improve on. So let's first go and sort out what our keyword should be. We could, if we want, just go and stick in our words. So I could go and stick in hiking like that. And if I just go, I mean, you don't have to pick it, just type it. The score jumps up to 29 out of 100. Because now, look at this. The word hiking is visible in some of them, but we're going to make it a little bit richer and better. Or I could hit content AI. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to type in hiking equipment like that. And I want to see what do we get. So let's hit the research option. It's now giving me a range of options and things I could take into account. So in terms of content, I might want to look at some of these wordings. You don't have to use them. Just because it says you haven't used this. Well, if I'm not going to put best hiking gear for women on my website, so what? You don't have to do that. If I go and look at headings, it's now, I mean, they're not the greatest. Okay. Sometimes they are a little bit like, mm, is that really good? For SEO title, it says, hey, that's not a bad title to use. The best hiking gear. I quite like that one. So I've copied it. I'm going to come back to that. I've literally clicked it and I've copied it. I do like that. What about SEO description? Best hiking gear, which is similar to their title, which I will use. OK, let's just put it back onto content. Scroll down and it's giving me some ideas for keywords I might want to think of. Hiking clothes. Well, we're not selling clothes, but it's an idea for maybe future stuff you want to put on your website. What about questions? This is really useful. And you might have found this out by going through Google and looking at what are people searching for and stuff like that. But there's going to be people that are probably looking for what equipment would you need for hiking? Have I got that anywhere on my website? No, I haven't. So I could copy that maybe down here somewhere, stick it in. Or maybe one of my posts over here, I need to create a post with that specific title. Because if it's being searched for, you're going to be pushing your post higher up the ranking tree. I'm, I'm, look, come on. There's probably a million other people out there that have gone and used that exact term or phrasing. But have they boosted up their um, SEO? Have they tried to do as much maximization as possible? I'm going to go back to my SEO tab. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start putting in some words. Now, I've gone and entered a few in and you'll notice the very first one is a darker shade there because that's our main keyword. OK, but look, if I start to type in hiking near me, you're going to see loads of locations come up. 
So if your website is like window cleaning in a specific area, so it might be uh, London or a part of London or, or the East Midlands or a, a state in America or something like that, you can go and start to make it a little bit specific. I'm just actually going to keep this really simple and just go for hiking trails near me and hiking bags. Now there's a box here that says this post is pillar content, basically evergreen. So if you imagine you've created a post over here, which is about a hiking um, trail, which is only open now. I mean, next month it closes forever. It will never be open again. That is not a pillar content. It was only relevant for that point in time. Whereas a lot of my pages, like the courses, uh, the home page, the shop page, they are pillar content. They are like evergreen. They're never going to be outdated, if that makes sense. Now, already our score has actually gone up from 16 to 35, or was it 19? I can't remember what it was now. I think it was 16. It's gone up to 35. That's not bad. I want to get it higher. I want to make it green as much as possible. I'm going to click edit snippet. And at the moment, it says home our hike. I really don't. Is that what you want? So when someone searches and they find you, is that what you want to have visible on your website, like your search result? How boring and pathetic is that? Why don't we go and use that word I pasted over, the best hiking gear? And you might not have noticed this, but as soon as I've done that, we've gone from 35 or 36, my memory's going, to 81. We're in the green, right? I mean, what have I done? I've just added in five keywords. One of them was hiking and kaboom. We've just shot up and I've added in a bit more word for my title. Crush thousands of miles with ease. Simple, easy, whatever word you want to put. Your title does not have to just be your shop name. Biggest mistake people make. They just put their name. Oh, this is all I do. No, be expansive. We're not just going to put the word web squadron. I've gone and changed my description. Discover the best hiking gear equipment, trails and hiking courses for your next adventure. Shop for epic hiking bags, gear and hit the trails with confidence. I quite like that. That's quite nice, right? I've stitched a word in here and it's gone and made that yellow. So the more you tease words in, the stronger you can make uh, your keywords. And nearly everything here is already gone into green. Our content readability. It says that we've got our focus keywords in everywhere in there. It's in our meta description. That's all really, really good. It says the focus keyword is at the start of our SEO title. Notice here, hiking, the best hiking gear. It's right at the start there. We are getting two errors over here with additional. So it says add an image with your focus keyword as an alternative text. And it says the keyword density, um, it says it's high and it appears nine times. Now, I kind of ignore that. I'm not going to hit 100% now because of that, because I've got the word hiking cropping up a lot. But I don't worry. I'm not bothered by that because I'm actually, that's what I want. I want the word hiking to be reinforced. So we are told add an image with your focus keyword as an alternative text. Now, sometimes where you get this one here, you might go, well, I'll just go into one of my images. Let me just show you over here. Let's just pick this one, click it. It is a container with a background image. I click into it and if you look here with the alt text, it's already got the word hiking in here. So I've already got the word in that says a female sat ahead of forest dressed in her hiking gear. We've got that there. You can see it above me. So why is this now pulling up and not kind of, why does it say that the word is not visible there? Sometimes because it's sat within a container, your SEO tool might not fully pick it up. But what do you do about that? What you've got to do is just make sure you've got an image somewhere on your page. So I'm going to go over to this image, which is our logo, click it. And now I'm going to go in and add in our text. This currently has a really weird title of our hike 300 by 120 because that's the size of it. So let's just change this. So our hike logo for the best hiking gear website in the world. Let's just go and hit select on that. So it's then inserts it in. You do need to hit update sometimes. Don't just go, well, I've done it. That's it. Go and hit update and refresh the page. The score's gone up to 84 out of 100. And we can now see that keyword is in an image. My score is still 84. But can you see hiking equipment has now gone to a gold color? The reason being is I've duplicated my big hero banner header here. This one is a H1. 
This one I've now converted to be a H3 and it contains the word hiking equipment. Let me just go and put in the word, um, what was the other words we had? Hiking courses. And after refreshing, you'll now notice that's also gone to gold. And that's because even though the word hiking courses and equipment and etc is mentioned and it is mentioned in my text as well in places, it's not a header. So if you were to now get the word hiking equipment to also be present within your, um, your, your content of your body, it's going to reinforce and make things so much richer. Go over to any one of these, go here, is hiking right for me? I'm going to turn that into a header too. You'll notice the size and styling of it has now completely gone a bit like a little bit weird and I don't want it to be that size. The problem you've slightly got though is that we've already gone and set our size to be 1.2 but the minute I made that be a H2 that you can see here heading to the size has completely changed. Now if you're working with Elementor and remember if I go to my site settings I did not set my H2s anywhere. I've left them to be how I want to be but what I could do is go over here to my H2 now and you'll notice that the size has now changed and I can also change the weighting as well if I want you know go with something like that. So what I'm doing is dropping in extra wording and if you feel like you got too many H2 tags you can convert some of these to be a H3 as well. So I've improved some of them but don't go crazy you'll notice hiking equipment is still like in the red. It is a keyword it can be strengthened, but don't overdo it unless it starts to fit naturally into what you're doing on your page. And I've now dropped in hiking equipment over here and I've actually even dropped it in our footer hiking equipment and hiking courses. So everything is in yellow. The score still has not gone up, all right, massively. That is going to be down to some of the keywords you choose. So if that keyword there was more nicheified or more expressive, that could do even better for us. Now we are, we do still have one little warning over here which is basically saying I've used a keyword a lot. To go back to our page, you'll now see this is 84 out of 100. I would love to get to 100. I always like to strive for that when I'm working for, on websites with much more richer content. And what you want to do is kind of now start working through. So go for your shop page and start getting in keywords. It's a little bit harder on the shop page because we don't really have much content. I know we have a shop, we only have a header. But do have a think about your courses page. How can you kind of get that to get into the green? Products, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's not undoable or not doable. You can do it. So what you want to do is you want to go into each of your products and let's just go into the Roma one here. You want to scroll down until you get to Rank Math SEO. And what you want to do now is change this because for every single one of your products, this is what is coming up and this is what it says. Do you really want it to say Roma Hour Hike? What you really want to be doing is go and identify what your keywords are. Don't go and stick in Roma, right? Unless Roma is a, a, a name that is so recognized that people are going to search for the product based on the name iPad, iPhone. You get the idea? So what you really want to be going for is like um, rugged backpack or backpack, um, uh, hiking backpack, hiking rucksack, maybe climbing bag, you know, uh, bag, rucksack, whatever you want to go for. So start doing words like that. Then go to your snippet. Make sure you get that in over here. Multi pocket, something like that. OK, try and put in words. Of course, do it down here. I mean, I'm just going to for now just stick this up here. Just stick it in here just so we've got something. And the score is now 50 out of 100. I, uh, it's still rubbish. It's not great. And there's so much more you could do here. There are some things you can't fully do, though, like the focus keyword is not found in the URL. So, you know, you got to be very careful about what you do and don't do. Don't break the breadcrumbs, or the links or the URLs or the slugs to your website. But you can start to um, stick things in here. So like here, add an image with your focus keyword. OK, fine. Let's go in. So let's go with that. Roma multi pocket. Um, and I'll go bag red image like that. Let's go and set that image in. Now it's gone up by only one but at least we've got a tick there. You're doing more just to help yourself out. Now, you are not going to get everything done here for posts and products, okay? The same principle applies, but you've got to do the best you can. And that all takes time, but it's all about how much effort do you want to put in and what do you want to get out of it? If you just load up Rank Math and then do your Google Search Console and all of that and just submit the sitemaps, it could work for you if you know people are going to come rushing over to you. 
But if you're competing in a big, you know, audience, competition galore everywhere, then you really need to think about maxing out your products and your posts because we haven't even touched a post yet. Let's just go into this healthy lifestyle one, edit it. And over here on the right hand side, you will see a score of, well, 12 out of 100. And you can now see here, we don't have a keyword. You know, we haven't even done our snippets over here. What about all the items down here? Start looking through and working through methodically. Like this image hasn't got the keyword in. What about here? Is this a header two, a header one, a header three? Maybe we need to put in some questions. What is a healthy lifestyle? If your keyword was healthy lifestyle, turn it into a question later on. How can the top 10 ways to get a healthy lifestyle? The five sins of a healthy lifestyle. Start thinking about what's going to attract attention and draw people in. Now, there is one little neat thing you can also do. The key word for this is hiking. But if I go over here, my slug says home. I'm going to do something quite funky here. I'm going to change the title of this to be hiking. Like, well, I'm going to call it hiking home, maybe even. I'm then going to change the slug to be hiking. And I'm going to hit update. Now, if any of you are eagle eyed, you're going to go, yeah, but if I now go and view my site, look, it says hiking home. I don't want the word hiking home there. Do not worry. What you do is you go over to appearance and go to menus, go to where it says hiking home, click the arrow and change the word navigation menu to now say home like that. That will now say home. But the slug for that page now contains my keyword. Look, if I scroll down here, there it is. Look at the slug. Look at the slug. So if your slug or your keyword was hiking equipment or uh, window cleaning in New York, window cleaning New York, right? You could put that in here. Window hyphen cleaning hyphen new hyphen York. OK, you could even have it as a title. But on the website menu, it might say New York or whatever you want to put. That is a neat little tip that you really should consider if you want to help boost your SEO as well. Another thing you need to do for every single page and post, you need to now resubmit or re-index it. And you'll notice the word instant indexing is now present for every page ever since we installed Rank Math. If we go to this post where I've got healthy lifestyle and I've just popped that in as the keyword, you'll see here it says instant indexing. You can do this one by one. So every time you do a post and page, you just do it one by one. Or what I could have done is gone and hit copy link so I get the link for the URL or hit view and you'll get the URL. Go to Rank Math and where it says Instant Indexing. And down here, you will now see where you've kind of had some pages that have been submitted. So you can see I've, I've actually already done it. So not a good idea to do it in straight succession. In fact, I'll show you what would have happened. If I go here and type this now and I hit Submit URL, it might fail. Oh, no, it's passed. It then says it submitted it. So if I had five posts, I could stick them all in like that. And then you might have a different title for each of them. Let's just pretend they were like that. These two are not going to work because there, there is no URL for that. And then what you're doing is you're resubmitting them because over here, we haven't even started the indexing. OK, but I just want to let you know that after you've done the Google search console bit, every time you change a post, a page or anything like that, go and resubmit it. All right. You because you want within 24 to 48 hours the latest version to be attracting Google's attention, okay? If I go here, we already have sitemap index XML, which is basically this one here. You have it for post pages, products, categories, and product categories as well. I'm not going to do it for all of them, but only the ones that are relevant. Firstly, let's go and submit our website URL. You've got to get your head around this, okay? You've done your connection. So why am I saying inspect the websites connected? You've got to get it inspected. Pop it in here. And then it says retrieving data from Google index. Let it do that. And it's now going to say the URL is not on Google. Hold up. Shut the front door. We've done the search console. We've done the Google analytics. You made me watch you do that. And now you're telling me we're not on Google. Yeah, I know. Because look, we have not requested indexing. So now go and hit that. And as long as your website is verified, remember the Google verification and all of that, 
you should be okay. This can take a minute or two. Sometimes it's 30 seconds. It's been added to the priority queue. Don't keep resubmitting it. It's not a good idea. And now basically, I mean, look, if this has not crawled within 48 hours, go in and maybe do a request again. But normally within 48 hours, it will have gone in. Now I'm going to go over to sitemap. It already has the standard one. So I'm now going to go in and go, yep, I want the post. So I'm going to copy that paste it in but bear in mind you don't need all of it you just need the bits like that i'm gonna do it for i mean yeah we want well do you want all your pages do you want all of your pages i would probably say not always a good idea depending on what your pages are let's go for products let's pick that up that's been submitted cross let's just do the product category as well they have all been submitted so now when i make changes on the website and i do the instant indexing again it's all okay. And eventually this is gonna start bringing through values in about three, four, five, six days. Now you will notice I already have two pages or two logs for my 404. If I go to rank math and hover over 404, I'm gonna go in and look at it. And it's telling me that there's a post over here somewhere that is for some reason redirecting. Now that is just a bit of coding, uh, it's a CSS code. I'm not sure why that's coming through. So I'm just gonna click redirect. And I'm just going to say redirect to our main home page, permanent move, add redirection. And that now fits in the redirection box. Sometimes you are going to get 404s like, look, it says four hits for here. I know that is okay. I know if I go on a private window, that's totally fine. I'm going to totally ignore that one, okay? So you don't have to go, oh my God, what do I do there? That was rank math and how you can try and tease in some of your keywords into the content of your website and also into your URL as well. Whoa, we just covered off a huge amount in this tutorial. Please smash the like button, subscribe, you know, share and let other people know about this. Don't forget about our super cool stuff we've been showing you here as well if you want to help out your business. I just want, there's a few more things I just want to mention though. None of the website has been built with fluid responsiveness using the clamp feature. I do use that quite a lot, but I didn't want to scare off anyone who's new or unfamiliar with that, or they're now just making the transition from Pixel to REM for your font. There is a link in the video description. Also, do think about backups. Um, All-in-one migration is a great one. Updraft Plus is okay as well. WP Vivid is really good. These are free tools that you can go and get to help yourself out. You know, daily backups is a really good idea, especially if you have a shop, you might want to go for every two or three hours, you know, if you don't want to lose orders. Also think about security. WordFence is a great plugin. Uh, the all-in-one security and firewall uh, plugin that you, which you can get for free is also really good. I've got a video for that and I'll put a link to that in the video description as well. You might feel like I'm copying out. Why don't you just show us the responsive fluid clamp and all of that and use it for margin and padding? Why don't you show us the security? The video will just become way too long. And I want you to have the option to go and jump in and look at some of that content if you want to do that. Or what we've done here is perfectly okay and fine for you to build a website. You don't have to do the responsive fluid font clamp and all of that. You don't have to do it. It's great, but you don't have to. The security, you might already have host provider security, but it's not a bad idea to have it on as well. And also in terms of backups, you might already have that set up with your provider. But again, I would say make sure you do it to help yourself out. Hey, look, I've really enjoyed doing this. It's taken a huge amount of time to do. I would love to see your comments about what you hated, what you loved. And what did you think about the way I did it? Please let me know. Look, I'm doing this all for you. There's nothing in it for me other than you watching, viewing, sharing, and liking. I'm Imran from Web Squadron. I hope you like, subscribe, share, and follow. And I'll keep seeing you, or you'll keep seeing me. Take care. Never break, always fight, never quit, do it right, play the game, win it life, have no shame, there's no time, feel the pain, let the grind, I could change, in my mind, pick a lane, commit and climb, the only way, to win it life, I never miss that fact, taking big swings, bitch, hand me the back.